Živio. 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 Živim što će boje. Da baš se zvinja mi. So we can start now, yeah? Okay, thank you, Dasha. Uh, dear all, um, welcome to the Feral Palace Conference. Uh, due to the weather conditions, we migrated uh, to our fellow Feral institution, Mladinsko Theater. This conference would not be possible without the dedicated support by an international community of enthusiasts inspired by a common drive to challenge inevitable, each in their respective field of work. The conference presents perspectives on seeing and valorizing feral urban territories readily overlooked by the existing spatial planning. Starting from a specific case of Krater, ecosystem soon to be extinct by the Palace of Justice, conference sparks a transdisciplinary debate around multi-species spatial justice, rights of spontaneous nature in the cities, living soil archives, evacuation of ecosystems, plant-inclusive cybernetics, and many, many more. Spring Mentorship Program, the Autumn Conference premier premierly features creative work of eight diverse collectives um, coming from nine countries in front of institutions and civil initiatives representatives such as Legal Center for the Protection of Human Rights and Environment, Chamber of Slovenian Architects, University of Ljubljana, the Slovenia Forest Service Regional Development Agency of Ljubljana Spatial Planning, Spatial Region, Urban Region, Tivoli Rožnik and Šiška Hill Landscape Park, 8th March, um, 8th, of 8th of March Institute, Institute for Spatial Policies, Institute for Ethnic Studies uh, and Slovenian Permaculture Association. So they all are gathered today to create an uh, authentic, uh, authentic space of collaboration where a framework of administrative regulations is faced with its lively counterpart, multi-species crater context. The launch of the conference is staged as a forum consisting of local administration, the winning proposal architects, lawyers, scientists, urban planners and advocates of dedicated initiatives. To stage a polemical scene between the new thinking and exi existing policies, the participants are asked to advocate for the Krater's case. The project is marked by a celebration of Slovenian-Dutch friendship and collaboration we are honored to host His Ex Excellency, Mr. Johan Verboom, ambassador at the conference to strengthen even more this empowering exchange of pioneering knowledge, which influenced creatives from nine different countries with a tendency to pursue the terraforming agenda in the years to come. We would now like to invite Mr. Verboom to, stage, uh, to the stage to welcome our dear guests. Pozdrav Ljeni, ja sem Johan Vrbom, ja sem vele poslanik nizozemska in ja sem zelo vezejo, da sem danes med vami. Hvala lepa za ova bilo. I'm very happy to be here. That's what I said. <laughs> when I first met Danica and Gaia, I was very impressed, not only by their passion for architecture and nature, 
but also about their story about Krater <coughs> and the Pharaoh Palace. And by their own initiative to find experts in the Netherlands on the subject. So I told them immediately, I would like to be involved. This is a very important project, a new way of thinking, which is being developed and I love to be involved. So the day before yesterday, we had a dinner in my residence with uh, Gaia and Danica and also uh, the experts from the Netherlands who are here on the first row and uh, a number of other um, people in the, in the field of architecture and, and broader. And it was really a very nice uh, event because all these people, they are so passionate about the subject. It was a huge challenge for me to steer a little bit the discussion because everybody wanted to speak at the same time. And after it was finished, they continued in the street outside my residence for a couple of more hours even. So that shows the dedication and the passion for the subject. And well, the, the Krater project, it is about uh, cohabitation, how to maintain or even regenerate uh, biological aspects, ecosystems. Uh, we're talking about birds here and insects and plants, uh, how to maintain the bi biodiversity and not to lose it. And that is uh, especially in this case in an urban environment and we as an embassy as the Dutch embassy we are it is one of our priorities to to look for possibilities to work together Netherlands Slovenia in the area of sustainability circular economy transition energy transition climate change I think it's extremely important to see how and where we can work together, how we can exchange good ideas, best practices. And I, I think, I have seen that we in the Netherlands, we can learn a lot from what's happening in Slovenia. And uh, we are also very happy to share best practices from the Netherlands, to bring them here. So um, Today we have, or in, in this conference, we have Klaas Kuitenbrouwer and, and Deborah Solomon from, um, from Rotterdam and from Amsterdam. And um, so I'm, I'm very happy that they are involved. In the Netherlands, there are so many initiatives and uh, innovative ways of out of the box thinking, uh, whether it's about green roofs or local circular economy initiatives urban farms um, which are used by, by the citizens themselves to, to have their own food next door. Uh, all, all these kind of um, uh, new initiatives is so important that they are further developed for, uh, for a greener future. And uh, that's why I think this event here I really love it that the Dutch expertise and the, the Slovenian initiative that they come together here. So I would like to thank you very much for, for having us involved also as an embassy, uh, the organizers of the Crater Collective for uh, organizing all this. And uh, I would like also to congratulate all the participants in the design challenge with their uh, well with their important work so thank you very much for having me and i wish you a very fruitful day thank you thank you Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for such a kind words, and uh, it really means a lot um, to us that you're here today and that uh, you, when we first came and spoke to you, did you take us as a relevant counterpart, you know? <laughs> so um, now we would try to make not that short introduction. 
on why we are doing this. Uh, so Dasha, maybe you can go with the presentation now. So let's check with some terminology first. Here on the one side, you can see overused words, which too often sound like a recipe for the creative practices in the 21st century, such as sustainability, interdisciplinarity, territory design, and strategic planning. On the other side, you can see the words with which we operate, and we try to define them um, each day. For example, and I think that if we take seriously the, ver the words which are at your left, probably, right, um, they absolutely redefine the meaning of the, the words on your left. For example, uh, the way we often underst understand the notions of territory and design, two key terms of our practices, uh, as limited patch of land and uh, some creative gesture of a genius, uh, needs to be completely redefined in case we take in serious consideration biodiversity uh, instead of territory and the practice of cultivation and care instead of design. So we named this Feral Palace program an urgent pedagogical work as a design practice calling for a counter narrative one that is fundamental for establishing a resilient practice in response to the climate and biodiversity crisis, especially in times of green gas lighting, sustainable solutionism, and the dismantling of the academic disciplines. Um, and as we already mentioned, our inquiry begins, begins at Krater. Uh, a mobile production laboratory situated in a rewilded crater resembling construction site near the city center of Ljubljana. A group of designers, architects and ecologists proclaimed the place an ecosystem, a laboratory to experiment with on-site matter and a practice of composting anthropocentric perceptions while cultivating the ground for difficult questions. At this rewilded urban site, a mobile paper making workshop, a mycelium lab, and a wood workshop perform as terraforming agents by creating a dialogue with an impoverished piece of land abandoned after the dem demolition of the Austro Hungarian artillery barracks. Fenced and forgotten for the past 20 29 years, 28 years, I'm sorry, the site started to evolve with the force of nature. As none of the development plans took the route of success, a diverse community of plants, mycelium, soil organisms, and others initiated the site's regeneration cycles. Today, the site calls attention for its vibrant and highly biodiverse urban ecosystem. A botanist, landscape architect, and writer, Gilles Clément, would categorize as the third landscape. By meticulous work of mapping and documenting all the living bodies on the site, our collective soon came to the realization that Krater interconnects more than 200 species and represents an irreplaceable stepping stone corridor between Ljubljana's eastern and western forests. However, in uh, general public, this patch, patch of spontaneous urban nature is, however, treated as a problem to be repaired, uh, an anomaly that needs to be annulled by injecting a predefined program and regulating ownership structures. Administrative reg regulations fail to recognize its biodiversity and soil quality improvement, while the media sees it as a threat to fairly regulated city planning and a burden to its inhabitants. Lack of multi-species sensible policies further legitimize extractive policies. So you can see here how Dnevnik covered the topic that the area of the Bezhigrad Dvor was cleared of weeds and rats. And then on the next slide, you can see that this is my favorite one, that the neighbors were um, excited and delighted by the tractor and an excavator which were cleaning the overgrown vegetation. Um, they, were, they are writing about the big problem, but <laughs> the pictures that they are using are not talking about that problem at all. This is some really bad editorial work. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. 
Now, to provide you with an overview of the conditions for our practice, how architects usually deal with wastelands uh, can be read from the case of Sukrarna's factory. Um, the plot was abandoned for many years and uh, the similar process of regeneration um, took place as it took at Krater. Uh, but now you can see the site before and after. Um, feral, uh, actually self-sustained urban nature is seen as a problem which needs to be repaired in this case also. A feral as something which was domesticated and later went out of control is in this sense good <laughs> as it supports the regenerative processes with regards to the soil quality and biodiversity. However, current administration and planning practices does not seem to have mechanism or knowledge to acknowledge it. Um, to include biodiversity into architectural planning, they just fix the problem, and by fixing it means paving it, setting some poor trees in lines, design nature by controlling it with com composition principles, and completely neglecting complexity of biodiversity. Then, on the next case, you can also see that the Google Maps does not record uh, crater as the green area, and then we actually came to the question of power who is the one at the Google Maps who says what's green and what's not and how they categorize this. Um, and also consequently then, um, in the competition, um, they treated the, this patch of land as tabula rasa. Um, crater case is not unique. It's a, recogniz a recognizable practice of reproducing urban life by cleaning up unsightly mess. Whether spontaneous nature, squatting, and other practices, feral practices. The set of conditions used to classify this area like ownership, plot size, and other urban re regulations move the actual multi-species crater behind the visible. Without operational policies of or legal advocacy, you can, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, without operational policies or legal advocacy tools uh, considering such sites of great value, Crater's multi-species community is soon to be replaced with the Palace of Justice, conjoining three courts of justice and the adjacent park. Guy, you can take it from here. Um, so the new building is going to uh, go three stores under the ground and it would excavate the whole area. Within the tendering framework of a national ar architectural competition, Kater site was evidently understood, as Danica already mentioned, as tabula rasa, which called this, um, its interdisciplinary community to find a meaningful way to face the inev inevitable gesture of erasure. So we have set the Feral Palace program um, around the following questions. What makes regenerative, nature-led processes invisible to the planning administration? Is there enough room in this notion of spatial justice to include the rights of the non-humans that indisputably co-constitute our living environments? To address these multi-layered issues, the Feral Palace open call reframed crater site-related conflicts and speculated on multi-species inclusive palace of justice to find resilient ways of cohabiting cities of the 21st century, our multi-species design challenge was set to invent novel perspectives of seeing and valorizing untamed urban territories. So the Feral Palace program was launched as a series of, um, as a serious experiment and an honest dedication to expand the agency of human-centered planning practices by recognizing the presence of more than human communities. To do so, it was not necessary to reject the current set of conditions used to class classify Krater's area. Determined by the size of the plot and its limits, program demands, um, and current planning regulations, and to reframe the context by making visible crater species and their interrelations, soil histories, insights into crater's representation in media, and historical land transformations. The Feral Palace pedagogy introduced an overseen set of conditions forming a new context, map of species and their interrelations, soil histories, legislative concept of zoop, multi-species urbanism. And to do so, um, 
we joined, um, we welcome to the program um, our multi-species thinking guides through public lectures and also through the mentorship, mentorship program that happened together with um, interdisciplinary participants. And we had presented um, through them their post-humanist perspectives and novel practices in the field of governing and spatial planning. Um, so Klaus Koitenbrauer, a researcher and artist based at Hetno Institute, brought us to the ZOOP, brought us the ZOOP project, a novel governance model enabling organizations to represent the interests of non-human life. Debra Solomon, a curator of the Who Are We Dutch Pavilion at the 20, 21st um, Venice Biennial, acquainted us with multi-species urbanism by introducing the Urbania Heuve Food Forest Project. And Ruk Kranz discussed how to govern more than human transformations. This vibrant learning environment was set up to connect ecologists, lawyers, designers, biologists, architects, and landscape architects from nine countries to produce critical narratives of the Feral Palace. The initiative brings forth otherwise non-existent Im imaginaries of multi-species sensitive futures of the rewilded site and sparks a transdisciplinary debate around rights of spontaneous nature. The proposals created by the, the interdisciplinary teams of researchers, students, and practitioners expanded the single future of Kratre site represented by the winning architectural proposal. They created a disruptive ground for an alternative, multi-species sensitive engagement with the urban ecosystem, the first to highlight the spatial rights of multi-species communities in Slovenia. The Feral Palace design urgency calls for a pedagogy which can speculate on world-making projects with a community of creatives across disciplines and species. The program recognized the non-human multitude of crater site not as a natural environment which needs to be protected, but rather as an active agent which needs to be included when thinking about the site's transformations. By disturbing the accepted order of the power relations between the creative subjects and the mute objects, the interdisciplinary learning platform sets the condition to design for the multi-species or with the multi-species justice. So the Feral Palace pedagogy followed the competition of the Palace of Justice by redefining the notion of ground, both figuratively and literally. It, shift, it, it shifts the referential system of thought from the outdated urban policies that address ground as an intimate in inanimate abstraction regulated by plot site, predetermined land use and ownership to the ground inhabited by multi-species communities acting above, below, and within Earth's crust while enabling micro and micro and macro scale urban regeneration. Mm. Feral Palace is a situated urgency relying on self-initiative, practices of reciprocity and care, experimental pedagogies, and the formation of a research community. Such urgency rejects extractive operation, uh, operational logic by offering interventions, speculations, declarations, archive of possible futures, which will be presented to you today, in place of a single future of Kratres extinction. Framing critical questions with potency to shift the inevitable, so the palace of justice, into previously unseen positions, so the palace of multi-species justice, brings forth otherwise non-existent imaginaries. Um, yes, and to finish it up, while the traditional education models are more often reflective than they are capable to react in urgency, the action of becoming feral, which means running away from established institutional frameworks to the unpredictable ones, let us seek for modes of working or individualized precarity or softened with the alliance of multi-species collectivity. This was the official end of our introduction, but uh, maybe an unofficial thing to say is that the whole program uh, and the conference is run on a voluntary dedication and there is an open call for uh, donations which you can make to support a work of 50 of us which are working really hard to make this conference happen. So um, now we will introduce the next group, um, or the first group, 
um, how to spontaneous nature. Um, this is our, when Guy and I imagined this project, we thought, okay, but what if really diverse uh, profiles worked together and uh, maybe lawyer and architects can, can work together and uh, maybe um, landscape architect and lawyer and ecologist and how, how to connect them, will they find the common language? And this first group, um, they consist of um, a landscape architect, a designer. Uh, I always forgot what I is, it's... Conservation biologist. Conservation biologist uh, and a lawyer. And uh, we are extremely excited <laughs> to, to be able today to introduce them to you. You are invited to come to, I cannot see you, you're invited to come to um, the stage, please. Hello, okay. Um, for the technical team, I will raise my hand when you have to switch the slide, if that's okay. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Ala, and um, we are a group of four. We are only three here, but um, we are all coming from the professions that this open call was looking for. Aya is a natural conservationist, Tatiana is a landscape architect, Gaia on the other side, uh, on the Zoom, is a designer and I studied law. So um, the formation of the group came quite by accident. We knew that we were all connected by the immense love for nature and the preservation of its wildness. So from a friendly conversation, ideas and visions and, um, began to develop, which soon organically led to the conclusion that this is something that is written on our skin and um, at least in terms of actual interdisciplinary integration. Um, we believe that uh, cities are not static, but naturally changing environments where human and non-human species move around as environment, policy, and culture change. Mm. Um, well, many people know that behind that metal construction fence by the main road in Bejegrad, Krater is situated, but not many people know that behind that fence there is an incredible, wild, almost forest-like spontaneous nature paradise um, growing for the past 28 years. At the moment, Krater found its home there. This is... Uh, uh, yeah, it's a temporary community-led production space where designers, architects, um, ecologists, actually anyone who is interested um, can engage with urban nature and create new sustainable slash feral practices within the growing cities. Mm. In the times of ah, in the times of Austrian-Hungarian Empire, it used to be a military base, and many of the tall um, many of the tall chestnut trees are still there um, and they are planted in a straight line that indicates the past order. Then between the 94 and 96, the Slovenian government decided to tear down the military base and build a brand new residential um, neighborhood. Um, they used some of the gravel that, it's, um, that can be found on Krater and in this region to build these buildings and um, excavation of that gravel left two big holes and this is how Krater actually got its name. Um, so our project, uh, How to Spontaneous Nature, um, primarily deals with the question of duality on one hand on a, at a very content level. So we are, we are always questioning why is something 
um, what are the relations um, of human regarding nature and why is it like this? And on the other hand, on a purely practical implementation level, so, um, that also regards um, how to read the, the zine. So we collected interesting facts, information and thoughts, and we materialized them in the zine which we thought is closer to the amateur reader, but no less telling. And this zine includes um, scans of herborized plants, fungi and garbage as an integr integral part of the urban la landscape. In short, um, all living creatures and non-living items that we can find on Krater. Um, no, 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 no. This is? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, but, but what is Krater? We perceive Krater as a magical piece of nature in the heart of the city, but then we collected different definitions of Krater that we could find in media. For instance, the journalist's definition of Krater. We then found the definition of Google Maps default view by which Krater, Krater actually does not exist, as you can see on the picture. Um, and as a lawyer, my job was to find a solution for Krater situation, or at least that was something that I first thought I would do, but to write and propose a new legislation to protect Krater. But then the reality was completely different as I soon figured that we actually have all the tools to protect and respect Krater, like areas uh, that the law can be in our favor if we wanted to. But the key problem that I perceived is uh, precisely our interpretation of law, which is of course our reflection of the mentality, the perception of seeing nature as something outside of us. Um, and this is where the dichotomy starts, um, because it seems that we divide nature very strictly into good nature and bad nature. The nature that is planned, um, desirable and worthy of us, and the nature that is unplanned, undesirable, wild, and consequently disturbing. So in my, <coughs> my legal part, in my philosophical text, I, I call it philosophical text because it's not actually a legal text, um, <coughs> I was mainly dealing with the questions like what is actually, what are the relationships between humans and nature? Why do we prefer carefully planned public green spaces and consequently discriminate against wildlife, which has no direct measurable value for us? Um, Ah, um, what are the <coughs> what are the um, what are the historical reasons for this? Um, what are yeah? Um, and are areas with native species better protected than areas with foreign species? What kind of place does this wild, sprawling nature has in cities? Because legally, it's perceived as a gray area. So through my, through this text, I wanted I tried to make a historical line answering all these questions and like areas that many people call third landscapes. Um, uh, um, this is a term that Gilles Clément um, developed, we could, we could say that, with the third estate, because like the third, uh, because like the third estate, third landscapes are marginal, forgotten, unrecognized and repressed. Um, now here we have a, a picture. Oh no, go back please. Um, so here we have, um, it's in Slovenian, but it's legislation regarding, um, that could regard our view or how we treat nature. Um, and um, if we, if I take one, <laughs> if we proceed from the legal definition of a natural value as something rare, precious or remarkable and the criteri criteria for determining the preciousness are exceptionality, typicality, preservedness, blah, 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 blah. The question at this point is who determines that something is considered exceptional and what are the criteria of the criteria? Because isn't Krater also exceptional? Does it not have an important um, scientific research significance? Um, isn't Krater also like not an important biodiversity area? So we actually have all the tools, but we don't want to use them, or at least they don't want to use them. So um, 
<coughs> yeah, um, my, um, so now I would like to give the word to Aya that will explain maybe another alternative approaches to how to measure crater-like areas. Hello. Um, yeah, so the next. Yeah, this is wrong. It, it should be another one. Yeah, this one should be first. Okay, so yeah, my part was the nature conservation aspect of this so-called um, abandoned construction site. Uh, so what we thought about was um, how to present nature and wild organisms in cities as something that is worth preserving and um, supporting. So the first thing that we thought of were ecosystem services. Um, for those that don't know, uh, with this term we describe services of nature that benefit human society and enable it to survive and have a better quality of life. Um, it is a somehow uh, societal dependence on natural ecosystems. Um, the fortunate thing for us was that a person named Laura Redmond was just doing a survey of ecosystem services at Krater um, at the same time as we were developing our project. Uh, she sent us her report where she listed all the beneficial services that Krater um, provides basically for free. Uh, some of them are listed here, such as um, pollination, decomposition, erosion and flood control, uh, recreation and um, creativity and so on. Uh, many of these are important in this day and age for climate change. Um, uh, yeah, so not, <coughs> not only does Krater represent a diverse range of ecosystem services in the middle of the city, it is also a very unique um, urban green space with a lot of potential and benefits for the community. Uh, because we live in this um, capitalist world, it is necessary uh, for the stakeholders and many other people to have like a material value written on paper, um, or else it is sadly just not valuable at all. Um, for places like Krater, which are on paper stated as temporary, the most unfortunate thing is that as soon as someone with a large sum of money arrives, those places are gone, um, which is exactly what is happening to Krater. Okay, so the next conservation aspect was uh, meant to explore a common biology aspect, which is stepping stones. Um, one of the major problems that the natural world is facing is land fragmentation, which result, uh, results in a scattered mosaic of fragmented habitats, as you can see. Um, of, yeah, in a scattered mosaic of habitat fragments. Uh, preventing connections in the natural world is rarely a good thing. Uh, focusing on urban areas, habitats that help with travel through the city are called stepping stones, and they provide organisms with an important connectivity. It makes sense that when you lose a patch, you will end up with a decrease in connectivity uh, between other remaining patches. Um, this is what we wanted to portray uh, in this picture, as you can see in this map. So as you can see, Krata represents an important habitat uh, that facilitates dispersal and movement between other smaller um, areas and also as, as well as the bigger ones. Mm, an organism, uh, uh, for example, an organism that travels from Park Jale to Park Tivoli surely crosses or stops at Krater for some food and shelter. Um, yeah, so with globalization, land use and over-exploitation being extremely common and present almost everywhere, in this day and age, there are many reasons why these urban green spaces with spontaneous nature are especially important in the fragmented concrete jungle that we live in. Uh, yeah, so this is a map um, that is basically made out of drone pictures that our designer Gaia merged together. And here we can see um, all the species that are basically gonna be gone if uh, this palace of justice happens. Yeah, um, yeah. so for, for the end, uh, we just wanted to say that we created this zine with utmost love and appreciation for Krater's piece of land. 
and we hope that with attention, care, resilience and activism, all attempts uh, at building over Krater will be reconsidered and stopped so Krater can continue being one of the most unique areas of nature in Ljubljana. This is our zine. <laughs> um, we would like now to invite our dear guests uh, to, to ask questions to, to our group, and afterwards we would have a keynote lecture of Klaus Koitenbauer. Could you, Dasha, could you join Guy on Zoom now? Okay, in the you will try, and then in the middle, um, yeah, if I cannot see if some uh, hand is up yeah. for the question. I just wanted to say, uh, if you have a certain question for um, our group, please just state where are you coming from and what is your name, so we know what position are you representing. Thank you for your fantastic presentation, um, really impressive. I wondered, um, as you said, that actually the tools in the law are already existing, but it's, uh, what is uh, lacking is the, the desire, maybe the practice of using them in, the, uh, in this kind of direction. Do you have suggestions in how to uh, go there, how to make parties, stakeholders, um, um, multi-species communities actually develop a practice, a shared practice of actually inter interpreting the law like the way you suggest? This is actually what I was, tr uh, what I was questioning myself, trying to actually make a concrete suggestion how to get there, but as, hmm, I think it's harder than, I mean, at the end, you just have to really want it to, to do it. Like, um, y y you need people who are open enough, not just open enough, but who are radical enough to, um, to accept the, not the consequences, but to actually um, uh, take the responsibility of changing it. Uh, so for instance, not to, to see Krater as, just to, just to find it, um, just to see Krater as a, a competition area owned by a tender that is a Republic of Slovenia, but to actually see it as as a de facto, something that actually exists, not something that shouldn't be there because we perceived it like this or it's not predicted in the spatial area, but to actually see, and this is where the law and the, the concrete, the, the actual word are not aligned. So I think we have to as a civil, as yeah, a civilist and also f uh, like civilists who organize together and like really protect these areas to press the, the people, the stakeholders. <laughs> now Gaia is also joining us, I think, from Amsterdam. Hey Gaia, can you hear us? Hi, yes, I'm joining you from Eindhoven, oh. um, Netherlands. You again. Uh, so is there any more questions? My name is Maya Simonidi and I'm landscape architect and urban planner. And um, I somehow missed the information about what did you find out about the history of uh, human, uh, you know, relation to nature? Like, why do we prefer uh, designed and controlled landscapes or nature, not the feral ones? 
uh, and in this in this relation, I would have a question: Have you been looking around the city about this same species you found at the crater? Because the whole idea of nature protection is related to how endangered uh, the species or landscapes are. So if we want to talk about, you know, protection, there is this one aspect. We, we should look around and see are the species which are living, uh, inhabiting the crater really endangered? Do, do, can we gain some, you know, points here? Or we have like a special complex, uh, rather complex um, landscape which is to be protected as a complex uh, area. Um, so. Mm -hmm. I would like to. Okay, I will start and then probably you should mm -hmm. um, continue with the second. So, um, I mean, y yeah, I didn't want to present um, a lot of the historical line I, I, I wrote about in the Zing because you can read it there. Um, but I, I started like um, that the understanding of nature as something separate from us is like um, mo a modern um, approach to understanding this, um, the characteristic of a modern age. So in the, the historical, in the natural societies, um, also the, the idea of God was something in the nature, so men, humankind, were perceived as something apart, that it is intertwined in the nature, and then with the hegemonic Western culture and religion, this idea um, started to separate the idea of man being something outside of the nature. Um, and then later with the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, where the idea of, um, the, the idea that human progress can only be measured and evaluated in terms of the dominance of nature prevailed. And this is something that put, put it like a, a, a man uh, in the center of the universe and then it continues and continues and continues, and this is why we uh, discriminate it. We, um, I also made the connection with discrimination because I, I actually work at the discrimination, anti-discrimination office, so to, um, to look at someone and to um, um, differently based on their personal circumstance, which can be alienness, um, so in this aspect, we can see that autochthonous species are um, treated better in, in the way, um, in the aspect of person, actually personal circumstance that are um, here. And you can also make the connection with the migrants and like the whole mentality we, we live in. So in this kind of uh, idea, I was trying to, to go, not to actually answer it because it's hard if you don't know all these relations and all these mentalities we are constantly in, indoctrinated also and uh, continuing. So this was kind of my, yeah, um, my way of, yeah, line. Maybe one. Um, yeah. So about the <coughs> species, um, we looked at them and sadly none of them are protected. Uh, listed as protected species, that would be so much easier for Krater to, to get any um, like recognition and protection uh, for the place. Um, but we also thought about like the species that are there, um, aut autochthonous or invasive, they are all there um, probably because of us, because we live in the cities and these species are um, uh, present in 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 Ljubljana, um, but now I lost my train of thought. Like we also wanted to portray that these invasive species that are there are there because of us, because we traveled the world and brought them like here, and they also have um, a. From my point of view, I had to like back down a bit because <laughs> I'm against invasive species because I was taught that in um, my studies. Um, but like I get the Gaia aspect of this that we actually can do something with them and they too have a right to exist. And they 
actually exist because of us there. So, um, yeah. But it is sad that none of them are um, on any list of endangered species. It would be easier for Krater to still exist. <laughs> Yeah, we were discovering, right, what kind of rights nature have, for example, trees in the context of, I don't know, Rožnik, which is a well-established ecosystem or a forest in Ljubljana, or what kind of right a tree would have in Krater. And I think Zala found out something along the lines that it really depends on the context in which the species grows in. So if it's an ecosystem that involves a lot of invasive species, it by default, lose, by default loses a lot of um, value or rights because it grows somewhere where um, it's, it's just not that wanted or the ecosystem itself is kind of threatening to the society. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that was a very interesting find. It always contextualized. Sorry, uh, yeah, I, I just uh, wanna, wanna go further, a, a bit further, because we wanna build uh, a case, yeah? Mm -hmm. So if you wanna build a case, and now we have like all these ideas about uh, species, and we know about them, and we but you, you went to right direction. The context is, is important. So you can, you can build the context you have to build the context. It's more than, uh, what I would like to say, it's more than just plants and uh, land and uh, all the species here, but the uh, urban surrounding and the context is the one who, which can help you, you know, to build the case and to protect this piece of land. Uh, hi, mm, Rosalia here at the first. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, Rosalia Cveć from Biotechnical Faculty, University of Ljubljana. I'm an agronomist and an um, environmental planner. Abdija? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we, yeah, I from the list uh, that you presented of the species, yes, none of it is uh, unfortunately protected by the current uh, legislation but maybe you can import a species <laughs> that's protected. That's <laughs> my, I can show you some locations. Um, which, which is legal, I mean, it's legal, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to uh, point out is, for example, Japanese knotweed that you have at the area. Uh, yeah, of course it's seen as yeah, something we should get rid of, uh, but especially in Slovenia, we have done research on Japanese knotweed. Uh, there is scientific papers uh, proposing we can use it for uh, several uh, products. I mean, not to mention a paper from, uh, that was developed by Gaia and the team. We also developed recently uh, organic fertilizer, which is uh, equal as, um, for example, cow, cow manure mm -hmm. in quality. Mm -hmm. And it's really, you can use it in urban uh, food production. Um, so maybe there's just, yeah, we need to do a bit more communication with uh, publications that you have also given here to, to come together with these ideas, how you can use urban nature uh, in, in everyday life. That's really interesting about the manure quality comparison. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's it's really about the communication of these species. Uh, we 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 agree a lot with that. So it's it's nice to hear that it's moving in in this direction from other people as well. I have one question, Jana Kozamernik. I'm also a landscape architect. 
Um, actually, in urban planning, we, we um, have different typologies of green spaces in the city. So I, I have a question, what kind of green space do you think crater if it's like a, a more nature-like um, park or I don't know, um, area? Um, I mean, what, what are the functions? Uh, in, I mean, also the, the, the ecological function is very crucial, but what about other functions? You know, uh, what about, um, you know, removing the fence and um, open the park to the, I mean, the open space to the public? So what happens when, when this is, I don't know, the maybe future reality if the palace don't happen? So. Um, how do you see it? If it's still wild nature, or or do we need like Onkraj Gradbišća had a goat and she, you know, um, <laughs> took the path and then they build the the, the paths. And, but how do you see it? I mean, um, yeah, it's a ecological, you know, it's one step in the green system. But what what is it for us, for inhabitants, for you know? all of us. Um, I, can I start answering the question? <laughs> um, I, I think it's the fence uh, is, is a good point. It, there should be ways to make it like more accessible and attractive. Uh, I think the what's nice about Krater and unique right now is that the fence itself makes it more wild, so maybe there should be like er specific areas of crater that still stay and closed or somehow um, not available to all the public. Um, it definitely should become more open. I don't, I, I don't know in what way specifically, but I think that should stay the the uniqueness of the crater that it's not it it's not specifically a park, but it should elaborate on what it's doing at the moment. You know, it has a lot of um, it has a really rich program. Uh, it's very educational. There's like I, I really like the part of um, elementary schools come there very often for their education. There's like 30, 60 kids that come there to learn about nature, to have workshops um, and adults. So I think it's about it wild as it is, because that's what makes Krater so biodiverse and so unique and not actually a park. Or maybe just, yeah, keep the parts, you know, because one of the holes, one of the craters the overgrown one that you actually can't see from the top because it's full of trees is like that because no one walks there. So maybe just keeping that part. We see crater as a gray zone, so actually it doesn't exist because it's not supposed to be nature, but it is. So my proposal would be to actually legalize the gray zones. So it's the state's re responsibility or the government's responsibility or the municipality's responsibility to, um, how is it called, to, um, to, to plan stuff. And if they forget these construction sites and actually while nature emerges, we should, we should look at it as a de facto nature. And then if we legalize the grain zones, they have to accept it. It's the responsibility of actually changing the environment and accepting it, it as it is. So this maybe could be my proposal to just legalize it. <laughs> but I would also argue that uh, no matter what crater is considered or is not, or whether it is a park or is not, and whatever the use of it is, at the moment, maybe tearing the uh, fence around it down completely in one go would not be that smart, because I think a gradual change could maybe gradually uh, make Krater a bigger part of the area, as, as Pejgrad is like a very different, uh, it has a lot of different com components to it. And I think that gr 
completely tearing the fence down would just cause people to either go all out crazy or destroy it. So I think a gradual change would maybe benefit it the best and kind of yeah, ease into it. <laughs> I mean, also for the for the nature itself, I'm sure it protects some kind of, uh, it offers some kind of protection. I'm, I don't know, I'm just thinking. But um, on an ideological level, no borders, so. Maybe, maybe. True, <laughs> aspects. <laughs> <laughs> to be on the schedule um, I would like to thank you for now for yeah. your presentation and of I'm course. sure um, you can save the questions also for the next groups um, okay. bye Thanks. <laughs> so we have a little bit of feral programming happening um, but now I would like to introduce after this actually lovely taster of our first group, um, our dear mentor and um, supporter, um, Klaas Koitenbrauer. And maybe he will, uh, he will also present one of the methods how to stand, uh, stand for the rights of a Krater's nature. And uh, I will just give you a short introduction of Klaas and his work. So Klaas Kaitenbrauer is a senior researcher in digital culture at Hetno Institute in Rotterdam and teaches theory at the Gary Trittwelt and other ad academies since the late 90s. He has worked at the intersections of art, design, researchers, curates and lectures in teams and at touch points of these fields. A consistent element in his work is the intersection of different knowledge practices, technological, artistic, legal, organizational, scientific, and more than human. In recent years, he curated, among other programs, Garden of Machines, Gardening Mars, Bot Club, at the Neuhaus Temporary Academy for More Than Human Knowledge, and he co-edits the Vertical, Vertical Atlas in 2019. And in 2019, he initiated the ZOOP project, an uh, incredibly interesting project. He will probably now in depth more speak about it uh, by himself. And um, I think, Klaas, you also won a golden award at uh, Milan Tri Triennale this year for the project. So this is also, I think, a great, um, a great fact to promote the practice that you're developing further. Thank you very much, Gaia and Danica and the Krater community and everybody here for, uh, oops, sorry, let me open my computer first. Yes, in sync, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It was a real pleasure to uh, take this role as mentor in your program and actually, well, ever since we um, met uh, two and a half years ago in uh, actually way earlier stage of the Zobo project. We've been in touch and you've actually also played, um, uh, I must say a little, uh, an not unimportant formative role in developing one of the things I'm going to present. Um, our senior researcher at the Nieuwe Instituut in Rotterdam, actually live in Amsterdam. Um, um, and with a large group of people, among which Gaia, among which Deborah Solomon, and many others. In the past years, we developed a organization model called ZOOP, um, ZOO Operation, I'll get into that, uh, that safeguards the interests of more than human life within uh, organizations, any kind of organizations. Why this has been addressed already by the previous team, um, uh, the deep shit we're in, it's not looking good, um, are the effects of a um, economic model that uh, systematically basically serves the interest of a rather limited group of people, human humans, limited group of humans, definitely not all humans, and treats all other bodies as extractable resources. Um, um, and this is, uh, as was explained previous, uh, clearly the effect of a kind of a cosmo view, a cosmological idea that separates the human world from the world of nature. 
all other logics that kind of sustain uh, the current economic model can be in a way brought back to this yeah, rather weird invention if you look at it at the global scale. It was not invented anywhere else. It was only invented in basically ancient Greece um, and uh, recodified and recodified uh, until current neoliberalist logic. Um, uh, but it ha didn't happen anywhere else. So uh, this is on the one hand strange. Um, had, how did it become so successful? Well, basically because it leads to control and control kind of uh, has its effects. Uh, it means that you can control things and then ha things happen according to plan, which is uh, the, the definition of success. Um, but it's also very good to know that it was actually a bit of an exception, that there are other examples of doing things. And these are the things, the pr practices that we need to be looking at. And the ZOWAP model is um, indebted to these kinds of practices also. But to not go into the philosophical trajectory of uh, unpacking the, the nature-culture dichotomy, actually we took a different road. We basically start from the notion of ecology, because it's very easy to see that all bodies participate in ecologies, all human, non-human, human artifacts, etc., are all in this exchange of matter and energy and meaning together, and all bodies depend on each other in this um, ecology, depend on each other for their existence. Um, it's also clear that um, if we go on on the current business as usual track, uh, the, the chance, even if this was the case, uh, and it's, it's not very likely, be honest, um, then still there's a, a, a limited chance that we keep the global temperature below 1.5 uh, degrees. So this means that sustainability logic, zero emission logic, or full circular economy logic, are, let's say, worthy goals, but they're really no far near enough. So we need to go somewhere else. We need to go actually in regenerative mode. We need to go grow back our ecosystems and learn how to participate in them in a symbiotic manner in a way that um, basically abandons the human-centric, the anthropocentric logic and yeah, focuses on collaboration, on horizontal relationships and, and, and sharing this planet in a multi-species manner. Um, so, some of this is well known. I said all of this is well known. I'm I don't want to kind of uh, assume that we're all on the same, fully on the same page here, so I guess some of it is well known. But even if it, to the extent that it is well known, it's very hard to uh, act on this logic because this human cult, human nature divide, culture nature divide is deeply ingrained in all our systems, technological, political, financial, uh, economic, etc. Hence, the ZOAP model. Uh, the pictures, by the way, are by uh, Patricia de Ruyter, who um, uh, they're all uh, from uh, urban nature, you could call. Um, you see here below actually this, oh, sorry, I forgot to, uh, damn it, I forgot to uh, give you the signal slides. Please, uh, one, two, three. Yep, set that, next one, next one, there we are. So, sorry, I'll go do the hello signal from now on. You see below there the, um, yeah, a little uh, bicycle path actually, this is uh, uh, the west of Amsterdam. Um, Patricia de Ruiter consistently makes pictures that in which she tries to adopt perspectives which are not necessarily human. So they also don't do landscapes. They are basically from places within a mesh of relations and um, uh, in which the distinction between what is human artifact and what is uh, a non-human artifact doesn't matter. Okay, ZOOP is short for zooperation and zooperation is a combination of the word cooperation and Zoe, the Greek word for life in general. It kind of was it's now used for mainly for animals, but actually traditionally it means life in general. There were a couple of Byzantine empresses that were called Zoe, um, basically indicating their role in protecting life. So, what is it? Sorry, I forgot it again. So, oh yeah, my font looks a bit different. No problem. Next slide. Yes. It's an organization model for cooperation between humans and other than human life, and it safeguards the interests of all life. Um, it has three components. It's a governance model. It's a way to steer an organization or to uh, co-decide its policies. It's a learning process, and it's a way to collaborate among um, 
um, be adopted by any, basically any kind of organization, regardless of the kind of legal person they are. They can be a company, they can be for-profit or not, they can be a public institution, an educational institution, whatever. Um, the goal of ZOOPS on their own is to, int to develop their own ecological integrity and the goal that share a regenerative economy or what you could call a human inclusive ecosystem. So these terms in a way are identical in our perspective. They mean the same thing, but uh, they work for different people in a slightly different manner. So a regenerative economy, an economy that sustains life, is the same thing as an ecosystem that includes humans. So first, the governance model. Yes, thank you. Um, a ZOOP includes in its, dis in its policy dis uh, deciding body, body a um, human with a specific task. And this human is, uh, we call it the speaker for the living. And this person is an advisor, a teacher, and technically a board observer. I'll get it into that a little bit later. And its job, her or uh, his job, is to represent the voices and interests of other than human life in, from the operational sphere of the organization, and to represent those voices and to make sure that they are taken into account in decision making in the organization. Um, immediately you come to the question like, but how is this possible? How can a human uh, uh, take on this role? Well, basically, if you step back from this nature culture divide and assume that uh, the, the needs of humans and other than humans are not that different, it's a place to live, it's food, it's a chance at procreation, an ability to make choices or the opportunity to make choices, this already lowers this difference. But the other thing is, of course, but how do you step outside human agendas, human agendas as a speaker for the living? Well, this is organized the way the one kind of our own little legal innovation. We set up the zoonomic foundation um, that has only one task, and that is to represent the voices of other than human life within the operational sphere of zoops. And this, this body, the zoonomic foundation, is the one that assigns, that delegates the speaker for the living. So this provides the function of allowing the speaker to act independently and to not be interfered with other human agendas. So. Um, who this takes up this role is, of course, up to decide by the organization that becomes a ZOOP and the Zoonomic Foundation together. Yes, so it's, um, uh, the model is a hybrid in this sense from uh, between the, the way the guardians function in the New Zealand rights of nature cases. I won't go into that. I can, if you want, maybe uh, to uh, expose a little bit on it in the questions if you want to know a bit more about this. <coughs> gardens, guardians in the New Zealand um, um, non-human legal personhood cases are the representatives of Mary that talk on behalf of the river if it's uh, called for, or talk on behalf of the mountain. Um, so that's one side of the model. The other one is actually the way uh, investors sometimes send board observers, uh, big investors in startups sometimes send board observers to a startup to ensure that particular interests are protected. So in this sense, you could say that the speaker for the living acts as protector of the interests of other than human life within the organization. Yeah? That's so to make sure that their work is not just taken for granted, but actually this is work and this is, uh, we are sus uh, the non-humans sustain the organization in every possible way. So they need to be taken into account. So what is the job of the speaker in more concretely? So the uh, let's say legally and politically it's representing the interest, but then how? And then how to, how to make this work into something that actually leads somewhere. So this is the learning process, the zoonomic annual cycle. Yes. Um, consisting of uh, four questions. The fourth one is on the next slide. And um, these are actually fairly basic ecological questions. These are the questions that um, slightly phrased maybe slightly differently, but that an ecology are not just focused on the non-human bodies, but actually include the entire operational sphere. So these quest the bodies that form the ZOOP include buildings, include cars, include the lighting system, the digital systems, 
include laws, includes municipal rule giving, includes planning zo zoning planning, includes uh, all kinds of permits, uh, the, the lighting regime, all those bodies, all those processes that have an active role in forming the ZOOP are taken into account. So then the next question is, how do these bodies kind of sit in the world? Uh, what, what are the things that make them act? What, what are the signals that they respond to? The third question is then, do these bodies actually, in their functioning, in their participating in this thing we now call a ZOOP, do they support each other? Do they, uh, let's say, provide each other with habitat, food, uh, energy, choice, etc.? Do they become a larger whole? Or they potentially obstruct each other? Well, the la latter is often also the case. Or maybe they totally ignore each other. So these three questions give you a kind of a map of the relations of all bodies that form a zoop and also give you the possibility to diagnose its ecological integrity, the third question particularly. So, next slide. This leads to the possibility of deciding on how to intervene in your, um, in your zoop, how to intervene uh, the, as the organization that has this agency, has this, uh, uh, let's say, decising, decision-making ability, how to intervene in this network of relations and how to foster its ecological integrity. Um, and you do this, basically, you follow this cycle every year. Every year, new circumstances occur. Uh, all bodies make decisions, including the uh, ZOOPS organization, but all other bodies, of course, do the same, which means that every year you need to assess this again, and every year you can make a new plan. And you assess this, you uh, see what, what came of your plans and what other things occurred. And you do this in winter when uh, most life processes go to sleep a little bit. And this allows you then to have a couple of weeks or months to reassess and to say, okay, for next year we want to do the next thing. Um, next slide, please. Um, actually, I want to go to the next slide first and then go back to this one. Yes. So, important to see and also in the to fit this into the crater logic is that the type of interventions in a way have three different kinds of ranges, you could call. So, the first one is crucial and this is about uh, stepping outside of this purely anthropocentric frame, stepping outside the, uh, let's say, the feeling of entitlement of that it's us to, that make the decisions and developing horizontal, mutual relations with other than human bodies. So these I would call sensitizing. Uh, we, yesterday we had some fantastic examples uh, led by Deborah Solomon of how, uh, how you could go about these things. Um, the second range of questions, or the sensitizing questions can be answers to step one and two, to uh, who formed the ZOOP, who, who, what bodies are actually there, and how do they sit in the world. This demands you a kind of a shift of perspective. The second range of answers have to do with organizing your local multi-species community, with organizing, rearranging so that they become, let's say, a better functioning, larger whole. Uh, to maybe remove the toxic elements, to remove obstructions that yeah, make interactions impossible, to step down certain plans, to allow other processes to unfold. Uh, this has to do with organizing your immediate surrounding. and then. The third level of responding to these questions, of course, has to do with how to deal with the outside world, how to strategize, how to communicate with bodies that form the ZOOP from outside, with laws and municipal rules and plannings that yeah, you don't have under your sphere of control, but they definitely form the ZOOP and you are in contact with them. You can talk to them. So, um, now back to the previous slide. I want to give a few examples. How am I doing for time? Yeah, pretty good. Um, a few examples of how this unfolds in uh, Het Nieuwe Instituut, which is a ZOOP, Het has, has adopted this model, has a speaker for the living, uh, Maaike van Stiphout, she's a landscape architect uh, who sits in board meetings, uh, presents part of the agendas and makes sure that certain processes and projects are now are transformed and include uh, the needs of other than human beings. So one, uh, th this this first set of examples, um, an interesting learning process. Um, past summer we had this big pink stage on top of the building built as a kind of temporary fixture. 
<coughs> uh, two weeks before the stage would open, uh, the project leader called me and uh, mailed me and Maike and said, oh, um, I forgot to take into account uh, the ZOOP workgroup. Um, Hey, please, uh, so this is what we're doing. Um, uh, I, I actually, I realized I didn't look at the, the bets, but I thought I'd tell you anyway, and please tell me um, uh, uh, how to proceed. Um, Mike, of course, it, Mike, the speaker for the living, um, a little bit taken aback, said, yeah, of course, this is not okay. I'm not going to give you any okay. I'm not going to tell you to proceed as though nothing happened. No, this you really need to learn from this. So give him a pretty hard time. And uh, <coughs> he also had to explain this to the city ecologist uh, because he uh, well, obviously had over overlooked some steps. Uh, so this was, uh, of course, the process was too late to stop, but still, um, let's say, a painful learning moment was installed, which was great. So uh, we could see this, how this unfolded with the second project, the solar panels that we, for uh, another exhibition, uh, were to be installed in the pond, one of the ponds in front of the building where we <coughs> almost entered the same uh, situation, where the project leader also a bit too late in the process uh, called Maike and me and asked, uh, oh, um, uh, are, you sh are we sure this is okay? But in this conversation, even before we said something, she realized, oh, wait a minute, I should have taken this on a little bit different. I should have asked myself how this implementation of solar panels in the pond could increase the life-carrying capacity of the pond how it would support the living conditions of other than human life rather than just asking you to tell me it's okay and um, uh, go ahead. So this learning mov moment already kind of, let's say, moved ahead in the process a little bit. And then the third project is uh, something that's to be developed, that's right now in development, and this is the first time that an ecological perspective is included in the process development from the get-go. So it's included in the design and will take... Um, will basically consistently play, uh, act out as a voice, as a, a, a logic of accountability and, and, and design concerns in the development of another project that uh, works with, <coughs> with the pond. So another, um, a second example I find very interesting. This might work for, um, uh, for instance, municipalities as well and, and um, other public uh, institutions. Um, <coughs> we built uh, the, the Speaker for the Living talks to the board or to the management team. Uh, that's to ensure that this happens on uh, decision-making level. But actually, the organization as a whole needs to um, adopt this logic, needs to adopt this uh, mi the ZOOP mindset, the ZOOPerative mindset. And in order to do that, it's not enough to have just one person. So we installed a work group, I mentioned it already, um, basically that includes um, representatives of all different departments, all different teams, and they prepare the work for Maike, uh, but they also act as kind of voices and hands and noses and ears and all the different projects that happen. So they are the people that gather the information, they are the people that also make sure that this new way of doing projects gets yeah, implemented in the logics of the organization and uh, therefore help basically realize the work of Mike in the rest of the organization. Last bit also came up in um, the discussion yesterday. Uh, uh, we noticed that um, doing a ZOOP um, also has impact on your aesthetic uh, choices. And that we noticed a new director who is fantastic, but he is also very much visually a modernist. He likes the clear line, the functional, uh, the body that is immediately functional, that is, um, let's say, yeah, clear and straight, and that hard, hard, hard cuts between one surface and the next, clear fonts, bold uh, expressions. This, this is his kind of preferred aesthetic style. But it doesn't really align with, let's say, the aesthetics of other than human bodies. So we found that it becomes necessary for us as a cultural institution to also articulate uh, other aesthetic regimes, to articulate uh, the, the, the visual and, and process kind of aesthetics of a, a more than human uh, organization. So we're in the work of this, and this is, I think, very interesting because Imagine that this becomes successful and something that gets adopted and that becomes recognized as a way of doing things and that um, yeah, acknowledges that surfaces have to be porous and oppor allow opportunities for all kinds of bodies and not just 
human readability along the highway, but uh, all kinds of other choices have to be imp implemented in aesthetics as well. I think this is a um, very interesting line of uh, research. Um, seg second set of examples. Um, these are not actual ZOOPs yet, but uh, 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 companies that want to become ZOOPs, they both are project developers, real estate project developers. <coughs> we noticed a very important difference between the first one, AM, and the second one, Slocker BV. Um, the first one wanted to be a ZOOP at the moment the project was ready. So to make the owners of the bu they're building a housing block, they do many different things, but this was the case in which they talked about ZOOP. They're building a housing block um, and they want it to, once it's delivered, once it's getting into the hands of the owners and the shopkeepers, etc., then they want to be, uh, make it uh, a ZOOP. So then they want to do the nature-inclusive design and facades and trees on the balconies and water management, etc. Basically very interesting, but of course they overlook then the rather toxic uh, processes that precede building this housing block and the kind of concrete they use and the kind of choices they make in, uh, let's say, uh, excavating the soil on which this um, uh, building block will be built. So we decided not to go with them because this was already kind of decided. So sorry, then if you want to do this, then ZOOP is not, uh, if, if these are the choices you insist on making, then ZOOP is not yet uh, the thing for you. Uh, instead, we are, um, it's not yet decided, but it looks very good. Uh, Slogger BV is another uh, fast food company, another project developer, who have a sustainability officer who is extremely motivated and um, intrinsically motivated. She also thinks that it will give Slogger BV an edge in the market. It will, has she is clear to perceive that if we call ourselves a ZOOP and if nature-inclusive building practices become important, and this is the case in Amsterdam, then uh, us as a ZOOP, we will uh, attract more attention of the, of the commissioners, rightly so. But this is not her reason. This is the way she'll sell ZOOP to her board. But what she actually wants is that, this that she wants to learn Slocker BV to become a symbiotic project developer. So, fantastic. So, and, and she's in this from the perspective, I need to learn how to do this. I need my organization to learn how to do this. Because we don't know yet how this looks, eh? symbiotic project development. It's, a, it's an unexisting practice as of now. But Slogger BV will be in, in developing aspects of this. And of course, parts of it exist, but they have never been combined. So this is uh, important work. Um, the last one is also interesting, uh, Bodemzicht, uh, the last set of examples. Um, these are two, Bodemzicht and Lenteland are two regenerative farming practices. One is a single farm, the other one, Lenteland, is a chain of regenerative cooperative farms in the Netherlands. Uh, they actually know how to do regeneration on degraded farmland. Uh, so the this is not there anymore. Like, what is not there? Sorry, this is um, the back channel. Shall I just continue I or? I can no, no, no. I just want to see her. Um, okay, I'll, I'm nearly actually at the end of my talk. Two regenerative farming practices both know already how to do regeneration, how to make a farm that provides food and habitat not just for humans but actually for other than humans. Um, so their organization level is not, uh, the sensitizing is already there, the organization level is actually taken care of, but what they do need is the strategizing. So how to talk to the municipalities, how to talk to the provincial uh, governance, how to talk to legal, how to find the legal loopholes that allow you to do a practice that is not nature and eh, not protected by red listed species and eh, that is a tactic that could work but it eh, can also work against you because if you're nature then yeah, human activities have to stop. This is the, the nature culture divide that underpins our legal system. Um, so how to find the loopholes? So it turns out there was a temporal nature situation. This is a kind of loophole for project developers, actually developed from a completely opposite logic. So to allow a project developer to already start planning, so to suspend nature, uh, uh, nature logic, but to acknowledge that certain trees cannot be felt because the 
woodpecker, the, uh, the, the rare woodpecker lives there and the other one. So it also turns out this temporal nature situation that allows both human and non-human uh, activities to coincide in the same place, uh, to, uh, that this can be suspended in, uh, endlessly. So this is not where the, the law was designed, or the, the re regulation was um, uh, made for. It was made to allow to a project leader, a developer to already start and to uh, get going before all, all uh, let, let's say, um, permits were given. So it's this kind of loophole situation, but it actually turns out that this has opportunities to be the, op the opposite thing as well, that to suspend this uh, temporary nature situation forever. So this was a very interesting um, find from the legal people that helped um, uh, Bodemzicht. So this would also be a particular, uh, in the strategizing element, also the role of the speaker for the living can be very interesting. Next slide. And then... The next one, next one, so, uh, and then the next one. This is my last bit. So, to sum up, um, there's the ZOOP movement. The ZOOP movement consists of organizations that adopt this, either this model or the values and thinking behind it. Um, and it has, uh, consists of several bodies. The Zoonomic Institute, the basically the root system or the mycelial body, that uh, helps organization to become zoops, uh, to become fruit, fru uh, to become fruiting bodies. The zoonomic foundation is that one single thing we invented that allows the speaker for the living to act independently, to make sure that they're as least as possible interfered with by uh, human traditional human ex agendas. The zoops, the fruiting bodies, the organizations that signed the zoop contract, installed the speaker for the living, and follow the annual cycle. Yeah understanding their whole practice as an ecological practice and step by step transforming it. Um, each ZOOP works on its own ecological integrity. Together, um, their, let's say the long-term vision, uh, hopefully this is short-term, but again, it's not looking good, uh, is that this, this initiative and similar like-minded initiatives will uh, foster an um, economy that is no longer extractivist but actually regenerative. And it allows to, um, it supports the development of a logic and but also a mindset um, and, um, and an attitude that is essential that organizations um, become symbiotic with, their, with the ecosystems they participate in. Um, um, this, so our job, in a way, the, the role of the Zoonomic Institute is not, it, at first this is, uh, for many contexts, this is a bit exotic or exceptional, but our job is actually to become normal, so that this becomes the norm. And if this would be the case, then our job is done and we can stop ourselves, We're, uh, then others take over from there. So if you want to stay informed, next slide please, the top URL allows you to register to the newsletter. The zoop.earth website briefly describes everything I said already, and you can mail us. Um, this was me. I hope there are a few questions. I'm looking forward to um, <laughs> what you want to know. <laughs> oh, one, one more thing. 40 organizations are interested in becoming zoops. They're fairly sizable ones in the Netherlands, also really kind of commercial companies. Of course, the party in Slovenia is Krater. So, that was it. Are there any questions? Thank you for the presentation of this really interesting concept. I'm Gregor Simcic from Slovenia Forest Service. I, I just have a question about the, this speaker for the living. It's really nice that, like, like it's a it's a huge responsibility of a person to mm -hmm. to take into account all the all the aspects that can be influenced by, by this. So, and my comment or question is: so, a, a person that becomes this, 
comes from a background. You said that your speaker for a living is a landscape architect. It can be a biologist, ecologist, forester, whatever. And I would say we as a humans, we are bi biased to things. So he, he, it's really hard to take the, the overarching position of everyone. Uh, but let's say I am an ecologist. I'm really interested into dragonflies. I'm not, but mm -hmm. as an example. Mm -hmm. And to, we have to do something with a, a pond that has a, many other species living in it. But my expertise are dragonflies and as a... Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. advocate for them, I would really push so that the project would not influence the dragonflies, but maybe I would completely forgot about the, the, the some other mm -hmm. organisms. Yeah. yeah, I see your point. This We also see this point. So it's important to see that the speaker for the living is a position that is taken on by a person, but that can also be taken on by other persons. And one thing that I didn't mention, there's a lot more, let's say, dimensions to the project that I'm able to kind of convey in uh, half an hour. But um, the Speaker for the Living is also supported by a, a large group of other experts that if, if questions occur that cannot be answered by this particular person, then yeah, the, he or she can refer to a, a larger network of, of specialists in very different fields. So it's not just about the, the singular capacity of this person. There's a support body. The second aspect I would like to address is that this learning process also always, f it's not about thinking about everything at the same time all the time. It's about, okay, that this learning process, this zoonomic annual cycle leads to particular issues that you want to address. So we see that this particular, I don't know, water retention practice or water retention situation in this part of our forest is a problem. So that's not about it's not about the whole forest and the forever existence of the forest. Is that like this is the question that we need to address? So that um, the learning process leads you to like so where should we intervene and how can we intervene in a in an ecological integral manner? So it's actually the actual questions are usually focused and are quite uh, are are the risk here is of course that you become. Uh, adopt a kind of planning logic. Uh, this is, of course, extremely... That's why this sensitizing has to... is always the first step. Uh, you're not just theorizing about ecosystems. You uh, need to feel empathy and solidarity. Um, um, yeah, and then you do the best you can. Uh, more, What more can you do? And so it's also, as a learning process, that's the third bit, it is allowed to make mistakes. I mean, uh, we're not here to tell you what to do. Yeah, we, we're helping you to find out what to do. This is the point. And uh, assuming that if there's enough people that find this important, that we can learn this together and that we also keep each other sharp and on the ball. Yeah. Can, you, can you go a bit closer to the... Uh, I, uh, what I would like to understand is how this relates to like interdisciplinary design or planning approach. Because it's mm -hmm. a lot of going on and what we probably in design and urban design and mm, mm -hmm. planning uh, are thinking, we are already going there. So the uh, awareness is there and the teams are right. opening and mm -hmm. the teams are... Mm, of course, not one person, but they are like Many really, really yeah. wide. And mm -hmm. it would, if mm -hmm. if I would make a whatever mm -hmm. a very um, popular um, presentation of what I'm working in, it mm -hmm. would be uh, it would be similar to what we are listening today. So mm -hmm. there are really different kind of profiles mm -hmm. integrating into you know new projects and also if you want, the aesthetics of the designs mm -hmm. is changing already and it's talking the mm -hmm. much more uh, biodiverse uh, um, yeah. big pictures yeah. or, or uh, yeah. there's, um, appearances. Th th there's two aspects that, um, that it's fantastic to hear that uh, yeah, it's that's hopeful that this is, uh, it, uh, I, I know this happens eh? and, and um, um, that is uh, this kind of more ecological aware practices enter all kinds of disciplines. The, 
speaker for the living adds a desi uh, it adds a decision um, making capacity which is like it's a it's a voice that cannot be overruled this is the, the, the if it's about this particular aspects of this learning process these voices that means that the budget is not ruling the interests of other than human life is at least on equal level as the budget which is let's say in terms of political power is a um, innovative dimension uh, and this is to keep you I mean as long as the budget are sufficient there's no issue eh? there's no friction but the, the, the difference begins to occur when the, the going gets a little bit tough and then to have somebody on board who you've given prior mandate to help keep you on track when exactly that situation happens really makes the difference between oh sorry but okay our plans were great but sadly we have to uh, use this uh, traditional um, concrete making method and we uh, sorry we have to uh, keep keep down on maintenance and we cannot do this and we cannot do that to avoid that to happen that's where this difference um, comes into the frame comes into the in the game um, and then on the level of knowledge practices and how they intersect uh, and how they our sciences are divided in the roughly in the head the, the, the human sided the humanities the human sided world and the non human sided world and the, the non humans are treated in quantified methods uh, they can be learned from uh, from the outside they can be measured and calculated and modeled even and they're treated as not having subjectivity yeah they're you have this pH level of the soil. It's not about living beings in the soil. It's about their, their, their acidity or the humidity. It's about amounts of bodies in the soil. But it's not about their experience of existence. And all that, all subjectivity belongs to the humanities. So in order to do a zoop and to understand uh, your practice, your shared multi-species community that includes humans as something that is both quantifiable and quantifiable we need to bridge these tool sets we need to bridge these knowledge practices and there's yeah, several thinkers that point in this direction Isabel Stengers, uh, Donna Haraway, Karen Barrett, various various mostly eco-feminist thinkers but also traditional ecological knowledge does this eh, like uh, the uh, famous uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer Braiding Sweetgrass fantastic book um, but our, our, our academics are not really equipped to do this. This is, this is really kind of cursing in the church. That's a, that's a Dutch expression. Like you're, you're not supposed to do this. So, but it's essential. It's essential if you had, in biology, it's become clear that all, all non-humans actually have subjectivity, have quality of life, have make choices even. But our, our tool sets and our knowledge practices are not equipped for this. So, just to add a quantified ecologist to your team is not doing the same thing as looking at the experience of life from the perspective of different bodies within an ecosystem. It's a very good step, so I'm not criticizing this at all. I think it's fantastic that this multidisciplinarity is happening, but this hybridizing of tool sets is not a thing that's happening a lot yet, although it's called for, and it's ex extremely exciting also to think along those lines. Yeah. Yes, there's very much in the back there. Yeah. And how many of them are NGOs or organizations like Krater who deal with these issues anyway? Yeah. And my second question is, um, who pro because uh, the speakers for the living, in fact, are currently based in the Netherlands, if I'm correct. Who provides them? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, who who not provides? I mean, how? Um, mm -hmm. Who is the speaker for the living? Let's say then in a country which is not the Netherlands. Do you send them there, or how this works and operates? We would. Um, it's yeah. This would be a case by case. The last question first. Um, uh, so. Um, imagine that uh, Krater would actually become a ZOOP, so we would have to find somebody. I would first, uh, of course, this would have to be somebody from Slovenia, from the neighborhood, from the area, from the head that also lo knows the local uh, legal and municipal logic. So we would have to find somebody which fits that bill. Uh, that, uh, but we would have to talk with him or her as well, and yeah, together decide who this could be, who would fulfill this role. We would give this person the basic ZOOP logic training. We would uh, have 
also let's support this person and like have it for certainly in the first um, uh, year or ha like how are things going, like uh, what kind of problems you face. We would set up this, um, um, uh, this is already what we do, uh, 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 like organize meetings between different people in that take up this kind of logic. Um, yeah. So that's, it's a very pragmatic question. Like it's not, there's no ne re need for this person to come from the Netherlands. The, the only need is that it accepts its assignment from the Zoonomic Foundation. That means, and that secures its independence. That's, but that doesn't matter that the Zoonomic Foundation is from the Netherlands. That's, that's not an issue. So of these 40 organizations, about 10 are uh, companies, uh, commercial companies. A bit, a bit more depends a bit. Lenteland, this farm is actually is a farm, so it had needs to provide also its own humans with uh, sustenance and money. So, but it's actually f at now four farms and will be more, but I count it as one. So there's a, a holiday village chain which is only started its first first one, but it's also uh, and then then there's uh, the Keuvel, there's um, which is a kind of a, a, a regenerative business hub. Uh, there's ProRail, I can say this because uh, they've announced this on stage. Uh, this is actually one of the biggest gra uh, ground owners in the Netherlands. So that's the, they're the counterpart to the Dutch railway system. They do the infrastructure of the railways. Uh, they don't want to become a Zoop as a whole, but they are very interested in establishing Zoops. So establishing projects as Zoops. So we have a, developed a logic for that. I already talked about um, the project developers. The, uh, the and <coughs> then there's. Um, Educational institutions, so uni uh, a university campus in Utrecht. Um, um, oh yeah, consultancy firms. This is also a very interesting one. There's actually several consultancy firms that have expressed their interest. So they don't own land, so they would collaborate with other bodies that uh, own land, but they would develop this uh, training and consultancy practice around regenerative uh, practices. Um, I forget. Oh yeah, and of course, very important, there's a big transition fund in the Netherlands, a, s a farmer's transition fund. That's um, basically, this, they, it's set up by an insurance company and they want to help farmers to get out of the monocultural logic of uh, had, had extractivist farming and with heavy on insecticides and to help them move to one of two possible other practices. Um, uh, local regenerative farming with short supply chains and I I within a community. A successful model also really sustains people and communities and other than human life, etc. Or uh, a new kind of very lightweight but high-tech kind of farming with, uh, uh, with drones and very light robots, which can also be done in a regenerative way. And they're, they're big, they're like they own 33,000 hectares in the Netherlands. So it's not only, it's, it's gaining foothold in commercial parties, which I find extremely interesting. And what draws them is that it's not about a set of external standards that you first have to meet and then you can call us yourself as all, but that it's actually this learning process that allows you to figure out how to do this with your organization. So it mobilizes intrinsic motivation. And it, it, it allows you also to set your own, uh, yeah, to draw your own conclusions and to figure out how to do this for yourself rather than, it's, it's not like the law that you have to abide to. So it, it, it mobilizes a very particular kind of energy, which is uh, what draws these parties at least to Zoop. Thank you, it's great to hear this. Thank you, yeah. Yep. Thank you, Klaus, so much. I hope um, Krater at one point will become a Zoop. <laughs> so before we continue with the group two, I would um, just once more like to welcome our dear st stakeholders who um, visited us today and were so kind to share their uh, learnings and their questionings with us on this conference. And I would just briefly introduce, introduce who is with us today and also again I would kindly invite you when you raise the hand to kind of say what is your name and where are you coming from. So um, today with us is Maya Simonetti from Institute for Spatial Policies, a landscape architect. Um, there is Lukas Parl, uh, he's coming from Tivoli Rožnik and Shishka Hill Landscape Park. 
and he's a senior in nature conversation advisor at the public utility Vokasnaga, who is um, managing the park at the moment. And then we have Rosalia Cveic. Uh, she's coming from the University of Ljubljana, Biotechnical Faculty, Department of Agronomy. She's a soil engineer and many other things. I suppose also an inventor of the new fertilizer from Japanese knotweed. And uh, we have Primo Turenšek. He's coming from Slovenian Permaculture Association. He's a permaculturist and microbiologist. Um, then we have uh, Natasha Zupa Zupancic. Uh, she's coming from Regional Development Agency of Ljubljana Urban Region. And I think her practice is in, rooted in biology. Um, then we have Gramor Gregor Sh Šimčić. Um, as he already mentioned, he's coming from Slovenia Forest Service and he's a forester and um, ecologist, also a journalist, I believe. Um, and then finally, we have also a landscape architect, Jana Kozamernik, coming from the Chamber of Slovenian Architects. So again, we're, we're extremely happy that you responded to our call and that you're here with us today and that we can also continue the conversation in the future. And now I would like to pass on the word to Danica to, in to introduce the second group. I haven't um, heard, uh, have you welcomed? We are really happy that uh, Mattia Belk is here with us today, uh, the architect of the Palace of Justice. We had a <coughs> really good conversation about all that we are talking here and also the limits of our profession with regards to the administration and the conditions that are set in front of architects. Um, and also Maya Vardian from the Museum of Architecture and Design. Um, your support also means a lot to us. Yes, thank um, you, oh, Danita. The, the light is not really allowing me to see <laughs> who is the, on the stage at the moment, but yes, um, thank you for mentioning them, mentioning them as well. Um, so our next group um, is a diverse group coming from Croatia, Netherlands and Slovenia. Um, it's called Strategies of Evacuation. Um, so we, there is a time, I think, I, as an architect, I think as of an ecosystem of something that is static, I think, at least before we start uh, this program. Uh, but they are thinking it in a transition and an ev evacuation, if, uh, eventually, if the Palace of Justice would happen, they, um, they imagine some strategies of evacuation, how the ecosystem could evacuate. So with us today uh, are presenting Urška, Urška Škerl and uh, landscape architect and uh, uh, Filipa Valencic, also landscape architect. Uh, they are presenting for the group, uh, Jana Vukšić, who is a designer and artist, and Lotte van der Wode, who is very diverse profile, and Iskra Vukšić also. They, they had, like, in between them, like, ten schools uh, and educational systems, I think. So, yeah, welcome to the stage today, and, yeah, tell us about the time. Is there a time to evacuate or not? <laughs> thank you, Danica. Thank you, uh, thank you, Krater Group, and thank you, mentors. Uh, so, my name is Urška. I'm standing close, yes, okay. Uh, my name is Urška, this is Filipa, and we're gonna talk about our group Corpo Bio with other members joining us from the Netherlands online. Uh, let me start with uh, a bit uh, not so happy introduction. Although I do agree a life should be of the highest value, and I love the word biophilia, meaning um, we have all innate love of life which connects all living creatures by this uh, understanding of life. Um, in context of crater, I have a bit of a feeling that we're uh, fighting the windmills. Um, uh, presentation, please. So the first slide, the next one. Uh, we're looking at the green strategy of Ljubljana. So the city of Ljubljana has documents, plans and strategies which deal with its green system and infrastructure. But none of it is designed in such a way it could actually consider micro-scale uh, infrastructures. The plans acknowledge large-scale green bodies, I apologize, 
so such as we saw Rožnik, um, Tivoli Park, but they keep those green patches at foot. They do not uh, evolve. They do not actually um, think about microscale vascular systems, green alleys that could work on a microscale to kind of connect crater and other um, unformal, basically green patches to a unified green body. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Back one, please. What I want to say is thank you to, for example, Maya Simoniti, because some of the plans were made um, acknowledging also private, uh, private lands, private loans, private gardens in a body of map, for example, the, uh, the red patches on the right side. Um, but this doesn't become, for example, a map or this is not available to public. This is not considered as being uh, a body of this um, green infrastructure, where is it should, basically. Next slide, please. So in context of um, me being landscape architect, and, <laughs> and so is Filipa, we look at the landscape as a continuum. Uh, we look at space as being one, one uh, entity, and every border divides basically this um, uh, entity, it dissects it. So we want to see how uh, crater, how this green body could uh, integrate into this dissected um, city-like man-made environment. Every street is basically a border, every building a corridor, every bu building is an obstacle, but maps also don't evaluate life um, on a vertical scale. How many birds are living in trees, how many um, life actually uh, travels by air, by seed, uh, what kind of animals do attach to facades, how we are already symbiotic, but we don't acknowledge it. Next slide, please. So, uh, it was said already that we kind of helped um, to, humans already helped to uh, put life forward or to migrate all this, um, for example, um, invasive species all around the world. And we do make uh, life extinct, but if we kind of uh, facilitate the process of migrations, that would be really uh, cool. Next slide, and Philippa, please. Um, this was just uh, something we were playing around with. It's the same as the last slide, but an animation, as uh, it could be, I don't know, in the universe or parks connected. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. So we were playing around with ideas. Um, what happens when something gets attacked? So what are the survival strategies? First, you have death, you have evacuation, actually escape or you have integration. Um, then we wanted to f picture these little scenarios that could happen, for example, in death, if the trees that would die in crater could be used as benches or something like that, but it would be really absurd scenarios. Um, but we, if you can go to the next one, we focused mostly on the evacuation one. So how, we were playing with how far we can go with the nature, nature conservation. Um, and we focused on this evacuation strategy to see how we can connect the current habitants to other spaces around. And the plan would show, the evacuation plan would show the corridors for each species. So like a traffic plan, you know, like you have these plans with bus, uh, bus routes and road typologies and so on. And of course, all the species that could like travel together would have um, the same routes. So we divided the species into typology and the corridor typology. And it's actually just mapping the natural process, which would anyway happen, but um, like if it said multi-species urbanism, then we thought this would actually mean multi-species urbanism because it's a map, right? I mean, in when we design urbanism, we mostly do it by maps. Um, so these evacuation plans could come in various scales as a bird moves further than a snail, of course. And it could also include the sequence of evacuation. So first the plants, then the bees, and so on. Uh, so the next 
idea. Actually, it's, it's the same, but just with more depicted travel as the next one. Uh, with more depicted travel scenarios. So uh, depicting various situations in the small scale with a note of absurdity. For example, how can a human shoe actually help evacuating a tree species? Um, next one, please. So the second idea was this Wheel of Fortune, which would be a spatial installation, uh, because we recognize the, and, um, the repeating cycle of construction and destruction from the perspective of this regenerative natural body. So this is like a s Wheel of Seasons, a depiction of the pressing cycle of the construction and the eviction, followed by, this, again, the repossession, repossession of the natural bodies while the buildings eventually decay. So the outer circle would be moving, so the visitors could like turn it, like the real Wheel of Fortune, of course. And the stages are, for example, um, natural ecosystem destruction, evacuation corridors, new shelters, uh, new buildings, abandonment, and then early, early um, ecosystem. And in up there, we have where crater is now, actually. Um, and then the next one. Oh, yeah, sorry. The center is something context, so the th center doesn't really move. And the next one is actually just a close-up of the, of the small um, Here would also be inside the little illustrations of the evacuation, like how animals, um, it's quite apocal apocalyptic, actually. <laughs> so the next, um, we already come to the conclusion that why we choose the term evacuation, because it somehow emphasizes the aggressiveness of the erasing the habitats by the build-up space. But this can apply to crater as much as to numerous cities, where the capital kind of dictates urbanism. But it is also a call for recognizing the leftover spaces, as we heard also before, uh, spaces absent of human design, maybe as important spots in the ecological networks. But on the other side, the project emphasized temporality, which the wheel actually means. And it's saying that nothing is constant, especially not in nature. So space is made of its inhabitants and migrations are a natural process. And maybe the last thought would be, maybe sometimes sacrifice is needed in the natural ecosystem because maybe the palace of justice has the power to bring more justice on bigger scales. Um, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So next? Yeah, just no? wait just for okay. a few seconds more. Uh, uh, hello, I'm Primoz. Uh, I'm also from Krater. Uh, maybe I have more of a comment than a question, but I don't know, about a year ago we had some uh, geologist on crater and uh, he was looking at all the invasive species growing on crater. Uh, and we know that invasive species can be in some context uh, beneficial, for example, they can speed up the process of building a soil, but in other contexts they can be really harmful, especially to the biodiversity in the natural environments. And um, he was explaining or he mentioned that basically evacuation in a way will happen spontaneously uh, to some degree, especially regarding to invasive species. Uh, but uh, uh, and the reason behind it is because when they will start building the new palace of justice, uh, the they will dig up a lot of soil and this soil will end uh, up who knows where. And with this soil, a lot of, for example, seeds from black locust tree or roots from the Japanese knotweed or stuff like that will be moved. And this, um, yeah, these plants or this invasive species will, species will start to grow uh, on other locations. And basically, this is uh, one of the, how could they say, uh, basically one of the main ways how the invasive species spread into the, in the environment. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but we also said it's actually yeah. just uh, showing the process that will happen. So, it would be just illustrating them, not, um, not designing them. Yeah. Then, can I add? 
basically what we were dealing with um, is facilitating those movements. For example, spreading out. Uh, if we, for example, Dunajska Street next to Krater was now renewed, rebuilt. And now we have really narrow um, street line, but sidewalks are 10 meters wide. Sidewalks could be narrowed too, and the rest could, you know, could be like a green corridor for movements. If we would have resilient green web throughout the cities, then maybe um, like migrating crater wouldn't be such a problem or maybe like the loss of crater wouldn't be such a problem. But now actually it could be because it also, it's totally disconnected from other green patches as well. But once you have this unified green body within cities, then they're more resilient and it's basically, yeah. Uh, maybe not even invasive, you know. When, when you have succession and you have all niches uh, filled, then you cannot, I mean, you call it a, s a stable ecosystem, which is different to like normal ones, but <laughs> you know. Are there more questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I have just a comment for these plans. <laughs> Urška, you presented uh, at the beginning. Uh, actually, it's all about the scales. And um, the plans, the strategic plans are really, you know, big scales, I mean, uh, for the whole city. And yeah, we, if you go to the, um, to the um, implementing and the plans, like the de design plans, we all know that it's like uh, really, um, um, you know, you, you are working with details. And um, did you think about the, the evacuation? Also, how can we how can we um, support the evacuation of species like during the construction actually? We make um, landscape plans in the documentation for the building documentation, like how to move the trees or, yeah, you know, all these um, processes that can be done, you know, for, I mean, for the valuable, uh, like see we say valuable uh, <laughs> uh, vegetation and and so and I think um, it should be mentioned too. I mean, there's a lot of things that we we can do um, that are not maybe spontaneously done, but we can help. Okay, that's just a comment. That were the travel scenarios, which maybe were really short, but uh, remember the tree on the skateboard. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. <laughs> that yeah. were like um, yeah. a bit more absurd, but of course it, um, I mean, we didn't think of exactly how it, um, yeah. Uh, it's of course hard to move grown up trees uh, and trees that are as big as chestnut uh, trees in, uh, in Krater. It's probably impossible to move, but what is possible is to include all professionals that are dealing with um, like ecologists, landscape architects and other professions that are dealing with um, uh, planning of uh, green environments uh, to be included uh, with uh, document documentations for uh, developments such as uh, Palace ju Justice Palace, for example, so we could perhaps prevent such scenarios up front already. Um, this could be like this could be one uh, thing for how to, for example, move the building away a bit from the existing trees, how to preserve existing ecosystem like where the crater is basically it would be like years and years and years of succession to actually gain something from the actual crater in crater but the, the other parts are, are kind of more fully grown which is maybe we can find a way to incorporate both so development but more easy development and uh, remaining of crater to some extent at least Um, 
how can we protect this invasive species? Uh, so, you know, because when you design a new park on this place, uh, you will, will be said that you need to get rid of this invasive species, you know? By law, you have to, yes. But By law. Yeah, they will come back. <laughs> I mean, this is yeah, also they will, a, they will uh, stay there, yeah, but uh, I mean, you, you cannot plant them as uh, in the... Yeah, like... Uh, yeah, like they did, like they, they were brought uh, basically as a, as a garden species. I mean, they were not yeah. uh, like a beautiful species, not as an invasive at first, like this fallopia japonica, but um, of course, even if you, even if you try to um, kind of take them, to take them out completely, you cannot. So it's yeah. also fi fighting with this is also fighting with windmills. So it's kind of, you know. You know what would be like the right thing to do if you have um, Fallopia japonica? You would need to cover. You would need to cover the ground, the soil for three years with black black foil. I don't know if they will be able to do that. You know, to to kill all the weeds. You know, and you would have to have sterile um, soil, which is also imp like almost impossible to get on the market. And na 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 na. So it's. Um, for sure, some some of the crater will remain in crater by just you know having the same soil there. Um, maybe that could be interesting to see. I don't know, but these are then just um, possible scenarios of predicting. Just the last question before I pass to Maya. Uh, your landscape architects. Why why are you an activist as an as landscape architects? Why do you think like uh, that, that the community of landscape architects maybe should react to the um, um, conditions for the competition and why why there was no like um, comment from a profession? I don't know. We are very much involved in the design process and basically we are uh, working in this profession of designing and. Um, in, in Chattavati and you know we are developers you know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know what I mean so it's a uh, it's basically it would be interesting to incorporate um, yeah more ecology into the design in general and um, I mean we're on you know we are working in um, in basically it's landscape architecture so it's similar we, we do design public space so it's um, also um, an issue of teaching us or to letting us know how to may maybe progress in, in such a way we could kind of, I mean, of course we, we find crater in such spaces beautiful. I mean, uh, huh? for me it's very aesthetic, but it's perhaps my personal view, but I know it's not um, <laughs> you know, uh, acknowledged uh, on, on a wider scale of profession, for example. I mean, yes, in Germany, for example, or you have uh, succession pockets and uh, but this is this is more of a intellectual or design concept or like uh, an idea than is a real practice or you know it's more of an idea than is uh, or, or it's a selling point more than it is uh, effect of Maybe just uh, because I I'm also um, sometimes I'm also part of the juries for the competitions in the chamber. But um, you know, in the in this pro project tasks um, are written really um, maybe should be written more in this direction. But uh, I don't know. In the last competition I was involved in, it was a. Uh, Kindergarten in the coastal area, we stressed, I don't know, the, the preservation of the existing trees and such things. But yeah, maybe maybe landscape architects should be like more included in these processes. I don't know how it was with, the, with the, this Palace of Justice because I wasn't um, participating there, but um, um, maybe, yeah. So uh, just a question then, is this maybe just uh, an, um, a problem of putting down the new standards? I mean, <laughs> we, do we 
just need to write them down? I mean, or is there anything else in, uh, in our way? Or do we need to change the whole culture of uh, landscape planning and the standards for, um, I mean, inclusion of these green uh, ideas in, into the, the planning itself? This is a question. Okay, uh, yeah, we, we, at the chamber, we have like, uh, there are a group of landscape architects, of course, we have a license is for, for the project documentation. And we are working a lot um, inside the, the chamber, but um, yeah, actually in, in the laws, uh, in the building law, um, it, this, this um, our profession is not so, so much um, like, stressed as, I don't know, others maybe, or maybe we are just, I don't know, not in this critical mess, you know, that we can change the world. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, we are, we are just trying, um, and I think we, we, we are in good direction right now. Uh, also with this um, future, um, questions and maybe priorities that cities will have uh, because of the climate change and uh, all the problems, so, yeah. Can, can I first add, add one more thing? Because I forgot, uh, these slides completely made me defocused uh, when I started, but what Klaas and Debra taught us during this mentorship was also we were thinking about letting or like just leaving the nature do its course, uh, like uh, we were thinking about absence of design, but they taught us about stewardship. So c how can we steward this um, semi-wild or wild nature? How can we kind of incorporate this? Or this is uh, another logic we're not accustomed to. Um, and also, yes. Um, and also about maintenance of these green patches. You know, a green lawn is a green lawn and it's more monoculture. We could just, you know, we have now like um, some areas where you don't moan and you have like beautiful um, flowers or whatever. But, you know, this could be important in terms of a city of uh, having different scales of maintenance and um, uh, stewardship of nature of this of course, you cannot say nature today. Uh, can I just uh, comment? We are, we are hurrying. OK, we can talk later. <laughs> Thank you so much for this presentation and um, I think at Krater we already started a little bit of this, um, uh, uh, two little strategies of evacuation. We have been collecting many seeds from the plants um, that are growing on the sites, and we're also giving away the seeds as a gift. So probably by the time if the Krater will be extinct, um, the life will be supported and um, sort of, yeah, will happen in other places as well, also with the stewardship of Krater. Um, but now we're moving on to the next group, and this is a group of landscape architects, um, Zuzana and Just Justina. I think they're coming from Poland and Slovakia. And um, the group was very, very much interested in the rights of the soil life that is currently um, happening and present at Krater and they were kind of developing and looking into three directions. One direction would be if the Palace of Justice wouldn't be built, so what will be the future of soil life if the Krater community persists on the site? The second strategy was um, what is happening with soil life if the Palace of Justice is kind of um, yeah, moving away the soil? And the third one, was a very interesting one and they were looking into the synergies. So how can Krater ecosystem as it is currently coexist with the planned future Palace of Justice? So I will just pass the word to Susanna and Justina, um, please. Uh, hi, 
Uh, I'm Justyna Chmielewska. Um, and yeah, happy to be here today and share also uh, our, our project and the research uh, that we have done about the soil and soil life. Uh, Zuzana unfortunately cannot join today, um, but I will be here uh, to answer questions and um, yeah, talk. Uh, but we have prepared a movie um, together, so we would like to share it. Dear Crater community, advocates, stakeholders, fellow teams and the public, we are Zuzana Janczowiczowa and Justyna Chmielewska, landscape architects based in Amsterdam. Today, we would like to present to you our project named Soil Protocols, in which we explore three speculative futures for crater location. These scenarios show how different factors and societal forces can impact the soils. In this project, we argue for more complex understanding of the site development and the importance of the living soils for the healthy and inclusive living and working environments. By focusing on living urban soils and its rights, the whole chain of other living beings can benefit from it. Since everything in nature is interconnected, human well-being is critically dependent on the Earth's natural systems. Human beings are part of nature and our human rights are intertwined with the environment in which we live. In the midst of the climate change, we pledge for new ways of urban development where we build our cities not only for humans but all living organisms regarding animals, insects and plants. This project is an attempt for raising an awareness about the importance of living urban soils. We see soils not only as a substrate and carrier of buildings and roads, but as living ecosystem that supports life on Earth. Today, the location of crater is a vulnerable site of local ecological importance which future is being jeopardized by human-centered approach to urban development. The former gravel excavation pit is planned to be transformed into a palace of justice, a 53 meters tall modern building with glass facades and deep underground parking facility. Future building will cover almost 70% of the location surface where existing vegetation will need to be removed and a lot of soil excavated. These anthropocentric practices will strip soils of its organic components and deteriorate it, the soil biota. But why are living soils so important? Soil is a living ecosystem that is essential to life. Soils represent at least a quarter of global biodiversity. The plant and animal life depend on primary nutrition cycle that is organized through soil. Living soils are the basis of healthy habitats. They provide food, clean water, raw materials and various ecosystem services. They are an intricate and complex system where even a slight change in microclimate, water balance or land use can influence the whole ecosystem connected to it. In order to visualize time of soil shaping events and its possible future scenarios, we have created this timeline. When compared to the lifespan of the human being, soils can be considered as non-renewable natural resource. The soils are under pressure of the human activities. Rapid urbanization degrades and seals of the surfaces cutting the interconnected living webs into pieces. Destroying soil life comes easy, but it takes thousands of years before a thin layer of living topsoil is formed again. Most of soil organisms live in the thin, delicate layer of topsoil. The first meter 
under the surface is crucial to all life on Earth. Geologically, landscape of Ljubljana is very rich. The soil starts forming billions of years ago due to the weathering and erosion of rocks. Changing temperatures caused rocks to expand and contract, after which water filled the cavities. The action of wind and water resulted in smaller and smaller pieces of rocks. The limestone, the calcium-rich material typical for karst landscape, has been formed by layering bones of prehistoric animals. The location of crater has been regularly flooded by Sava River. Floods brought gravel deposits from the Alps, which settled on top of the soft limestone. Top soils were rich in humus layer and living organisms. In Roman times, the location was a burial place. Already then, the human activities started process of thinning the living layer of soil. During the expansion of city of Ljubljana and new development of the military barracks, the top soil was compacted even more. Over the past 20 years, due to unsuccessful planning processes, Crater had the opportunity to renew its top soil. Just at the start of its soil formation processes, the location will soon encounter another deterioration of its soil biota. In order to have a look into the future and imagine what might happen to Crater, we have developed three scenarios which in diverse ways tackle the importance of soil life. This is the scenario of the financial stability, in which state has enough money and decision-making power. The location of Crater is developed as a tabula rasa according to the latest architectural proposal. In this scenario, the feral ecosystem is dismissed and a new human-centered program is introduced. Living soil is compressed and destroyed during the construction and development process of the new building. There are many hidden ecological costs to this scenario such as unhealthy urban heat island, droughts, flash floods, and loss of soil life. In the second scenario, new green left-wing government stops the development of the Palace of Justice because of their ecological values. There is a long period of decision-making and negotiations between different stakeholders. Nothing new happens here, so the nature has a chance to keep developing and establishing itself into stable and robust ecosystem. People have limited access to the location and the Crater Creative keeps its role of educators and caretakers. With minimal interventions and maintenance, they maintain the human nature balance and support biodiversity. Different plant and animal species find their home here. The topsoil enriched by organic material acts as a sponge that holds rainwater and subsequently cools down the surrounding areas. As of 21st of July 2022, for the first time in the history, the United Nations has declared that everyone, everywhere, has the right to live in a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. That decision clearly recognizes environmental degradation and climate change as interconnected to human rights crisis. Slovenia, as a full member of the United Nations, agreed to take into account the interests, values and opinions of the organization. The last scenario builds upon this UN resolution. Nature and culture are not two different entities, but rather one interconnected system. There is a symbiosis between the nature development goals and public program. The new building of Justice Palace is an integral part of the crater landscape. With minimal footprint, it is designed and constructed in such a way to pose minimal disturbance to the existing soil. The building is porous and hosts not only humans, but all forms of living. The area is developed with seven generations in mind. 
This means that after building served its purpose, it can be easily transformed or overtaken by nature. In the future, we need to take under consideration diverse aspects of project development, from policy making and assignment formulation to design, construction and maintenance. In developing the new Justice Palace, we need to ensure that specialists from multiple sectors work together. During the building process, it is important to avoid soil compaction. One of the methods is stockpiling the existing humus layer to keep the life within it. Last but not least, the maintenance is also an important part of the multi-species centered scenario. The maintenance methods ensure the balance between human and ecological needs. Caretakers safeguard the biodiversity of crater, spread the knowledge about the importance of ecological maintenance and educate the broader public. To conclude, our actions and design choices have an influence on the future generations. By visualizing soil shaping events, we have gained the understanding of the values of soil to our urban ecosystems. When developing cities, we need to think not only about economical profit, but also about the underlying landscape systems and soil life. The Palace of Justice can serve as an example to other future developments in Slovenia. It establishes new soil-human relationship that call for more than human care. Hi, Stina, can you hear us? We can hear you just a second. Can you say something, Justina? Uh, can you unmute yourself when oh, you're... Oh, yes. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, welcome to Ljubljana. Thank you for this uh, great and um, detailed presentation. Uh, we will ask public now if somebody has um, mm -hmm. a question for you. question or a comment? A comment? Um, I, I like the, 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 the process of thinking and developing the idea. And it's interesting mm -hmm. because you, um, you're the first who switch from plants to, to actually to, to grounds and probably to whatever plants and animals in the grounds. But you changed the perspective, so you, you moved away from the plants and then you came to very um, uh, manageable uh, scenarios. Uh, uh, it's, it's a, I, I like it very much, it's very interesting because it's much more difficult to think about, you know, through the plants and the, the, the rights of plants and the, their uh, whatever equality when we are talking about the development of our needs in space, because that's the, that's the conflict we are uh, mm -hmm. discussing. So it's, it's interesting because the SARS gave you, you know, the perspective that you incorporated the solution uh, or solutions. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, it's, I think it's interesting that um, we started from such a small and um, detailed perspective uh, as soil. So we really started from microorganisms and um, kind of one layer um, of, of crater. And uh, thanks to that, actually discovered how everything is interconnected and how, yeah, uh, how this one element influences all the other. And what was important for us is not to dismiss the, uh, the future of of crater, the needs of people, uh, and um, kind of see how um, could we combine this. So how could we still build uh, with, um, yeah, with thinking of needs of, of soil and 
the whole ecosystem um, and people being part of this ecosystem. So, yeah, I think the, the last uh, scenario, um, yeah, shows that. We have one more question. It's not question, it's just comment. Uh, Lukas Parl. Um, I would like to say thank you for this uh, excellent presentation, really uh, very nice presentation and especially very important topic, very important topic uh, uh, connected with soils. Uh, so maybe I would just like to say, um, okay, uh, one thing, um, time error. Uh, soil needs a really really long time to develop and we could see that in very short time just in one action in one movement yeah um, everything can be destroyed everything can be uh, damaged so i think uh, your way of thinking and presentation is really the, the right way and very important. And maybe if I can make a connection to the previous uh, topics, um, we have many trees in urban area and if we are talking about soils, uh, trees cannot live uh, very good without enough place, without healthy soils, without mycorrhiza. So I think uh, really important uh, topic. So thank you once again. Okay, thank you <laughs> for this nice comment. Yeah, that's also indeed like our discovery. Um, yeah, that's, it's really all influencing each other. And um, yeah, as you said, trees cannot live without mycorrhiza and um, the soil life. And, and um, yeah, also one more thing that I started to think uh, of is that, um, yeah, it's nice also to understand how much time it takes for soil to develop and how um, little time it takes to destroy it. And that's why also we really wanted to, um, uh, yeah, visualize it with preparing the timeline to, to see also the impact um, of human actions and um, yeah, the, the kind of the contrast between um, the time it took to develop and grow into yeah, this living being and yeah, the actions of people that um, influenced it and um, degraded it. We have one more comment or question, Martin. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Martin. Uh, I can also only uh, reiterate how important the uh, soil topic actually is. Also in the, on the level of European Union, we're talking more and more about uh, the soil biodiversity. Uh, I was also involved in some ecological modeling of understanding uh, how the soil food networks, uh, uh, soil food webs um, uh, uh, actually work and it's very complex and the most of the, the, the public doesn't really of course understand the whole complexity of the ecosystem that is behind. And uh, for now I guess we've been mainly focusing on uh, the soil uh, condition in the aspect of agriculture and in preserving uh, nature and it's very interesting that you you're bringing up this topic in the urban setting uh, and i was just wondering if you have also maybe some examples from maybe from netherlands where you work if there is some research going on that they're actually doing some uh, you know uh, actually some sensing and some analysis of of the of the soil uh, in, in urban areas and whether there is also some response in terms of legislation where they would actually take this um, metrics into account where doing, when doing urban planning, for instance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
thank you. Uh, we uh, actually, um, yeah, got inspired and uh, really, um, yeah, took a lot of information and source from the book that was developed by the municipality of Amsterdam. Um, now I, I forgot the name of this book, but it's always laying around <laughs> here at the office. Um, which and th this book, um, yeah, focuses on uh, the life of uh, soil and um, also on um, like on the way that we could protect this life um, in the urban setting. Oh, I have it on my desk actually. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's biodiversity and matter of vital soil. I have it here. Um, so that book definitely, um, well, teached us also a lot uh, during this project, the course of this project. And uh, to answer the second part of your question, if there are any legis legislations or laws, um, to be honest, I don't know about that. Um, I don't know if there are laws concerning protection of uh, soil life. Um, no, but that's interesting to find out. Right, I can comment also for the agricultural soil in Slovenia. I really like it that you touched upon something that it works uh, more as a science fiction, like city soil. We don't know much about it. Um, but for example, agricultural soil is something that we're very passionate about. Uh, but when it comes to spatial planning, um, yeah, it's always set aside. Uh, even agricultural soil that maybe in a comparison to urban soil might have a bit like more value. <laughs> uh, it has. Uh, practically no value basically and uh, soil fertility is not um, considered an as, as an important topic in spatial planning. For example, when we plan flood protection measures, many times mm -hmm. we're thinking about, okay, let's just place um, dry detention basin on best agricultural soil and actually nobody believes us that uh, this will um, yeah, provide a loss to soil fertility and production potential. Yeah. But we also have good uh, examples, if I have, uh, will, I will be very short. Um, we have a good example of soil recultivation, of agricultural soil recultivation, and a really nice story. Uh, during building of hydropower plants at Sava, uh, Savinia, sorry, Sava, Lower Sava River, uh, we had to recultivate. Um, so one of the reasons why, one of the proposals is that uh, we should protect agricultural land, and we uh, had to recultivate a larger area of uh, agricultural land. We had to um, l um, make it. Uh, uh, so we had to not. Um, we had to make it higher than the level, the new level of the river. And it's where we developed uh, really strict soil protocols, um, which then involved um, yeah, looking into how the soil is dealt with and what are the sto uh, soil uh, piles that you were discussing, um, what is the size of them and how are they placed and so how is that soil being then uh, placed back in which order. Mm -hmm. And this is a really a quite a success story that we had in Slovenia. But of course, as in every project, th there were uh, yeah, malfunctions going on and a lot of fertile land was also just lost uh, in a black market. <laughs> so it was sold uh, yeah. during, during the process. Um, so th I mean, we have a few steps more that we need to yeah, take in also in agricultural land, not only in urban soils. Mm -hmm. So it's great. Your presentation yes. was good, thanks. Thank you. Sounds really interesting, uh, the project that you are describing. Uh, it would be nice to have a look into that. Uh, uh, just one comment uh, to, to do this. Uh, we should, um, maybe I, I, I can tell <coughs> each implementing design would have part how we deal with soils. So 
there is the practice that the fertile part of soil is removed and the piles, how, how uh, high the, the piles can be and how long the, the and where it is to be deposited is like really part of the documentation. So it is, uh, one part is, uh, Rosalia told, you know, there is black market and of course there is interest for good soils, but there are two practices. One is that, uh, how we are dealing with fertile part of soil on the construction sites is uh, planned and it's part of the documentation and practice. And the second is that um, also if the land is uh, um, infected by uh, invasive plants, it shouldn't be uh, brought at the same location, but it should be, you know, um, put in a process so that mm -hmm. the, the uh, seeds and the uh, leftovers of the invasive plants would be uh, destroyed through time, through the procedure, and then they can be, uh, th then the land can be, uh, the soil can be used again. So there are some protocols mm. already, but what is really um, interesting from, from the part of, you know, uh, like species being equal or soil being really important is that we don't have a special law so in environmental protection law, we would have the, and the program, uh, Slovenian program, we would have these restrictions and uh, protection actions. And in practice, we are working on it, but we are not so strict that we would put it in a law, which is like really interesting because it's really Im an important part of biodiversity. We, we don't, as Luca said, mm -hmm. you, you can't have trees if you don't have soils. So it's, it's really important. Yeah, hopefully that will change and uh, there will be a law also to support this. Yes, I think you can conclude now. Thank you, Stina, so much. Thank uh, you for joining us and being here at Mladinsko Theater with us. Um, send our regards to Susanna. Uh, I will. <laughs> it was incredible having you here at this project. Thank you for it continuing this work. And us. yes, uh, in front at the entrance, there is a five meters long um, history of the soil of Krater, which they managed to do. Um, so you can go there and read in detail uh, what they presented today. Uh, the last, uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. The last group is also dedicated to soil. It's called Terra Testimony. Um, when Guy and I sent, uh, sent out an open call, we were sure that we want um, international open call because these teams are not that much um, alive in Slovenia. And we wanted like really diverse thinkers to, to join. But we didn't expect that the professors from the Parsons New School would join and we got um, an amazing um, collaborators in them. Uh, I'm not sure because of the time difference if they are with us on Zoom, uh, but uh, Jane Piron, Barbara Adams, and uh, Hala Abdel Malak uh, worked together as a professors at Parsons, but also as a collective effervescence, uh, which is an ongoing socially engaged project that embraces a living systems approach to storytelling and speculative fabulation that expands our imaginaries of justice-based futures. They sent us a video, I think that they did Dear an plan. interviews, they did an interviews with the other professors at the Parsons New School um, on a team of uh, what does soil mean and what this uh, Terra testimony actually is. So after this presentation, we will have a one hour break uh, and uh, we hope to see you um, again here in one hour at three o'clock, three and 15 minutes, yes. Uh, and thank you really for this um, enjoyable discussion. Dear planners, 
policymakers, developers, and fellow designers. Terra Testimony, Soil as a Living Archive, is an artistic exploration of microbial soil diversity. We speculate and examine how microbial deep earth acts as a bioarchive, a place of generative decay and a site of reliance. If I'm to think about soil or dirt, dirt is such a beautiful word because it, it's almost on a monopoetic dirt. It's basic, but complex, it has the density of a star, it's alive and rich and varied and mysterious and microbial and complex and it's like a it's like a galaxy. And I think perhaps I consider my body some borrowed dirt. It's a dress for my soul to walk around in for a while. And it's so related to time and nonlinear realms because it really doesn't have a beginning or an end. Um, it doesn't exist in notions of chronological time. I might hold some dirt in my hand and then not hold some dirt in my hand, but... I know that what I'm holding in my hand doesn't have a beginning or an end. We ask, how might we engage in multi-species world building on an increasingly paved over earth and make visible the rich and exuberant multi-species micro entanglements beneath paved over sites? Those of you working in design, planning, development and policy exert profound impact on how we live in urban environments and how we live in relation to the soil and to the life of which Earth is composed. For this reason, we appeal to you and ask that you engage with the life of the soil, acknowledging that we as humans are wholly dependent on the vibrancy and dynamism of the microorganisms and soils that sustain us. We have to uh, remember that we are not separate from the natural world. I think that we have to remember that we don't own the earth, that we don't own the land, the landscape or the land. We don't own nature. Nature owns us. We are part of it. And that's the thing I think we have to learn. This project, Terra Testimony, embraces a living systems approach to storytelling and speculative fabulation that expands our imaginaries of justice-based futures. We explore the robust relationship between the natural world and the industrial one, the membranes between man-made structures and the microspheres of the earth. Through observing, listening, and sensing, this project offers opportunities to study the livelihoods of tiny soil-based communities by inviting you to see and hear, to experience the aliveness of the soil. What if developers, planners, designers, and policymakers were more attuned to the soil? How might soil awareness reconfigure and influence the design of cities? In becoming soil experts, what might you do differently? We propose an artistic intervention that provides a view into a bioarchive of how we, as humans, dwell with other living things in urban contexts. This builds on a long history of artistic work that explores the capacities of the earth to provide valuable testimony for the earth to act as an actor significantly shaping our worlds and futures. Coal has been, historically speaking, nourishing the soil and who were these communities and people and how have these ways of being in touch with the soil been eradicated. So Silvia Federici talks about how there's still a witch hunt for communities and people um, who 
have um, a kind of animistic relationship with the natural world. And my question is, why did we erase that animism and how can we move towards that? So there are many communities and many groups of people that have been metabolically positive and nourishing to the soil and soil practices. So I am curious as to how we can re-engage with those practices and, and kind of what would be the way to activate those histories and, and, and communities. And we invite you to participate and to build capacities in understanding and collaborating with the soil. We welcome you to consider how, in an increasingly paved over and developed world, we might build soil solidarity. How can you, through your work, provide sanctuary and sovereignty to soil, along with the people the soil sustains? Spaces of appearance, according to political theorist Hannah Arndt, can be understood as generative gatherings in urban contexts where people, with all their differences, engage in lively forms of collective world and future building. Philosopher Elizabeth Povellini encourages us to extend this to natural entities such as rocks, rivers, and sand dunes. Um, just to start in a good way, I'll introduce myself and just share, you know, the soils and the land that I'm calling in from. Um, Anin Bojo, Kinawea Kijagate and Dishnikaz, Nimki Benese Dodem, Atapamiziwak Creek Meti Kweendao, Benesi Okanin Nising Dongjaba. So I just said hello and shared greetings, um, and I shared the name that was given, my Anishinaabe name that was given to me in ceremony meaning um, Gijigate, she shines like the moonlight. And uh, I share that I'm from the Thunderbird clan on my father's side and that I am a Métis person, so I belong to the Métis nation of Ontario. Um, and I do have on my mother's side Icelandic and uh, English roots. And I also shared that I come from um, Vanessa Okaninising, which is Flying Skeleton Bird Lake, which is the soils, the flying skeleton bird in which I come from, which is, you know, I thought this is a really beautiful uh, thing to start from because I was very aware as a young person of the soils um, that I grew out of. And so uh, Flying Skeleton Bird Lake or Skeleton Lake was made by a meteorite. So when we speak about the nature and the spirit of soils and how that meteorite came in, you know, we understand that the lake has many, like there's many beings, many supernatural beings, but also that meteorite carries a spirit that sits there in the center of the uh, of the lake. So we, we speak about that and trying to do some work around that. So Terra Testimony does this and provides a space of appearance that extends beyond human participants. By inviting the life of the soil into this consequential space, we aim to complicate the dominant and extractive relationship we as humans have with microbial life. Specifically, we suggest creating an opening, a hole, a rupture in the pavement that provides a view through the human-built environment into the vibrant ecosystem of the soil that lives beneath. This opening provides a forum for study and learning where people can interact with the soil using the sensor kit we are creating. This kit extends perpetual capacity so publics and practitioners like you can listen and view the life of the earth that is concealed and often curtailed by the built environment. This installation raises critical questions and underscores the fact that, as science and technology scholar Maria Puig de la Bella Casa asserts, Soil living worlds do not belong to humans, humans belong to them. Along with creating a space where the soil can appear and be heard and be seen and be felt and be smelled, this project provides pedagog 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 okay. Along with creating a space where the soil can appear and be heard and be seen and be felt and be smelled, 
This project provides pedagogical programming and hands-on experimentation to generate new narratives and relationships both between and beyond the human. Ernesto Colado, owner of Brava Nariz, says, we are containers of this microlife, we serve it. There are around 100 millions of bacteria in one squared millimeter of our tongues. We are a form of transportation for life, and so is the earth, a spaceship for living creatures. So at the end, ancient books said it right, we are dust and to dust we will return. Thinking about it from this perspective gives us a much more humble way of placing ourselves not among, but within the earth. The soil is teeming with creatures. Our intervention gives these creatures a platform, decentering the human, disrupting exploitative inheritances of earth belonging. Social and political orders are founded on the distribution of the sensible. Some species, ideas, and people can be sensed, heard, seen, etc., while others remain outside their perceptual capacities. Terra Testimony redistributes frames of visibility, audibility, and patterns of intelligibility. This has the potential to create new alliances and forms of action, generating what philosopher Jacques Rassier calls new communities of sense. Through an artistic exploration of soil diversity, this work speculates and examines how microbial deep earth acts as a bioarchive, a place of generative decay and a site of reliance. Through our work, we consider how to make visible the rich and exuberant multi-species micro-entanglements, seeing soil as a vibrant, for that offers living testimony to multi-species alliances. Our project asks participants and audiences to consider ecocentric approaches that begin through sensing. This project asks, how might we learn from the soil so we can radically decenter anthropocentric and hierarchical notions such as rights and stewardship, among others? Borders are marked in many ways. Fences, walls, and barricades often are used to establish where sovereign claims shift from one nation state to another. Almost a third of the US-Mexico border has run down the middle of the Rio Grande River, bending and flowing on the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Like all rivers, the riverbed moves over time, taking the border along with it. I have been particularly interested in how borders are simultaneously marked and crossed via a, a variety of intricate policies and infrastructures. Dirt, dirt Archives has drawn my attention elsewhere, away from maps and walls, to dirts and rivers. The very idea of the river nesting in the Rio Grande Valley suggests a point of connection between the highly securitized territories north and south of the river. Looking at dirt draws the eye to the soil to rocks, to mi microbial organisms moving back and forth, along, across, or even underneath the river. No bordering here, in the soil underfoot. Passages exist, things move, and claims to sovereignty retreat. Imaginations flourish. Human soil alliances can actively disrupt exploitative and anthropocentric inheritances encouraging new imaginaries of earth belonging. By making the aliveness of soil audible and visible through recordings and visual renderings, Terra Testimony aims to generate multi-species communities of sense that extend sovereignty to all living beings. This celebrates the vibrancy of soil, expanding our capacities to make space for multi-species interactions that propose new ethical orientations and forms of ecological consciousness. As practitioners who shape our urban environment, we ask you to participate in this work along with us and our soil-based symbionts. I will make just a short comment. Uh, their first idea was uh, that we should record the sound of the under the, the ground, uh, which is paved, and we should record the sound of the soil 
which is not paved. So this is what actually they aimed to develop uh, in the, the continuation of the project. And I think it's they're all basically artists and social uh, working in um, uh, at the faculty, but this how scientific approach was really interesting uh, um, in shifting perceptions of what is invisible actually in the soil. Um, so yes, we will make um, a break now and uh, we'll be back in um, at three o'clock, three and a quarter, yes? Yes, three, at three o'clock, yeah. Thank you so much everybody for joining us and uh, giving, um, giving a comments into the debate, yeah. <laughs>
am băgat tigor, da, e uh, acest de glitch pe gal. Ce? Că te mrejă, mrejă pe gal. Da, ok. Să mi cabă să am tot o clan, că e probleme. E cabal de tuk dok. Ja, ampak jaz sem HDMI. Ja. Ok, in pa sem rečemo, da se klepa vse da se to ulovim. Sem lahko klepal, pa če mu rabila, veš, tam. Ne, ko se ne bova pol powerpoint. Hvala, ki nošiš kaj.
welcome back. Um, I hope you had some lunch in case you were snacking here uh, in our lobby. The burek that you were eating was made by our dear colleague Sebastian and it's his signature dish by now. So he's famous for making his um, Japanese knot with burek. Um, so we, we bought a little bit of ferris, feral foods also to Mladinsko. But now uh, I have a great honor to introduce you to our second keynote speaker, our dear colleague and mentor, Debra Solomon. And she will be speaking about mitigating landscape fragmentation. Um, as I already previously mentioned, uh, Debra Solomon was also the curator of the Dutch Pavilion at the uh, 2021 Architectural Biennial in Venice. Uh, and she's also a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam in the Department of Urban Planning. Uh, in 2019, she coined the term multi-species urbanism, describing urban development that gives primacy to multi-species interrelations and care of the natural realm. Debra Solomon is the founder of Urbania Hove Foundation, which develops part-like public space food forest commons with locals. Current projects include a 55-hectare urban food forest in Amsterdam Zudoost, and a demonstration food forest from a former parking lot in Amsterdam North, whose top soil and biodiversity has been described by soil and biodiversity scientists as paradise on earth. Urbania Hove works with local communities producing climate crisis infrastructure in the form of food forests in public space, urban greens. The name stands for the city as our farmyard. So Urbania Hove is a city as a farmyard. Um, as it implements residence-driven edible ecological frameworks. Debra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gaia, and uh, thank you very much, uh, all of Traina team and Krater team. Uh, it's been a real honor these last days, um, and also actually this whole entire trajectory is really inspiring. I can't see anything, <laughs> but I am very inspired and honored to uh, work uh, alongside you and as. Uh, to see your team working in such a beautiful way and being so creative. Today I'm going to talk about mitigating landscape fragmentation through multi-species urbanism. And I'm going to put my hand up every now, I'm going to try to remember to put my hand up. This is an image from CPOL, um, Continuous Productive Urban Landscape, by uh, André Villun and Katrin Bohn who in 2005 invented this not very sexy term to talk about continuous landscapes in cities in order to build a structure for urban agriculture. Um, when I founded uh, Urbania Hoover in 2010, I was honored to be able to produce a project that built upon this uh, CPOL concept in uh, The Hague's Hilderswijk. This is called Foodscapes Hilderswijk. And uh, I'm going to show you some, you'll see maybe some Dutch urban planning, uh, spatial planning. You see these uh, apartment blocks in white. And in the interior bits are the urban green public space. Here are some of the neighbors that um, I got to work with in this uh, uh, project, which involved lots of people. The, all of the projects like this involve lots of people. And um, this image shows, aside from the community, the community of practice of this uh, Foodscapes Hilderswijk, what you see is some urban, oh, sorry, I'm not, uh, yes, perfect. Um, you see uh, tall trees, you see grass, you see shrubs, and this is uh, the way uh, public green space looks in the Netherlands. It's not uh, uh, very elaborate. Um, after that, uh, Urbania Hoover Collective 
uh, was honored to work with uh, Foodscape Wildemann Community of Practice, a group of people in Amsterdam, New Vest. Here you see the fingers of somebody, yes, designing the um, space, at the, one of the first uh, nursery spaces in the neighborhood, and um, building a like a cupola of wisteria that they want that they wanted to walk through. This ended up being a, a temporary project. This is the team in the cupola, and I don't know how to gracefully say to switch slides. <laughs> there we go. Um, and this area, th this is not just uh, one space, it was connected to a whole tissue of green spaces. This image you see is um, back up to the beautiful crown of elderflower. Um, one slide back. Yes, this is uh, just, this is the, the wild, the feral space right outside this uh, very built urban space. So we were always looking uh, to take existing public space and make connections to the feral space as best we could using the uh, already the layers that were already planted, the planting that was already there. Next slide. Um, this is our studio in Amsterdam North, which used to be a parking garage, uh, parking uh, space. Uh, it was sand and um, not much else. Some of these trees, uh, some of these trees actually blew there. They weren't, uh, they're also wild. And uh, in 2011, we got the space. And uh, this is already four years later. It's already quite, feeling quite amazingly uh, wild and full and voluminously green and diverse. But this is the soil. And this, um, Let's go to the next slide. Yes, this is the Dutch soil. Dutch urban soils are not terroir. Uh, Dutch urban soils are composed in places like this, uh, where there's, in fact, they are substrates. Uh, uh, places are excavated and filled to do uh, urbanization, to build uh, buildings and to make new uh, real estate, in fact. Next slide. And so most of the Dutch urban greens, they're designed and maintained for a universal human, uh, but there's, but more than humans, other than humans, the more than human multi-species whole is not mentioned as a stakeholder. And in the governance sector, the, there is a lot of siloization and outdated knowledge in all of the associated disciplines. A lot of what's going on here we see in, uh, in the other pro in, uh, that are mentioned in the other projects that we saw in the last days, but also uh, some of the issues that uh, Krater is confronted with. In um, Amsterdam, the greenest areas are the areas of, uh, with the worst health records in the neighborhood. Not because of the greens, but the greens in fact are not really green. Um, there's diabetes and obesity, uh, there's incredible environmental injustice, food injustice, and a fear of what the green space has to offer. So it's a real problem. So right now we're gonna make a zoom into the project space, the most recent project space that uh, Gaia already mentioned of Urbania Huvo. So we're gonna, I, don't, I will probably not do it at the same speed, but we're zooming in to uh, the project space and this is a good place to stop indeed, because what you see, these green areas around here are the ecological framework outside of the built environment of Amsterdam. And uh, what you see, in fact, I'm gonna go to the screen. So next slide you can see that these uh, green areas connect through, if you go to the next slide, one more, yes. Then you see that uh, the district that's called the, the K district, all the streets start with K, everything starts with a K, um, is connected to the green infra uh, 
green infrastructure, the Balmer Vida, the Balmer Meadow, and the Perry Urban Ecological Framework, and it connects to the uh, Nelson Mandela Park through the neighborhood. So we thought this is a great place to situate a public space connector. Uh, there's a research team, uh, Beninda et al, who did research on biodiversity, and they determined that to reach the highest levels of biodiversity, you need a space that is a minimum of 53 hectare. It sounds like a big number. It's not a big number when you think of the city as a whole. This is actually, this is a really tiny space. But there needs to be strong green tissues uh, that are permanent so that this high level of biodiversity can occur. Um, in the first presentation, Stepping Stones, they were talking about how all the biodiversity goes through crater. Uh, this is true, and it's true that these pioneer, pioneer species are not particularly important, this huge amount of species, but they, um, or they're not, they're not a threatened species, but this is not a good uh, indicator, actually. It would be better to, s they're most important to the species, the red list species, the threatened species, rely also on these species. These species mustn't become threatened species. If you think of a nest of birds needing to eat about 10,000 insects in a week, they need to, a place to lay their eggs, they need uh, places uh, to overwinter, uh, they need uh, nectar to drink and eat. So these non-exciting, uh, non-threatened species are also absolutely important in the green tissue of the city. Next slide. So we're gonna go through a few slides now. This is the footprint of the Balmer, and the next. And this is the same footprint, but you can see uh, that the entire community of practice, uh, we work together to uh, make different typologies of the different kinds of green spaces. So in this connector K district area, we see that there are pocket woodlands uh, where we can do edge landscapes. Uh, there are meadows that can be made out of these uh, ridiculous lawns. Uh, there are aquascapes. There are also some, pu um, some public space pieces that are really highly trafficked. For example, we have a place where people make, of the Winti religion, make sacrifices at this uh, statue of Mother Earth. Or there's another uh, square which just receives a lot of traffic, a lot of traffic in, uh, in wheelchairs and a huge amount of community traffic. It can't be the completely wilded space, it has a more representational feel. But there are other places that are the educational food forest locations that uh, allow themselves to be, have uh, didactic uh, programming. Next. So um, with these different typologies, we were able to get uh, like a, oh, what, can you go back a little bit? Yes. Um, all these different spaces of importance. So we have a kind of tour that people can walk through. And to connect all these spaces, uh, that's the next slide, is this um, <laughs> diagram. Um, these lawns, which are everywhere in Amsterdam South Oost, um, how they are maintained really dic dictates what kind of, uh, of natural realm there is going to be. This is actually the biggest footprint in this green space in this neighborhood. So we were able to negotiate with the municipality, our collaborators in this project, um, this ecological mowing. This is a scheme which is not thought up by us, but maybe it's something that's easy to read, that in the first year at a certain, uh, between April and May, there's gonna be a, a pass of a third, mowing just a third. The rest of the space can, is a place where um, insects and animals can stay. And then in June and July, another pass, but in a different direction. Again, 30 to 40 percent. And then now, basically, end of September, beginning of October, there's going to be another pass um, of 50 percent is going to be mowed. And 
That way, there's always spaces that were never mowed. There are spaces that are different heights above and below ground. Um, in the next year, the, in year two, we'll do it, but in a back, you know, we'll go backwards and a different direction. So the next slide shows the maintenance uh, map of the municipality. And if you look carefully, it, you can see the yellow and the purple kind of match up with the shape of our footprint or what we consider our project area. Next. So we'll skip this and just have a look from a bird's eye view of what it looks like in April. So what you see is a lot of nectar and habitat and you see uh, insects coming out and there's lots to eat. But without this uh, mowing regime change, this transformation, it becomes a different ball of wax. Next slide. Oh, it keeps looking like this, very beautiful. And the next, oh yes, we have uh, tiny humans. And then the maintenance starts to happen. So this is what it looks like. This is uh, nothing, this is maintenance. This is removing all the weeds, removing every plant that wasn't in the plant list for this little tiny parcel. This happens to be in the most representative place that we don't dare, well, we didn't dare uh, plant other things. And you can see that the old style of maintenance before we started to collaborate with the municipality, it was causing drought. And here's the next slide. Uh, and causing er um, erosion. Next. Here's a space, it's looking great. You can, well, you can see this tire track right there, but in the next slide you see, after the mowing, you see the tractor with, I mean, you don't need to mow <laughs> this with a tractor, completely compacting the soil. And the next few slides are gonna show soil compaction and also a devastation of all the vegetation. And the next, you see drought, and the next, you see more drought. This is drought creation by the maintenance regime. Another one is what it looks like. This is an example in Amsterdam. This is what it looks like when it's done correctly. It's not too hard. There are examples in the city of where it does go well. And so we're trying to create this kind of look in this area. Next slide. This is a report. These are actually two reports. On the left, a report by the Green, uh, the Public Works of um, Amsterdam Municipality that signaled that they had a problem with how they were maintaining these greens. And it was sparked by the initiation of the Amsterdam Zout Oost Food Forest project. So we're very proud to have <laughs> created this internal problem. Um, what you see also next to it is another report about the poor health that is caused by, amongst other things, lack of useful greens, stress factors, dust factors, and all kinds of pulmonary issues that happen because of this kind of drought um, production and dust production that happens from the maintenance. Next. This is us walking around with the alderman and trying to convince uh, and talk about how to do things differently. Okay, now we're gonna get into some, the next slide, we start, uh, we'll start talking about multi-species urbanism. So I developed uh, this idea, of course, uh, for the biennial, but this project, Amsterdam Zaudo's Food Forest, is um, inspired by the notion that if the multi-species were directing how the uh, maintenance was happening, the, the design of the urban greens was happening, it would look a lot different. And these ideas come from different, uh, uh, you know, theoretical uh, tracts, and you can see a few of them listed here, probably my supervisors would say there's too many, but uh, multi-species urbanism is inspired by right to the city, uh, the, these areas of encounter and multi-species uh, we, we would like a multi-species right to the city. We also see the continuous productive urban landscape. It's inspired by certain parts of urban political ecology 
and so forth. You can have, if uh, you're uh, academically inclined, you can, this would be interesting to you, possibly. Next slide. But it is, um, it intends to be a just urban development and spatial practice generated through reciprocal interrelations between humans and more than humans. And uh, this critical spatial ecological practice extends the right to the city and the right to the urban metabolism to an alliance of more than humans. And next slide. Uh, these are some of the tenants from the manifesto, and we'll go straight on to the next. This is a core concept of what and who is multi-species. Maybe some of you recognize the roots of this uh, statement, that our relational selves and bodies are the urban ecosystems, and our urban ecosystems are our embodied selves. The next on our values, uh, one of the core values is decommodification. Multispecies urbanism demands decoupling the production of basic resources from capital accumulation and speculation. So then we're gonna hear about, uh, we think immediately about the land and land resources and food. Next. The design and care of urban nature is characterized by multispecies urbanism support multi-species ecosystems and extend the imaginary of landscape architecture beyond the culture of monocultures. It changes public space and spatial planning paradigms. And the next and last one that we'll all talk about today is um, on the role of agricultural production. In those images that I showed you, those maps I showed you at the very beginning, uh, you see this green ring or collar actually around this part of Amsterdam Southeast and in back of that is agricultural land that is under producing. So Amsterdam Southeast is a place with, with uh, that is a food desert but there is empty agricultural land and land that could be used also as a collar for the ecological framework. But that requires that we practice regenerative agriculture and that we decommodify this land and that we also decommodify our food systems in the city. This does not mean that uh, farmers don't get paid. It means they get paid well. This does not mean that culture workers and care workers do not get paid. It means they get paid well to do this care work. Next slide. I think we're gonna go, I think I'm not doing amazing for time. So what we're gonna do is um, kind of quickly go through these super quickly. Um, I use the word food forest a lot, but these are feral natures. So this uh, set of slides was mostly to explain what are um, what is a food forest uh, from a historical, ecological, a social, and a governance perspective. I'm gonna um, go to the, we'll see how quickly I can do this. Next. Um, it is from a historical perspective, food forests, so these are feral landscapes that we're, that we're uh, making in public space. They're th but food forests are the oldest form of land management and some say they are 60 th up to 60,000 years old. And also, they belong to everyone. And we, were, we learned how, and every culture, they don't belong to a certain part of the world. They are, it's the kind of land, uh, land management that we were doing from the beginning. And we learned to do this from animals. So let's see where this is. They're um, done in layers. And we can just uh, keep going quickly. There are many social aspects to food forests. In fact, they're more of a social entity we could see than an ecological entity. And we'll just go through because I actually want to spend more time on some other points. Let's see. And we'll stop at what food forests are not. Let's keep going. Let's stop there. The no one back. Um, what a food forest is not is it's not only a planted uh, and landscaped area, it has other, these other aspects, these social aspects, places for encounter. And um, an urban food forest is not 
suitable as a temporary strategic planting uh, in a top-down technocratic way. It's not merely a mechanism to save money on landscape architecture and design and maintenance of public space. The neighbors will do it. Neighbors, the locals have already paid taxes for these public spaces. This is our space and we need to be able to use it and access it. Um, an urban food forest does not lend itself to old management forms when these do not serve the socio-ecological aspects of the food forest. And it doesn't lend itself to technocratic problematization or obstruction. This new form of co-management with the natural realm requires willingness and enthusiasm to develop new technical and organizational working methods collaboratively. Uh, it was yesterday that we were talking about degraded spaces, that some of the work that we're doing in these projects um, causes people uh, to react that we are in fact degrading the space. But there is no scientific evidence of this from a historic, ecological, social um, aspect, possibly also not from a governance aspect. Okay, next slide another beautiful bee's eye view. And then again, these are, this is kind of my thank you list. Uh, this is not work that, um, this is the work of a team. Um, and this is just to show you, it's such small writing because there's so many people involved, but none of this happens without my colleague, Renata Nolan. Um, we are a, a team. <laughs> And uh, this also, this kind of project can only happen in very close uh, collaboration with a willing and allied municipality. But I'll go on to just do the final bits of slides um, to talk about Krater. So probably everyone here is familiar with this uh, situation and we'll go through to the next one. And we see Krater there in the middle, but also now we're gonna zoom into Krater slowly so we can see what kind of green structure Krater is. And we can already start seeing how these darker areas where Krater is are just clearly, uh, this is the hub also like uh, some of the other um, presentations, especially in the Stepping Stones uh, presentation, really pinpointed that uh, Krater is at the heart of uh, a green tissue that uh, connects really uh, larger green tissues in Ljubljana. It is so important that it remain because if it is gone, these other places will cease to be uh, connected. A building site to fragment a, a landscape is not some, a fragmented landscape is not something that can easily be prepared, the net, the uh, repaired. The networks that are going to be um, destroyed are not things that are easily re-engineered. So you've been hearing today many solutions and you're going to hear uh, more uh, attempts at rethinking how this can be avoided. But um, what remains is that this uh, project uh, requires extreme uh, support, also financial support, to remain active uh, so that it can preserve uh, something that once it's lost will deeply and negatively affect Ljubljana. The temperature of the city will rise very rapidly and there will be very erratic um, uh, uh, weather local weather conditions by the absence of such an important node on this ecological web. So it uh, really is important to keep this web together. Next slide. This um, is a picture of one of my favorite anthropologists, uh, Val Plumwood. And I made this quote based on some of her thinking. She said, in good city, uh, she said something else, but I made this quote based on what she says. In good cities, we must produce public space in such a way as to acknowledge our kinship with those whom we share our space, which does not forget the more than human that we are and which positions the production of space as multi-species. Next. And uh, here we see an image of uh, Stefania Barca, 
Um, I'll talk, uh, you'll see her in the bibliography of this uh, talk. Um, she talks about um, a, a basic care income because the kind of people that do these projects that keep these uh, ecosystems knitted together, aside from the multi-species part, also the human part requires care. Um, recently, I was involved in a collaboration with uh, Lucia Bagbina, and we, um, as Amica Arcs and Graham, uh, developed this regenerative pricing method for paying precarious culture workers, workers that are doing care. Um, it certainly will be obvious to everyone in this audience and uh, present yesterday. It's a lot of women. Um, in Amsterdam, it's a lot of women, women of color, uh, women of a certain age. Uh, there's, it's not uh, a coincidence. These factors are not a coincidence. So we uh, really developed this new component of payment for this kind of care work that uh, we would like to start adding to our invoices. One is the creative content continuity fee because we write a project, we prepare a project, that can take months by a team. We do our project, we may or may not get funding for that. And then after the project is delivered, there, uh, therefore payment stops. That is the time of administration, finding new funding, uh, reflecting and resting for the next project. This is completely unsustainable. So we um, add uh, a huge uh, percentage for this uh, creative content continuity fee. And the next uh, fee that we developed is the consensus time fee. Projects like Krater, uh, projects like the Amsterdam Zaudos Food Forest require enormous amounts of coming to agreement with dis disparate bodies, like governance, bodies of governance, amongst others. Uh, there are the tracts to find these people in governance is not evident at the beginning. It's extremely time consuming. And this can take a project completely off um, our own self-made time uh, timelines. So um, we start adding a fee for, to compensate for these risks that we have that we cannot ac accurately produce a timeline for projects of care, of the level of care of a project like Krater or Amsterdam Saudos uh, Food Forest. It is impossible. Uh, govern government workers are not working according to seasons like uh, care workers that are working with a multi-species whole, and this needs to be addressed. Um, there is a link, the regenerative manifesto.org, there's a link to a very preliminary uh, report of a very preliminary research, uh, but you'll see some uh, interesting writing on this subject, hopefully. And this um, article underneath is Stefania Barca. It's actually an interview with her talking about this care index. It's also part of the Green New Deal proposal of uh, um, the Green New Deal proposal. Next slide. And the next three slides are actually just a bibliography. So just so you know that it, when these are put online, you'll have a huge uh, choice of reading materials. And um, this is actually Mal Plumwood's quote. Let's get to one more slide. One more, yes. And she, what she said and which inspired me so much was that in a good human life, we must gain our food in such as a way as to acknowledge our kinship with those whom we make our food, which does not forget the more than food that every one of us is and which positions us reciprocally as food for others. And the final slide is some um, links for you. And I hope that that was uh, coherent and that uh, I'm looking forward to hear the rest of the presentations. I want to thank uh, Krater once again and the entire team for inviting me. And uh, also on behalf of the um, uh, Amsterdam Zaudos uh, community of Praxis and our stakeholders, and also on behalf of the Urbania Huva Collective. Thank you very much.
the floor is open now for questions. Um, so please raise your hand and we will um, provide the microphone. There's one down here. Okay. Hello. Um, so uh, my name is Alyosha. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was uh, through reading your slides and your in your presentation, I saw those words willingness and enthusiasm. <laughs> so. Um, I'm going to uh, maybe ask you a little bit about this. Um, I deal a lot also with spatial planning from the legal perspective, but also as a, let's say, activist. And I'm um, really interested in how do you approach the municipality for them to be so open and willing to allow projects like this to happen? Um, thank you for your question. Um, I did not mean to give the impression that that was an easy trajectory. <laughs> it was uh, very difficult and um, we had a lot of help. We had an, al we had an alliance of the willing and um, the chief science officer of Amsterdam has done an amazing job to link all different uh, groups and uh, she is uh, the most supreme networker that you can imagine and intricately links different groups of people. And still, there's not necessarily, it's not so that there's some kind of uh, lovey-dovey atmosphere about this uh, project. We, uh, we through Caroline Nevian, uh, were able to uh, find uh, a group of people from all layers of the hierarchy of the governance of yeah, the municipality of Amsterdam that would be willing to work with us and we're excited by this project. Um, but it is not so, as I thought before I started working on this, it is not so that this person who is the head of this uh, silo of, of green maintenance work, for example, or public works, just because this person wants it or the mayor wants it does not mean that everybody will just uh, fall in line and start immediately working on this. Uh, governance has elected officials, it has civil servants of all different kinds. Amsterdam has uh, 17,000 civil servants, employ 17,000 people. It's the biggest employer of Amsterdam. So it's quite uh, diverse and extremely horizontal. And so uh, with the help of uh, Caroline and other, uh, uh, Eddie Adusai from Amsterdam Zoutost, and uh, um, we had, we just had an, a, an amazing team. We also had legal experts that could help us uh, find our way through this. And it took a really long time. And even so, one mower, one contractor can really uh, um, put a wrench in the spanner and stop the whole thing from going. Even today, it is difficult to get uh, the, the amount of layers we have to go through to, to speak to people that are doing municipal works or that give the permits. It's very, it's very difficult and there isn't a path for this. And I think a way to go forward um, this project has, we have a stakeholder group, but um, it would be useful to have, uh, in, for in the future, to have, to maybe possibly pre-compose stakeholder groups. I don't, I don't uh, act, uh, know what would be the best, but it was, it was really actually very difficult. And um, we work with the people that say yes, and they are at all different levels and um, can create exceptions and can create uh, space for projects like this. Um, of course, we're thankful for all of these exceptions and all these like moments that somebody gives you a break. But actually, um, in my heart, I don't feel we should be so grateful and <laughs> all the time. These are things that need to happen. 
uh, so that we can keep living in livable cities. It's more than obvious that this needs to happen from a social science, from an environmental science uh, point of view. So on the one hand, of course, we're um, uh, very uh, enamored with the generosity of this ally, uh, uh, this group of allies, and we know how much they have to step out of their role, also work extra just to get this thing done. But on the other hand, it's the stuff that should be happening. So uh, we need to not forget that and uh, remember that uh, if we want to have a city which is not a dusty drought and does not have uh, temperatures uh, higher of up to 45 degrees, which are sometimes reached in parts of Amsterdam in the summer or have drought conditions that kill the high tree canopy, that actually this is the only way to do it. This is not a, a little engineering job that you can work around in a technocratic way. This will be the way we have to do it. So we have to um, create more alliances and get our um, collaboration <laughs> and continuity fee <laughs> for doing this. Uh, hello, my name is Christina. I am uh, from an NGO that does mostly um, uh, work uh, with injustice in a further sense. Not, we are not directly involved with uh, many ecological themes. Um, thank you for your presentation and the answer. That, that was actually what I was interested in as well, <laughs> the how to convince the um, people in the power structure. Um, but my other question would be, uh, when you were talking about food forests, you mentioned the social aspect of them and the communities that mm -hmm. build around them. And uh, I was wondering if you could tell us more about those communities um, and their uh, role in the further development of uh, uh, this project and also how to approach people who are not inside the power structure, uh, how th to find those people to start a community. Thank you. Thank you for your question about the social aspects. Um, okay, well, this project started in 2018, uh, before the pandemic. And we had a plan uh, that we would uh, go and we had a, a core group, we did a call. And this is how Urban Yehuva goes about its work in general. Now we make a call. When you make a call for something like this, you get you know the people like us that show up, the 12 people that show up and are interested in that kind of thing. But this is not a representation of this neighborhood. And then what we also do is go to existing groups that, you know, a church group or uh, the ladies empowerment group in uh, the Balmer or um, the, uh, at the Alacondra Community Center, there are different groups. There's also the Surinam's uh, Seniors Breakfast Club um, of women that are really old, but they're like the ambassadors of the whole neighborhood. And the empower gr empowerment group is a mostly Ghanese um, women, Ghanese Dutch women um, that are doing all kinds of empowerment things, also learning how to have a production garden, learning sewing, learning how to ride a bike, etc., being together and everything. So just going to these group, making real friends, just being uh, present and making real relationships and constantly uh, presenting our agenda. We want this, we want it for this reason. Does it overlap with anything you want? And it turns out that in both of these groups, there were a number of people that uh, were attracted by this idea. And we started giving, um, and during this period, 18, 2018, 2019, we were uh, obstructed actually from planting. Like we could plant uh, bulb, winter bulbs, uh, nectar for winter nectar and early spring nectar, but we couldn't, um, we couldn't affect the mowing. We knew that they would be mowed. Uh, we couldn't plant the fruit trees yet. And this obstructive process no, let me back up a little bit. At one point we had a uh, course, we were giving the courses like this theoretical course to give the group cohesion. So we offered a course, um, urban uh, food forest design maintenance. 
uh, design and maintenance. And all of, I think, up to 24 people were following this course, and it was really fantastic. And we were showing how to forage and how to cook and also teaching about plant dynamics and permaculture and regenerative regeneration of soils. And it was going great. But the obstructions by some of the spanner people, <laughs> the obstructors, um, actually caused um, the project to be laid, delayed twice. And each time we lost a lot of people from the uh, community of practice. So, or for example, at a certain moment, the project was allowed to go forward. We were allowed to plant, but by accident, because it takes a long time to get it right. Also, you heard a story from Klaas, my colleague uh, earlier, uh, still mistakes are made. There's a lot of uh, people involved in maintaining urban uh, greens. So sometimes uh, the beautiful um, lawns that were becoming meadow and had these wild bulbs all coming up, then they would be all mowed. And then this was also just so emotionally devastating to members of the group that this also caused groups to leave. And then we had the pandemic and then at this point, we were um, allowed to be working. We also finally received from the municipality a transition officer who would develop, who would act as a process manager. She's also mentioned in the credits. And without her, this project would not have gone forward. This person was an expert in transition. And she got all of the disparate groups at the table, like the governance groups that were obstructing, or even a mower, or well, actually they weren't involved later, but the, the green groups, the, the people that were writing the contracts to um, get to the table, not to write a policy that's like some um, big words. It was like about really tiny little things. We will do this. We won't do that. We won't plant any exotic invasive species. We won't make any structures that are larger than a square meter without asking for a permit. Uh, just really tiny details. And she got us to agree on all of these uh, things that became the policy document of the stakeholder group, which was really, and she was able to even codify this document. And then she left her position as was scheduled. And um, so then the we had a new process manager with, that was one of the older, that was, that was also in the constellation before. Anyway, um, in this period, also in the pandemic, we went through, actually we're now on our fourth community of practice. So a lot of the original people are still involved in some ways, but the groups behave differently. So a community of practice is a dynamic thing, is the way we're looking at it. In the beginning, we had this uh, idea that this sort of like army of green care workers would manage this whole area and we'd have a very iterated programming. But now we, uh, through time and through the the changes that happened within the course of developing this project, we also decided, oh, it was also another thing, the municipality wanted people to sign contracts for the different parcels that they would care for them. And we strongly disagreed with this. This is public space. It is meant to be paid for and maintained by taxpayer money, and there is taxpayer money to do this. So uh, we decided to put our attention to the connecting tissue of the meadows. And these are so, uh, if they are maintained with this ecological phased mowing, th that is the connective tissue of the food forest. So in fact, now what we do is when there are a group of neighbors that want to have like an orchard, a food forest orchard in their area. We, these are the heavily, more heavily planted areas. And uh, the green tissue of the meadows connects it all. So instead of focusing as like one core team, now we work with different location teams in their area. And that works out just fine. Wasn't our original plan, but uh, it's what things ended up being. And it's, uh, 
I'm actually very happy about this because we would have been, if we had gone with the original plan, we would have been tempted to make all of these uh, civil and uh, local uh, governance structures like signing contracts that we're gonna take care of this green and we would, they would have been liable for something that's public space. So actually this ended up uh, working out a lot better. Thank you. Um, my question is maybe like asking you to read from the hand, but anyhow, I will ask you. Uh, what you did, it sounds for me very, very important. Uh, I mean the action, the manifesto, what you prepare, that all invisible work of NGO could be seen by the government, yes. Uh, my question is, uh, we know that, we probably assume that our culture, governmental culture, administration culture is slightly different than yours. What is your expectation? How much time do you think you need that what you prepare will become true? Thank you for this uh, question. Um, mm -hmm. Well, okay, uh, first of all, this is the work of many, many uh, people. This is the work of uh, at least 70 people, this particular uh, project. Um, and some of those people are, are civil servants also. Uh, it is really important to find the right allies. And when you do some, uh, I think what I discovered these past few days is that trajectories for these feral landscapes for, now in this case we call it a, f a public space food forest, but it's the exact same thing, uh, slightly, uh, well, rewilding, letting nature take um, the upper hand so that we can live in livable cities with in, in a beautiful way. Um, what the work at the moment the legal aspects of uh, maintaining greens call uh, what we're doing degrade, yeah, degradation of the landscapes. These, uh, so how long will it take? We need to have a paradigm shift in the thinking of the zoning of public space. That's, uh, that would, uh, that's, yeah, there's different ways of going about things. I, I don't um, mean to give the impression that I could prescribe what is uh, <laughs> the, the quickest way. Um, allies is all, having allies is always a good way. Uh, creating pathway if, and, and having them and pressing them to help you make pathways in governance that make exceptions, make pilots, uh, call things pilots to make uh, examples. Uh, I, I personally don't believe in the uh, little, the little you know, stringing together little successes. I prefer to blunder through and <laughs> make, uh, try to go for the uh, big ambition because of the climate crisis, which dictates a rather fast change. So I don't know how to answer this question. I don't know that the governance would be so very different actually. It's always um, intricate and uh, not particularly transparent. You're trying to produce uh, a pathway in a system which isn't there. So you have to be like the roots of the soil that also find a way to do it, find the easiest way through the allies and uh, you're, you're building infrastructure, uh, you're building institutional infrastructure when you do this work effectively and you're doing it with all of your stakeholder allies. So uh, how long, all, I mean Krater is quite far actually and it has to, uh, uh, there's a necessity to prevent uh, destruction. There's, uh, it's act, yeah. The destruction has to be stopped, that's all. <laughs> yes, maybe.
sorry, I'm afraid that my question was not clear oh. enough. Uh, and I went on and on. Uh, <laughs> no, no, you are very <laughs> short. <laughs> uh, what I would actually, what I would like to ask is, uh, you mentioned before a lot of invisible work that NGO done. Ah, yes. And uh, you are trying to get finances for this invisible work. And my question was focused on this. Uh, how, how s what do you expect? How successful you could be and how long? Okay, about getting financing. Well, for in our case. Invisible ca work. Yeah, for the invisible work. Well, um, we start to name it and we're going to start putting it on our um, invoices. <laughs> um, I don't. I believe it was Gaia who mentioned that there's a group here that is also busy with this topic. Um, in the Netherlands, we're also busy with this topic. Um, I think that we have to just constantly mention it and put it on our budgets. Uh, it is true that everything that we put on our budget isn't always paid for, but let it be a glaring unpaid for post. It's extremely unfair and we need uh, to remember that we are infrastructure activists in our work and that we just need to keep pressing for it and keep, keep asking slash demanding it and at some point it will be honored. It's, um, it's only reasonable. It's work, uh, we're doing public work for public good and uh, we're doing essential work, care work. It needs to be compensate, compensated. There is an alliance, uh, also politically there are allies in this. Uh, Stefania Barca wrote this uh, section about the care the basic care income in the DiEM 25 parties uh, uh, alternative Green New Deal that mentions this kind of care work. And that's a European um, thing, but we can, we have a lot of theoretical material uh, on which to base this. And also we mustn't remember, uh, we must always remember that um, it's not just a universal human that is doing this work. It's mostly certain kinds of people. And we need to uh, uh, make, to say that very loudly and clearly that this is uh, part of just producing just society, that we are paid for this kind of work. I don't know how long it will take. I hope before I'm dead. <laughs> Uh, I think we'll finish, yes. uh, Deborah, now with okay. this message. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. thank you, Deborah, so much. That was um, yeah, super nice to hear from your side as well. Um, we'll continue now with the second part of presentations and for that I would like to first welcome our new group of sta stakeholders that are mostly coming from the field of law and here with us we have um, our colleague Mitya Jagar who was also at one point part of the mentorship program that we did and he's coming from the Institute for Ethnic Studies but he's also a professor at the Faculty of Social Sciences. And then we also have Alyosha Pitek. Uh, he's coming from the Legal Center for the Protection of Human Rights and Environment, PITS. And he's an environmentalist lawyer, environmental lawyer. And with us today is also, we've heard her today already, um, Christina Krantz from 8th of March Institute. And she's also representing the field of lawyers. So welcome um, everyone also the public, and I will now pass on the word to Danica to introduce our first group from the second section called the Craters Multispecies Community. So uh, when, um, when we uh, set an open call for participants, um, we received many different um, responses and uh, then um, it was really hard for us because uh, uh, some students from Slovenia applied and we could not 
include them actually by the level of knowledge and uh, um, experience was really different be between our students and the groups that were applying. Uh, but then we decided not to go by this ty ty typical hierarchical way to how to choose groups with which will work during the program, but uh, to combine them, to suggest them that they uh, do the work together, even though if they are di in different time zones and they're in different countries. So this group that we'll present now to you combines is such a combination. Um, it includes our dear architect, uh, architectural student Jana Stankic from Slovenia, uh, who applied uh, uh, with um, actually a protest. She was uh, really angry about the, the green spaces that were cut from her neighborhood. And um, uh, Zuzana Segedi, I hope I, this pronunciation went well, um, and a group of her students from uh, Budapest. Um, she is a Boston Bud Budapest-based artist and her field is interdisciplinary art theory and art practice. Uh, pedagogy with focus on ecocentric methodologies. Um, the methodology uh, she initiated is a response to an absence and failure that she carefully observed and analyzed, and as a result, uh, she landed on a new approach that connected uh, uh, her research on cybernetics, post-human decolonial studies, and the logic of ecosystems, especially plants and plant communication. So when you combine uh, this uh, uh, group, we got Redefining Cybernetics Conference. Uh, so be composed, this is a hard topic, uh, and we can't wait for you to present here. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Conferences like this are very important, especially to create new language and connections. Can we have our slides, please? Yes, thank you. So learning about Krater was very exciting for us. It was a new group that we formed just for this, um, this program. Krater and the, and the work happening at Krater reminded me of the historic Macy conferences um, from the 1940s. And I saw a parallel between Krater's need of interdisciplinary dialogues and the Macy conferences that created paradigm shifts in human evolution. So for this program, we are interested in revisiting this conference as an exercise and to learn about how it can be inclusive that acknowledges multi-species interconnected, interconnectedness in science, law, practice, theory, methodology, you name it. And this is very important, especially important because Krater is situated in the fourth industrial and third cybernetic revolution. Thank you. Okay, this interdisciplinary conference made various isolated disciplines work together on a shared topic of the position of nature in an urban environment, more precisely, questioning the position of nature that took over an abandoned construction bit in Krater Bezigrad. Our group goal is to, based on the case study of Krater, raise awareness to the general public about how, how cybernetics relates to Krater and how would upgrading it, how would upgrading cybernetics 
influence and question the adequacy of how we treat nature in an urban environment, locally crater. Our suggestion is based on our research and it is to upgrade cybernetics through a series of conferences similar to the one that we are at today, um, that we're attending today. Cybernetics, in very, very short, is a cross-disciplinary thought that enables members of many disciplines to communicate with each other easily in a language which all can understand. It enables transfer of information between different disciplines. It is very important because it is infiltrated in all cognitive sciences. Furthermore, it is infiltrated in our everyday life more and more. This integration in all cognitive sciences also shapes the way we think and perceive things around us. We wonder, how does this fit without dis our distorted perception of nature in particular? For that, we explored the, the, its origins. As mentioned previously, the foundations to the cybernetics lay in the historic Mason conferences, which took place in the 1940s. Their focus was on understanding the human brain and bridging the barriers between the living and the machines by forming a common language that would enable exchange of information between scientists of different fields. This sets the foundations for cognitive sciences, meaning biological, psychological, law, medical, academic, etc., research, language, instruments, all of this derives from this. And also scientists at the original MISI conferences also investigated uh, possible communication between humans and machines, meaning living and non-living things, which gave the foundation to machine learning as well. However, the common language was formulated between the machines and the living, those being people and animals. The line was drawn in the living domain, leaving out plants and fungi, or scientists and sciences, that would introduce them and represent them. Since all cognitive sciences, as we know them today, derive from the consensus achieved at this event, This knowledge strikes us with concern. This sets the left behind domains in an inferior position in a way without a voice or real understanding of how those systems work and connect to others and how understanding them could upgrade and also benefit other systems. So these conferences were also instrumental to develop tools such as the viable system model, VSM, that helps measure the viability of any organization based on functions. And this is just on the side note because I know there's a lot we're covering, so just a sh short uh, inclusion for the VSM. But uh, now let's look at the problematics in case of Crater. Next slide. The example of the problematics is in the formal classification of the real use of land. Interestingly, Krater is understood by the authorities as built land, and this discrepancy, as we see, is rooted very deeply in the system. There actually is no adequate classification for nature in urban areas in Slovenia. All land is divided between agricultural land, forest, water, as you can see here written above, unfertile land, built land. And all nature in urban areas is classified within the category of built land. Also, any land smaller than 5,000 square meters by default cannot be classified as natural because the land smaller than that is of no use to a farmer, regardless of where this plot of land is located. This makes us think whether the land has to be of use for the people, for us to even recognize it, is it for what it truly is. This classification is regulated by the Ministry of Agriculture, which does not possess the required knowledge nor interest in lands unusable for farmers. 
The change of the possible classification is therefore disabled, for the land is not regulated by someone who can recognize its value. The proposal is to correct this established point of concern, so back to the foundations and the missing plants and fungi, by simply, literally, redoing conferences starting in the 2022, by inviting sciences and humanities from the fields previously involved and those from the missing previously overlooked fields, forming a new base for sciences, adequate to the reality of things, since plants and fungi are unquestionably living systems. This adaptation is necessary, not only for the sake of adequacy and democracy for plants and fungi, but for our human way of understanding human systems as well. And there are a lot of uh, great tools that came out from cybernetics, but uh, we suggest to see these tools, such as the VSM, the viable system model that I mentioned before, as the, um, also in the process of further evolving. This change has to be accompanied by other changes as well, of course. But also, by itself, we believe that correcting this fundamental mistake in its origins will change our viewing and attitude towards nature, as well as introduce unknown ways of how plants and fungi function that will reset sciences and our minds. Maybe it will question our viewing of nature in the urban environment in Slovenia. Maybe it can question the rightfulness of Krater's fate. So the next steps for us is to organize a conference, a cybernetic conference that we call Cybernetics Under Review. We had different names for it. Um, or Expanded Cybernetics, Redefining Cybernetics. One of the exercises at this conference, we imagine to be looking at the original transcript of the Macy conference. You see um, the title on the, on the left and the first page, the introduction in the middle with the highlights that uh, we're showing the inclusion. And suggest inserts regarding plants and fungi to exercise the shift on the speculative level, um, just as a start. We imagine these uh, conferences to be inclusive, educational, and taking place in multiple locations, especially at Krater, because Krater will be the pilot program for this uh, specific uh, cybernetics conference, and over several years. So we're thinking about long term. We're not rushing anywhere. We would like to do this right. And this will not only help Krater to connect with um, connect their work and impact to science, but it will be a gift to science community to be able to work on a, on a case in real, real time. Thank you. <laughs> be open for questions. I hope you understood everything. <laughs> it's quite a big topic, so it was a challenge to compile every everything in sh such a short uh, format, but uh, I, we are working in such a good team, thanks to Krater and the mentors and the team members, so. Uh, I would go first, if uh, you allow me. Uh, thank you for this presentation and congratulations for preparing it. Um, uh, I especially like the <laughs> visuals for the conference. Um, uh, I would have uh, like a further question on what you said on the uh, regarding the, the categories of land. Uh, so would you suggest, uh, what would you suggest this, an, do you suggest that uh, forming another category would be sort of a solution? How would you call it? How would you define it? Uh, do you think that would be actually a solution for Krater as well? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, all the information that I collected and that I presented to you regarding this uh, specific case 
I communicated with the Ministry of Agriculture as well as um, Minister Snoza Giudinsky Institute as well. I don't know the name in English. Um, these two institutions uh, directed me and described to me a little bit about the history of why it is as it is today. And the reason behind this classification is that originally it was under the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, this sort of classification of lands that only regarded lands from the farmers, from no one uh, else, from not from built land, not from waters, just the division of the lands for the farmers. And since they had an established system, they upgraded it, they used the system as a basis model and upgraded it with adding other uh, like types of land. So they didn't investigate, they didn't, um, it wasn't in anybody's interest in the creation of this uh, classification to further or to more properly uh, divide the land that is in the cities, the urban land, because it was done by the Ministry of Agriculture. So they do not have an interest nor the knowledge to, to do this. So the suggestion would be, of course, to add categories for urban nature. I think that would uh, uh, call for maybe a separate uh, legislation or a separate institute that could run this and uh, more detailedly um, make a division and uh, do something with it since the Ministry of Agriculture does stuff with the sexual use of land. They, they have methods that they can use with, I am not an expert in this, but also it could be done by some sort of a new, not by the Ministry of Agriculture, but by a new institute or by a new m group that could uh, be fit to know these things, that could classify them properly. I hope I answered you well. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I really like the, the classification of uh, urban nature. I think that is a very, very nice uh, it has a very nice ring to it. Um, maybe I would like to continue from the special spatial uh, planning perspective. Um, what are all the disciplines that you would like to include basically in these new conferences? I'm really interested in what's the, how wide is this uh, inclusion that you're thinking about? Thank you for your question. It's very important because originally my interest in Macy conferences were I was very inspired by um, the inclusion and, and the interdisciplinary aspect of it until I learned more and more about it to find out that actually it wasn't that inclusive. It was more science-based. Uh, Macy conferences were funded by the Macy Foundation, which is um, today a, an active um, medical research foundation. So what I... I see um, connection and a nice parallel, but kind of in the opposition, is the funding, the level of funding here in, at Krater. We are lack of funding and lack of uh, appropriate support, right? And also um, at the Macy conferences, mostly scientists were invited. Here we would like to um, um, invite anybody who would be interested in seeing the connections because there's a lot of connections. And um, so it would be definitely be an open call. And um, I see a lopsidedness in, in this uh, cybernetics, even the, in the interest uh, or understanding from the humanity, um, because we need more people who can come in and um, work with the leveraging the quantitative and qualitative measures and the hybrid measures, which we talked about earlier um, yesterday. And, um, and I think it's very important to include anybody who, who has a proposal to uh, thinking about this with us. Yeah, that's exactly what I had in mind, uh, basically, because, you know, when you have uh, natural sciences, so let's say um, doctors of this and that and whatever, they can be very, very limiting, um, especially uh, the social sciences have to be and humanities have to be well represented. 
because we have so many, let's say, strategies, national strategies and all kinds of legislation that basically comes just from, you know, people who are supposed to be the best top in their field and they don't listen to anybody. So like engineers are <laughs> an example of that, for example. So yeah, um, I, I really support this idea of really inviting a wide range of, of uh, stakeholders. So this voice of um, ultimate reason, you know, this objective reason is basically put down a little bit. Thanks. Thank you. so much. Um, my question relates to what Alyosha was saying also, um, in the sense of what do you need at this time, or what would you need from people um, to help make this a reality, uh, both from, you know, people present here and also uh, people online. Uh, as I understand, this will be, you know, an ongoing initiative and you're kind of pooling resources, interests, people, um, and I think it's really great. We've also been talking about different possibilities. And I'm just wondering if, if you have a kind of call for support of some kind that you would like to convey. Excellent question. Thank you so much. We are foremost trying to create a community, bring together a community who cares and, and try to learn and understand and who also have existing knowledge and already have existing research and working in this. So first, uh, we after these events, we starting to um, bring together people in smaller meetings to create sort of like an ongoing conversations that are more um, casual leading up to the, uh, to the conference. So it's not a conference where we just arrive and and share papers, but uh, it's coming out from a shared uh, dialogue. And uh, we're hoping to this to be ongoing and sort of like organic. And for this, um, we need all kinds of help, especially uh, location to sort of hold these um, meetings online um, or in, in Ljubljana at different uh, institutions. And because we're thinking about it multi-location, we are also looking for um, other initiatives who are similarly to Krater trying to work with these topics and interested in the conference so they could invite us and so we're creating um, sort of like a network. Um, so I'm interested in people or we are interested in calling for people who would like to participate. So that's the most important. And uh, what else I'm missing? Okay, yes. And of course money, right? Because we're doing this, um, um, we are self-funding our, our research. So this is, uh, Deborah, thank you so much for mentioning this, but being a precarious cultural worker comes with a lot of sacrifices. We're getting a lot of support from, you know, like emotional support and, and um, sort of support from the family and community, but what we really need is serious uh, attention and investment. So we're looking for investors also who are not uh, um, seeking a return in some kind of product or some kind of um, uh, gain that measured in the capitalist sense, but something that gives back to the regenerative community. Media Jagger, and I would just like to connect the three, the keynote speak uh, this afternoon, your presentation, and what I believe the crater in, in its essence actually is. And this is community building. Community building that particularly within urban setting is so frequently forgotten. And I believe that uh, the common characteristics of all of those is actually creating a common space within which all interested actors can actually get involved and based upon their own interests contribute to common goal. And the common goal obviously is not a single one, though probably the multi-species community is 
a kind of overarching uh, uh, terminology that we are using. And here I would agree with you as well that what is extremely important is the terminology and the concepts built upon it. And here we need particularly to stress the importance of including, of inclusion. And I guess this is one of these bases that all different actors that actually are starting to build a community which goes well beyond Krater, which goes well beyond what is being done within individual countries is needed. Uh, namely, we have to answer some of the global problems that were also being mentioned, such as climate crisis, such as crisis of environment in general, such as crisis of values. We do know that the existing system with its values simply, simply cannot provide adequate answers. And this is why it's cybernetics terminological discussion, as well as building up the space and the community are so important. Thank you so much. Also, I'd like to add to sort of like combining some of the questions, if I may, that uh, philosophers, especially um, theorists working in law, in who understand the language of legislation and technology, and you know, like the brother, um, we I interested in making these connections between these often separately considered uh, fields, because there is no connection, no communication between them, and it's really hard to expect a communi community to born between these um, fields if there is no um, infrastructure in language and also administration, because often administration just separates these uh, entities. Even if they try, it's really impossible to, to connect or to maintain some kind of like working relation. So I agree if the connect, uh, connecting space, shared space, even if it's online or in terms of a conference, actually originally before thinking of the conference, I really wanted to create um, a research um, uh, initiative where through research we meet, so without any specific location. But uh, after hearing about Krater, I thought, why not taking this research initiative into Krater? So um, we are imagining and very supported from the Krater team to actually have some part of the conference in the actual physical space of Krater, to have that physical connection to and come off from that uh, theoretical space and have that connection also physically. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna and Jujana and Diana. We have one Susanna and one Jujana. Um, before uh, we forgot to welcome our uh, two dear guests, one is uh, Martin Marzidoshek, uh, member of National Assembly, and the other is our dear mentor, Rock Kranz, from the Institute for Ecology, who is here with us from the very beginning with Deborah and Klaas. Uh, now we are going um, to one group that we also merged during the program. Um, they are coming from United States, Spain, and Italy. Um, and their team is uh, Feral Mediation. So it's done, it's already mentioned. Um, we have a very um, interesting group in front of us. Uh, which is um, yeah, Angelo Arena from Italy, uh, Catherine Bowles from US, from New Mexico, and then Xavier Acarin from Spain, but I think also partially currently based in New York. Um, Kate is a landscape architect and a lecturer at the University of New Mexico. Angelo is an architect uh, with an interest in multi-species narratives, and Xavier is a curator currently working on his PhD project at Goldsmiths University. 
developing a contemporary approach to Social Museum to of Barcelona, an institution that only later lasted for 10 years. So this incredibly diverse team working across continents was exploring the theme of feral mediation, um, a mediation as a form of multi-species justice. And they were looking to co-design a set of, set of relations that aim to resolve disputes. Elaborating on the feral as the questioning of the boundaries between domesticated and the wild, they're proposing the feral palace as a space of multi-species mediation beyond binaries, speculative yet possible. What the group has done is they have set a um, set of questions um, and they interviewed um, our colleague um, lawyer Mitya Jagar and also an environmental lawyer, um, Ms. Senka Shukovic Vrbica, who is for many years now working, um, I think also within the rights of nature movement. So um, yeah, let's now uh, see the video that they've produced and learn about their own findings. I am environmental lawyer. I work for a non-governmental organization more than 20 years now, uh, and I'm working on uh, environmental, uh, spatial planning, nature policies, mostly, and legislation, including strategic litigation uh, or counseling or legal analyzing uh, exclusively for NGO or, or uh, Civil, civil, in, uh, civic initiatives, and um, so uh, non-commercial law. <laughs> The current usage of Trina is the result of contract with the owner. So this contract has to be respected. Crater has its owner. And this is uh, ownership is constitutional right. And the usage, the usage of land is somehow limited by the constitutional demand that every property uh, should uh, fulfill also um, ecological, so social and economic uh, functions. But this has to be uh, stated uh, by the law. The ownership 
generally uh, on the earth should be moved from from ownership to stewardship or guardianship. This is this is the the main key for shifting any paradigm towards nature. Because we own Earth. The whole Earth is, is, is placed on, on small parts and ev every part is owned by someone that declares, I'm owner, I can do whatever I want, basically. Well, laws limited him or her, but, um, but this is the kind of absolute right. So, uh, um, the consequence is our thinking is wrong towards the land uh, because we own it, uh, but uh, if we would be uh, guardians like we are towards our dogs or cats, um, where this concept uh, has already um, been implemented, um, uh, it would be the starting point for, for, for thinking otherwise. Here we have a contractual usage. Mediation is a good process uh, and it could be used in any kind of situation. Of course, it could be used also in uh, redefining the contract, uh, which is fine. Because mediation is uh, basically a uh, space where um, stakeholders come and uh, there should be first uh, established some common ground, some, some ground of equality, equality of powers, you know. Uh, so powers, powers stay out of the room. The ownership is state, but the place is in municipality and contributes to Ljubljana city, not, not directly to state, Ljubljana city special, not other areas. So um, it would be more logical if the municipality of Ljubljana would be an owner, then it would be maybe easier. Um, but uh, state is uh, absolutely limited to, to uh, especially in what you're saying, changing uh, ownership in guardianship because um, they cannot do it. They cannot. Um, um, they cannot abandon their ownership uh, because it is. Uh, it has mon monetary value. So, um, but they can decide, we will not build on this area another 10 years and uh, we would like to, we would like you be our guardians of this area um, for this time, but I would, I would suggest that um, when you will be in the process of um, this uh, changing the contract, that you think also about what will happen next. What if the worst scenario, what if we have to put it down, how, how, uh, how it will end in a good way, not in a bad, you know. Uh, there is also already an intention uh, to set a legally binding rule for restoration and it will be, um, it is already now in process and it will be next year. Uh, and this is, and this is the right way because we, our, our debt to the earth is so great. Uh, it, it, it means nothing, not really, but it means nothing to stop just doing doing the additional debt, it is necessary, but in the same time, we have to pay our old debts. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we have to try really hard. Uh, there are collected uh, laws over, over uh, the countries 
um, that say something about nature's rights. And there is uh, Bolivia law uh, is law for um, law for Mother Earth. Uh, probably you know Ecuadorian constitution where everyone can represent anything in the nature. Uh, so um, there are some 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 um, some improvements, but sadly, well, sadly they are they they don't uh, they don't um, they don't address ownership. We need to preserve nature now when it is still somehow good, not when it will be the last tree to preserve, you know. And these preservation efforts are, are, are somehow um, perceived as obstacles to, to progress, to economic progress. This is, this is a mindset that is um, very sad. We don't have platform for uh, this biodiversity strategy or, or nature itself. We have, you know, we have um, um, a law on conservation of nature, uh, but this is about the protected areas, protected species and habitats, not for nature as itself. How, how, how it would be if uh, Justice Palace and and uh, Crater uh, would stay together. You know, uh, a little smaller Justice Palace and this this kind of garden uh, uh, coexisting together. I'm a lawyer, political scientist, and I was among those developing the field of uh, diversity management, or as I prefer to call it, uh, regulating and managing of uh, relevant, socially relevant diversities. And um, basically, just to add to my academic uh, background, uh, where I'm uh, 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 research council at the Institute for Ethnic Studies, uh, meaning that there I'm mostly focusing on ethnic relations, uh, ethnicity, and those issues, including mediation and uh, reconciliation and all the other processes that go uh, on in this field. Uh, I'm also teaching at different universities, uh, mainly in law and uh, political science and uh, social sciences in general. And then uh, when I was starting my career even during my primary and high school. I was quite active in uh, environmental uh, movements at the time, or ecological movements at the time, then peace movements at the time, and human rights. So these are a kind of my backgrounds, uh, and I'm also mixing uh, academic uh, career with my, let's call it, social activities. Uh, anthropocentristic view can hardly be overcome at the moment. Uh, we shall criticize it, we shall point to its weaknesses and particularly to its problematic nature. As humans are nothing else but one of the species within the uh, scope of living organisms. So for the time being, I guess, uh, the best common framework we have is the framework that we are actually uh, trying to do something for the survival of life in general and considering life just a part of our environment. I'm afraid that uh, the very first step uh, would still be a kind of human representation of all other entities, uh, simply due to the fact that uh, we are currently unable uh, different kinds of uh, communication. Namely, the communication uh, uh, usually requires two sides uh, that uh, can interact and that basically are using the same code. And for example, it was not that long ago 
that it was believed that plants or fungi uh, are not really relevant, that they do not communicate, uh, that they do not interact, uh, that they do not have their own intentions, uh, strategies, and so on. By now we know that, for example, through mycelium, it is actually the fungi that uh, provide a kind of the information network, a kind of uh, a World Wide Web uh, among the plants, fungi, and animals that actually are able to detect those mostly chemical, to a certain extent also uh, physical uh, uh, communication uh, means that uh, actually function within those systems. And also here an important issue is the pace of communication. Namely, we humans are usually a kind of used to a quick response and quick creation almost in real time. While we know that with fungi and uh, plants, uh, the communication takes longer. It's only some very rare instances when the reaction is uh, almost immediate. And uh, by the way, uh, when I'm trying to explain uh, this uh, problem, even in a broader sense, uh, to my colleagues, I'm usually asking them the question, which living organism do you think uh, aliens would uh, contact on the Earth if they would consider that the complex uh, code of communication is the sign of the most developed uh, uh, organism or entity? And usually people are quite surprised when they are told the news that this would actually be blue whales because they have the longest and the most complex uh, communication code. Humans are far behind the several marine and even some uh, earth uh, uh, land organisms. So it's uh, something that uh, really should be considered and uh, Sometimes just uh, presenting all those uh, complexities that we are unable to understand, to comprehend, and even less able to regulate, actually, uh, gives uh, a kind of uh, way in, in uh, developing the communication. The problem with uh, mediation in this context is that it is a uh, uh, humanocentric uh, or anthropocentric concept again. Mm -hmm. It's uh, based on human communication. It is based on human uh, communication. And as such, uh, it uh, kind of requires equal partners. And those equal partners are usually seen as two human entities, not as human and non-human entity. And uh, I would guess that this is a problem that we simply have to recognize and try slowly to work on it and around it. And my idea would be that uh, the first uh, step would be to actually establish relationship among human and non-human entities. And as you know, uh, there were several attempts in this uh, uh, respect, uh, uh, both philosophical, ethical, religious, and uh, also quite emotional. You know that there is uh, uh, also uh, actually psychological uh, therapy that actually builds upon relationship with, uh, let's say, trees, plants, uh, so on, uh, that somehow relaxes uh, a person, human being, and that uh, somehow establishes the connection between the two. So connecting the two is extremely important. And here we should not just think of traditional ways of communication, including mediation as one of the processes, but we should actually be observing uh, the whole uh, context um, as much broader one and actually speak about these uh, relationships, uh, about these attitudes, about uh, creating closeness, and uh, one of the extremely important uh, issues in this context, in my view, is creating the basis of understanding. Mm -hmm. so we simply do not see such a communication that deprives non-human entities of their rights as problematic. 
And what is one of our tasks is to present that not only among human beings such standards exist, but that minimal star, uh, standards should also be followed in communication in general. Also, when we are trying to relate to, or if possible, communicate with non-human or sometimes non-living entities, which is also quite important. See, the problem with mediation is that usually we tend to somehow establish the balance of different interests. But at the same time, we also tend to follow our abstract idea of good. Mm -hmm. And this abstract idea of good here can only be applied partially, as very quickly it can become a major obstacle, which somehow is the foundation of uh, uh, anthropocentristic or homocentristic uh, approach. I wouldn't just throw mediation away. It could still be extremely useful, particularly in mediating among different human institutions and communities, which will, to a large extent, also somehow tend to uh, search their good, their positive, their human. One of the logics of mediation is actually that the mediation itself is a, is a transformation process uh -huh. because it changes positions of all involved, of both sides and of mediator. Or if uh, there are more than two sides, then all sides, because quite frequently you might have uh, several sides. And one of the possibilities that I was considering, uh, uh, actually thinking of uh, your concept and of what you sent uh, to me was, uh, why don't uh, we use simply the idea of mediation that you are proposing uh, in actually establishing a process uh, involving uh, Krater and Traina on the one side, Ministry of uh, Justice on the other side, I think that the third party that also needs to be involved is the city of Ljubljana, uh, particularly their urbanistic uh, department, uh, where some people can actually sometimes be able to understand some things better than others. But then again, uh, we might also want to include the international uh, partners of uh, Krater and Traina. So we might even have mediation in which four parts are directly involved, inviting uh, uh, the Ministry of Justice, the City of Ljubljana, and uh, all the, the different entities of civil society that uh, uh, basically exist within Krater um, in such a team building uh, activity would be an excellent idea. And uh, of course, uh, what would be quite interesting is that uh, each of the sides would realize that what the other side, uh, are, uh, uh, sides are actually thinking. Showing that your uh, partner in the process is not your enemy or even your opponent, but your partner is an extremely important process. And it usually helps uh, bringing, the, for example, process of what is particularly important is establishing some common interests, or at least establishing a framework within which specific interests of individual parties can actually be realized together, or at least how some exercises can be done together. And uh, this uh, usually already is uh, a kind of uh, transformative uh, activity uh, that uh, takes place uh, within the process of mediation or any other uh, uh, any other process of team building if uh, we use this uh, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, I liked a lot when you mentioned it there are so many options and we should not be closing right this mm -hmm. space rather we should be opening the space and also opening the dialogue so that everybody and every item can actually enter the process.
architectural design of the Palace of Justice so that parts of Krater at least are integrated in. And uh, there probably a wonderful possibility would be to have, for example, green roof. Another interesting uh, issue would be that yet lately entered the discussion how to design the buildings, particularly the larger buildings, so that they would not disturb the wind patterns in the city. As wind patterns are an element that is extremely important also for living species, but has not been considered in the past. So uh, sometimes uh, uh, recognizing that what has been done uh, was very good. I mean, the mere fact that the ministry and the city agreed to host Crater for a certain period of time already shows that there was a kind of unusual thinking there. And that there was certain openness. And rather than criticizing them for that, we should be exploiting those avenues. Because those avenues then allow for alternate strategies to be entered. And this is why also, uh, when we were discussing this with uh, members of Krater, this is also why I advised them that one of their alternative strategies should be to search for an alternative place for Krater to continue its existence uh, on the other location. And you see, all those strategies, multiple strategies applied simultaneously, are actually the most likely way to achieve some result. And whenever you are kind of focused to a single solution, you kind of exclude all other solutions that possibly might even be better than your original one. Mm -hmm. So interaction, cooperation, integration, or at least inclusion are actually far better strategies to resolve and to manage complex issues and problems than simply to applying singular logic. Always one has to have different uh, options open. One of the options that I uh, considered at that point was maybe changing the plan of uh, Palace of Justice so that it would incorporate a crater or at least a part of a crater as its integral part. And maybe not only that, maybe it would expand the living environment of species uh, living there. So. There are always different approaches, and I don't know where this transformative process uh, could uh, actually lead. It's just that I'm aware that different options exist, and that uh, basically it's not necessarily considered th those options as uh, win-lose situation. Uh, it could actually be developed into a situation that is a win-win situation for all parties. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Xavier. Hello, Angelo. Um, I think Kate couldn't join us uh, this afternoon. Um, thank you for this inspiring interview. Um, I think um, a process of mediation already started with this conference, unfortunately. As stakeholders, we were unable to reach out to the Ministry of Justice and the Municipality of Ljubljana but indeed we are very grateful for our caretakers of the contract, um, Anna Britzel and Lucia Rimets and Barbara Pritner. Uh, but now I would like to ask our dear public if anyone has any questions for the group. 
Angelo, uh, Xavier, can you hear us? Yes, very yeah. well. Okay, nice. Welcome to Mladinska yes. Theater. Yes, thank you. Nice thank to you for see having you. Us. <laughs> the big screen here. So actually, we are waiting for uh, the ha some hands to to ask questions. Uh -huh. Alyosha. Um, yeah. So hi. Uh, thank you for this uh, presentation. Um, you know, uh, through it all, I was thinking um, always the informal ways of uh, communicating are always better in my personal experience. You know, as a lawyer, when I try to achieve something, it's always better to achieve it before, <laughs> before you have to start using, I don't know, legal remedies and so forth, when you actually have to go to court or whatever. So um, the process of mediation, again, from my legal point of view, is, I think, imperative in everything that we uh, try to achieve, that we try to do. But at the same, um, the same point is that sometimes, you know, you just, uh, this, this was already mentioned today, sometimes some things just need to happen and you have your position from which you start off. And uh, it's very difficult to then, um, let's say, make compromises on some things that are basically non-compromisable. And uh, this is something that has all, all, all also proven to be true in, in my personal practice and so forth. So I was wondering um, if the goal is for Krater to keep existing in some form or another, you know, what, is, what, would, be, what would be the bare minimum that Traina and Krater would be willing to accept in this in this situation. What do you think should be this this minimum? You know, from where you can go and make compromises because then you ask for like really a lot and then you get something in the middle. Y you know what I'm trying to to ask? Yes. Xavier, do you want to answer or can I, I can answer maybe? No, go go ahead. I was I was just thinking. Um, that actually I think our project is not really about the compromise. That's something we discuss a lot. And maybe I want to just add something to the project that is actually, we didn't find, let's say, we didn't propose a, a solution. That's something also was very important for us. Our project is, is, is more about actually research. And we are here presenting sort of different voices, uh, talking, let's say, and, and in some way speaking about a very complex uh, problem. And that, in that sense, I think the idea of also of compromising is not something we think is probably the solution. Or maybe, I don't know, could be part of the solution, but um, it's more, I would say, it's more really about understanding you know, and try to find a different way even to, to think about this problem that is so complex. And, and that's, I think, this is what we have uh, in some way uh, developed. I think we, did, we don't have an exact answer probably about what is the, you know, the, the best, um, yeah, let's say, the best way to keep Crater. Maybe, I think we had some, you know, several uh, solutions from, from Maya, from, from, uh, from Stenka, uh, and I think they are all very interesting, you know. Uh, I think our, our role in this project was really like try to uh, more define a sort of um, tool for the conversation, or we were more guiding the conversation rather than say, okay, this is what we, we want and that's what we sh to, should be done. So I think it's, it's difficult to answer the, the question to see to say which is the, let's say, the best compromise. Um, uh, maybe, you know, the, the, it's even wrong the question, I would say. It's not maybe about compromising, it's about understanding probably. But I don't know if this uh, <laughs> answer the question, but. Yeah, the, the question also is like I'm directed to to Trajana directly. No? It seems like um, what what are they willing to accept? Um, obviously, one of one of the ideas that we had, like um, um Sinka like mentions this, is like, I mean, like it's a possible solution would be like for for both institutions or like organizations, the ministry, justice and Trajana to work together and like um allow each other to coexist in this. Um, space well, uh, um, Danica Gaia uh, you're here so like maybe like um, um, you know like you have something to say in that respect yes they told me that I need to be at a scene that so that you can see me now can you see me yes yes you can see us. 
uh, Gaia, I think uh, um, hmm, it's a really hard question and we need to, to discuss it uh, at the dinner maybe later, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but along, I think so, I along some wine. Um, compromise, we were thinking about different, I don't know if you remember, but we were thinking about like a different um, stages if um, maybe in Zuzana and Justina uh, it was shown the, the work like if Palace of Justice happens and all the ground is excavated, this is like the biggest injustice that could happen. So, okay, step backward. What is uh, the step backward from it? And the step backward and step backward, but also now, and now at the moment we don't even know if the Palace of Justice would be realized. So at the moment that there is a justice happening at the side, but we need to name it justice actually. So it is a bit about the naming of what is happening also, I think. But um, I think it's also difficult to speculate without talking to people who actually um, are in power to sort of, you know, um, make the change together. So in this regard, I think we need a partner to speak to be able to propose. Um, I think it's also important to say that when Krater started its career on, on Krater, actually, when Trina and a group of uh, highly enthusiastic uh, ecologist, artist, um, designer started um, the yeah the setting on Krater. We have basically set the whole infrastructure uh, in a way that we can at one point go. So the infrastructure is mobile. So in this regards, we already were envisioning to kind of leave at a certain point. Of course, by the time and with the time that you're staying on the site, you grow connections and you grow also understanding. Um, yourself, no, it's like a very situated understanding of being there every day and experiencing the plant life, the mycelium life and all of the other lives that are happening there. Um, but yeah, in this regard, I think it's again important to say what we already said at the beginning that with the Feral Palace Conference, what is really important for us is to create new knowledge. And if at this point the crater uh, site won't be saved in a marvelous way, I think it's it could be a start of some sort of an alternative way of practicing um, urbanistic or like art architectural in interventions or the way that administrative frameworks are set. So in this regard, I think that is more of a like long-term vision that we hope for and um, we'll be working along those lines and see uh, how, the, how the environment will <laughs> come to us or against us. <laughs> Maybe we can continue with the questions to the group. Yes. Zuzana mm -hmm. will ask the question now. Yes, actually it's a, a question or maybe an observation that uh, refers to the question that you asked because you mentioned compromise but somehow we think of compromise in this case uh, one directional, not two directional. So I was wondering, I, I don't even know who I'm asking, I guess both uh, Krater and, and your team, is uh, how do you think about the two directional compromise in this sense? And also um, in order to have compromise, you need uh, a dialogue. And uh, I'm just, I'm not sure if, uh, where is the representatives from the, the um, Palace of Justice or from that side, if uh, somebody can uh, address this. Yeah, uh, as, as, um, as Angela was saying, like, um, um, no, it's, it's, about, it's not about compromise, it's about understanding and mutual understanding and like a, a process of transformation, not something that Mija also in the interview mentions. Um, Gaia, I see you there, like maybe like um, you have something to say. No, no, like I'm um, uh, uh, just that, like um, uh, the idea is that like it's a process of transformation. I don't know if there are like uh, uh, any representatives of the Minister of Justice. I, I thought you said there, there aren't, but like um, this connects also to what we were just mentioning, no? like it's a question of like how how we work and like how architecture design practices can like uh, possibilitate like a, a, a space for understanding through like um, activating the space in a different way. You know, like um, yeah. the the side. You 
Yeah, and also if I can add something, you know, while we were in some way studying this idea of, uh, let's say, the, the, the feral palace or the feral mediation in our case, we also understood that actually if we were, uh, you know, based our research on the, let's say, the, um, con the contemporary legal um, uh, law, let's say, that was probably not, not right. We, in some way, we understood that we need a sort of shift also in the way we, um, we think about law in this case. Now, it's not just about give a representation to non-human. To non That's, of course, something we also thought about. But also we thought that in some way we, as, a, as a, let's say, maybe like shift in the paradigm, we even make a step back and rethink also the way we approach, for example, uh, mediation, how we approach like uh, the idea of give a voice to other non-human species. No? So we, in some way we are uh, realized that the, 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 the topic was much, much uh, complex than just find the solution or one single solution. And, and in that sense, I think it become almost f philosophical. So in that sense, I can imagine it could be in some way not interesting to not hear a solution in that moment. But actually, it, that's also what we think is very interesting now. And the, the fact that we are all here just speaking about that, I think it's already a sort of starting point, no? the idea of understanding, speaking. Probably this will not leave, we will not save Prater in a, in a way we want. But I think the fact that already we are approaching this this topic, that we are speaking about that and find and thinking about other solutions, um, in terms of, of course, non-human non species, is already probably a good result. Um, and maybe just to add something that I was very in some way that in some way helped me also to, with this project, what uh, Stenka said at the beginning of uh, the idea of uh, ownership and guardianship. So the idea that we can become guardians in that sense of the land we we own or we in some way we, we think is important i think this is it can help to understand the kind of switch we need in our way we think about this kind of topic no is even more is, is very it's something very very deep it's something that is related with our idea of uh, not only ownership but how we live in on the planet no if you think about ownership everything we have is based on ownership so that would be already a, a big, big um, shift in the way we approach, let's say, this kind of um, problematics. Of course, it's very big. And <laughs> probably we will not able to to solve this in, in an easy way. But I think probably that is one of the biggest uh, problem, also challenge, I would say. I have one more uh, comment and then question. Uh, I would like to thank you for um, addressing this legal premise of the uh, of the issue here, um, because I think that uh, lawyers who do advocacy for uh, nature are kind of are quite rare <laughs> because it's not the job of lawyers is mostly caught up in this profit oriented logic and you know nature and non humans cannot pay for their uh, for their service so i think there should be structures to um, to enable that because uh, we we cannot you know um, comply with or uh, agree that uh, people work for free on or voluntarily on is issues such a, of such importance for our development so um, what uh, I think was really important, uh, the message of the video that was uh, towards the end uh, is that we should more uh, be focused on participating and uh, finding common interest and common goals and not see um, people uh, working uh, like against each other and uh, against each other's interests. So uh, my question would be, uh, so I think one of the most important things about this conference is the international aspect so we can discuss some of the um, shared or uh, different experiences. Um, what's the situation like with uh, legal advocacy from in the countries that you come from? Um, so are there like uh, NGOs who cover that or are there just um, especially enthusiastic individual lawyers? Uh, yeah, that would be my question. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, go on. Yeah. 
No, I, I was going to say, like, I'm, um, you know, like, I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I haven't come from that field. Um, I am come from, like, uh, contemporary art. Um, but, like, um, I, I do want to, like, um, um, point out what this example. Like, in, I'm from Spain. In Spain, like, um, recently, like, um, because there was, a, like, a, um, there's this, like, process that, like, people can, like, um, gather for, like, uh, signatures and they can propose to the parliament to pass a new law. And the, um, that's like called like a um, um, popular legislative initiative, and like um, what they did, a group of people, like uh, activists from Murcia, like um, they gave um, legal rights and recognition to like the Mar Menor, which is like in a body of water that it's like highly contaminated um, because of like uh, agriculture industry. Um, uh, it's like in the south of Spain, like that's like a recent case. Um, we had this discussion in, in the group, no? It's like, um, do we need to recognize the other, either like an animal or landscape as a person, a non-human person, um, in terms um, for us to recognize it as, a, as an equal and, and give it rights? So like um, the, the anthropocentric view of justice, it's like um, so embedded that like it's difficult no? to like, um, um, these this sample all these questions um so um i don't know if that answered the questions but like um, i just thought it was like a, a good example and there's an artist um um from spain that lives in, in berlin lorenzo sandoval was doing like an interesting work um for continuing on on this case of the the mar menor yeah. yeah let's say also in italy you know there are some let's say changes no for example in italy recently has been changed the constitution actually to preserve biodiversity to in some way preserve areas. Also, you know, there's of course maybe one of the most famous cases that you know in, in Ecuador also. So I think that this is happening, no? That in some way, in terms of constitution, in terms of law, there is some recognition, let's say, or we, we try to re represent or, or recognize um, natural as, a, let's say, something to preserve. Uh, but I think it's also maybe not enough, no? I think is for us, or at least for me, was this, this project, this research was also in some way try to see if we will in some way also change ourselves, no? not as a human, as a perception. So I agree what you were saying about participation. Probably this is very important and probably one of the most uh, also way to actually be transformative you know, in, in, the, in the landscape and environment is to participate, to understand, to make questions and to be part of, uh, let's say, um, communities. So. Uh, in, in that sense, it's it's. Uh, I would say we are all in the same uh, situation. I think all around the world there are many of these cases, and uh, it's not easy. I think to find, of course, um, um, solutions to find um, the right way to approach it. Uh, but I, in some way, what what I think that uh, Danik and Guy, uh, that what they are doing is very interesting because in some ways try to use this uh, problematic actually to learn a way to 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 find the solution, but. You know, again, just to speak about it, it's it's a way to, of it is a way to participate, if I if I can say. Thank you both. Um, maybe just one remark. Um, I'm an architect, guys, a designer. Uh, both of them, one is curator. Uh, Angelo is architect. Kate is landscape architect and uh, architect. So, but our question was about multi-species justice because. Uh, if the Palace of Justice is going to replace all the life on the crater, that, then the basic question, the basic conceptual questions that, that we start to work with is, okay, but what would be the Palace of Multi-Species Justice, which opened all the other fields, but we approach from like conceptual artistic um, formats, uh, but I think as a, as a community, we had some tools to like set the right questions. But we really missed lawyers till today, you know. <laughs> so thank you for for joining us today um, because we we missed this uh, kind of, of support. Um, now we are uh, our technical team is um, going to go crazy because we are like out of time completely. Um, but uh, not something that could not be solved over some wine or something else. We'll see. Um, <laughs>
the last, the last international group for, for today is uh, um, our dear um, Aleksandra Korbanska, Ivo Borković, Jano, uh, Lara Jana Gabriel, Lidija Pranić, Daida Bicek. Um, this is a group of artists, architects, uh, students of architecture and a law student, lawyer student. Uh -huh. I didn't uh, say bye to our dear... Bye bye. Ciao <laughs> yeah. everyone. Angelo and... Oh. Yes. Thank you. The applause. Thank you, See you Dasha. Soon. See you soon, guys. This is not the end, you know. <laughs> <laughs> ciao, ciao. Ciao. Um, so now, Ola, Ivo, Lara, Lydia, and Aida. Um, they are also a div di diverse group uh, working across countries. Um, uh, made out of uh, the fourth-year students, I believe they, uh, they're still fourth-year students uh, of architecture and law, and Ola Korbanska, who is artist uh, working in Berlin, and Ivo, architect working in Poland. Uh, Ola is a multidisciplinary designer and visual artist and uh, gradu graduate from Design Academy of Eindhoven. And uh, together with Ivo, last year they produced environmental large-scale art installations and in 2000, uh, 2021 co-curated the soci socio-artistic program of Malta Festival Poznan by creating the thematic framework on the subject of soil ground in a geopolitical, ecological and social uh, context. So they are joining Ola, I believe is on Zoom, they are joining us with um, their beautiful video. So yes, let's go. Exercises in the Multispecies Democracy Manifesto There are 114 recognized species living in Krater, but imagine the number of individuals. Scientists estimate there are 8,700,000 species on Earth, and now imagine the number of individuals. We, the multispecies community of Krater, representatives of plant, animal, fungi, bacteria, human, stone, soil, and other coexisting here families urge you to exercise your proudness in order to create a democratic place for all. And by all, we mean every single body, no matter which kind, permanently or temporarily residing within the space of Krater. We believe that the whole range of setbacks on this globe was and is caused by the constant cherishing of human greed, proudness and colonial approach towards things and others by the educational system and modern culture. Krater's purpose is designated as a future place of human justice, but the spirit of equality can already be felt in the air. We, the multispecies community of Krater, are responsible to act now and use the time we have left here to address the concept of multispecies justice. We want to achieve it by educating, stretching your human proudness, shifting the power, break the anthropocentric routine. We call it an introduction to the multispecies democracy. No 8,700,000 is illegal. Hello. My name is Ola Korbańska and together with Aida Bicek, Ivo Borkowicz, Lara Jana Gabriel and Lidia Pranić, uh, we developed the project called Exercises in the Multispecies Democracy. I will guide you now through our presentation. You will not see me, but you will hear me very well, I hope. Let's begin. At first, I would like to present a research material since it was a project based on um, exploration of different ideas. Um, ideas about how to uh, involve other species into the process of, um, process of design, but also in general process of uh, creating a democratic 
world in which we would all um, find um, find justice let's say um, here you can find different uh, examples of it how how different people approached it and how it could be implemented mm, I think the most two the most influential for us uh, were the two two first ones so um, the act of manifestation um, since life in crater just manifests itself so it, it doesn't need our help it doesn't need our uh, human uh, hands to to be it just pops out of the of the white fence uh, each 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 spring just showing this um, amazing greenery um, and it doesn't need our control or um, our action or our thought to to just be there and here a very important text of Michael Marder resists like a plant um, in which he talks about how a different um, resistance strategies and um, protest strategies uh, were similar to how plants uh, live so so this in in our perception passive uh, way of being and staying in one place can be actually used as a very active uh, political or or social um, uh, social tool uh, yeah um, and the second thing is uh, the slogan which we created no eight million seven hundred thousand is illegal which is a slogan which you could hear in the manifesto mm. it's um, it's based on this um, slogan no one is illegal illegal referring uh, to um, most of the time a refugee crisis um, and we thought how to how to make it more open, how to make it not about the human being, but how to make it uh, more inclusive. Uh, since the description in the in the dictionary of no one is uh, nobody, not a soul, not anyone, not a person, not a single person, uh, no man. Um, that was our answer since um, since it is said that there are recognized eight million seven hundred thousand uh, species on earth they should not be considered as um, as something or someone illegal so the question was how to include other species um, and create more democratic way of li living together all together um, and as you could hear in the manifesto we figured that um, the, the problematic one um, is is usually the the human mm, so taking it further the slogan no eight million seven hundred thousand is illegal needed some way to be contextualized and some way to be materialized um, and that's where we um, we found the lady of justice a lady justice is an allegory um, a personification of a moral force of the justice system for sure you know this image it's a lady and she holds um, she holds a sword in one hand scale in the other one and she is blindfolded she cannot see she has this white cloth around her head and um, she is she is blindfolded uh, so anyone or anything who approaches her so the court um, will not judge will not be judged for their appearance or uh, power status or uh, fame origin um, or in this case um, species they belong to we got a bit fascinated by this very simple object uh, and the fact that it it has this protective um, function to it 
it is a rich image in a um, metaphorical way or what it repre represents and what it refers to but it's also a very rich um, rich theme to work on in a very material way and uh, even design wise it, br it brings many opportunities um, like creating a interaction within the space by using the the big textile which could um, which could protect certain uh, places or uh, which could appear in different different places uh, it's also funny because crater itself is uh, is surrounded surrounded by the fence which is uh, in some parts white mm. and somehow crater is this uh, space of justice uh, so the blindfold is already there the the, the blindfold is uh, already protecting this this place so this image works on a big scale but it also could work on a very small uh, scale and that was something which we were uh, developing quite a lot um, which is a um, set of exercises um, for multi-species democracy and exercising human uh, proudness um, as you could hear in the manifesto we, we found this uh, as I said also before we found this a uh, um, very triggering part um, to tackle and then so the so the blindfold could become become a tool um, to actually pursue with these exercises here it's a very simple um, it's a very simple design uh, which could be implemented um, in crater but also in many many other places um, we created set of exercises you can see them on the screen now um, I will I can read the first one and the cloth would be uh, an object uh, easily uh, introducing the exercises and allowing people to actually make them in a very uh, approachable way um, yeah, I, I will read the first one perhaps so you have an idea what we what we were working on. Uh, fold the cloth, tie it around your eyes and surrender to the place. Now walk around. Walk slow, be careful and gentle and use your hearing. To make it more intense, you can walk bare feet. If you feel lost or powerless, that's good. That is what makes you humble. So the idea behind the, the exercises is to loosen up a bit um, our human proudness and the need of being in control of each step and different, um, different exercises include um, you know, working on, on these issues. Mm. I think, and I think it it's gonna be a nice uh, ending thought um, that that all these things could uh, ironically because we were working with blindfold but ironically they they could make us um, see more so they could they could make um, they could potentially make a, make a change in a way how we perceive uh, our surrounding and um, other species in order to create the, the more democratic um, places to live for all of us. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ola. Um, perhaps we will see you now at the screen. Um, are there some comments? Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hey, you nice to nice to be with you all. Okay. Um, I'm really happy. Yes, uh, we'll go up. Uh, come, please, so that you can see us. 
Uh, you're uh, calling from Berlin. I, I'm currently in Warsaw, but yeah, mm -hmm. I'm based in Berlin usually. Okay, thank you. Um, I think you made like a really nice and cold atmos atmosphere here with your voice. <laughs> Uh, we almost fall asleep, but listening to you very <laughs> carefully, yeah. Um, so is there anybody who would like to um, comment on the, of what we just heard? What are these exercises in multi-species democracy? Sorry, should I comment or, sh or oh. is it a question I, to the a audience? Question. This a question. is the question to the audience. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. I have a question. Oh, actually not a question, a comment. This is uh, fantastic that uh, you are suggesting a practice of exercising these, uh, these democracies, how we see it, or how to un un unravel. This is fantastic, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And I also want to say that I think part of our group is uh, on the audience as well. So, um, yeah, I, I think the idea was to, to have something which, which would have a very practical, um, which could be used in a very practical way. Because from my experience, this, uh, this like human ec encounters and on this very small personal scale can uh, change. Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that these very tiny um, things which each of us can do, I think this has a very big impact because it's, um, because it's the change will not come at once, but it's like each of us which has to sort of work on it. That, that was the idea, to create something in a very small and personal scale, which could be introduced in Krater, but also other places. I also have a question about format. How do you imagine this uh, unfolding? In what format? Book or posters or exercises and workshops? How do you imagine this? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we had this idea to, uh, that was also on the presentation, to create an object um, so the very simple cloth, which also we were also thinking about some very sustainable and simple thing, which doesn't need um, a lot of money to be produced and not uh, yeah, just a very simple, simple thing, a very simple tool. So I imagine that it could be or we imagine that it could be just a simple cloth on which the, the exercises are printed, but then the cloth itself plays the role in um, in exercising. So you need this cloth to sort of navigate through the exercise. It, on this picture, um, you could see that there is a hole, which also was like an important detail for like certain exercises. Um, so I think it could be like a design, very simple design object, perhaps wrapped in paper, maybe with more explanation, but something which would allow people to engage um, because I think if you have a tool, then it's also easier to uh, actively, um, yeah, like engage with the exercise. So that's that was the idea. Thank you, thank you. I, it was clear the object was clear, but I was curious about uh, living on beyond, uh, like for others to experience it maybe through um, having a published book with uh, this cloth in the back or something. Anyway, I was just thinking forward. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. We um, need to move right, to the right. Yes, okay. Okay. Um, maybe, um, is sorry, Ola, did I interrupt you? No, no, mm -hmm. I think this is, uh, this is open in a sense that, that of course exercises and the object would be very simple and would only include the smallest amount of information. But of course, providing a book or like a bigger, uh, maybe some sort of a leaflet would of course be a good idea because, because we had so much research. So it would be nice to also show the origin of the whole like stream of thought which we had before. 
Yes, it's a bit unfortunate that you cannot come and that we cannot really exercise what we are talking about <laughs> exercising <laughs> now, yes. <laughs> but maybe one question for Lara and uh, Lydia. I didn't, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, how, how it was uh, working on the project? You came from the, as a law student and no, both of you are architects, okay. So how it was for you? Uh, the product is not the, the typical product that we produce as a faculty. Um, the whole product, as it was a little bit different, but the theme and the things that we were talking about are something that we as architectures use every day because architecture is not just something that we see, it's something that we um, live through, it's something that we use our senses to use, to, to create something that we sense with other senses. So. Um, the whole uh, idea with exercises is also that we use different s senses. L like um, nowadays, we y usually often use only our sight. It's just, it got a very um, big value. And that's not something that happens in the nature often. Um, nature is also loud, something that we can see. It also can smell very nice or not even. <laughs> But um, the exercises were, um, were formed so that we can explore that and um, try to um, value the things that are not only um, seen <laughs> or sensed from the um, eye perspective. So um, I think that was something very interesting to talk about as architecture because we use that every day, but not a lot of people um, are don't even imagine about those things when we are walking through buildings or, or in everyday life. Sometimes we, we even forget about the, um, the things that we do sense, like living in the loud road. Uh, our ears um, often just um, put out the loud noises, but actually the surroundings are very loud. Also the smells and everything around us. So I think that's something very important for us as humans to um, realize again and um, try to become more um, sensible to everything around us. So. Oh, it was also really interesting to work with Ola and Ivo because we're both students and we don't really have the experience and we don't even learn about those kind of uh, things in faculty. So it was really nice to do something to get a new perspective on things uh, and to Basically, we wanted uh, like how to achieve that because on our uh, study, we are usually, I mean, we are taught that we are above nature, that we should design our projects and not we don't really think about those kind of things. So it was really, really interesting working with this. And um, yeah. I have to say that for me it was also interesting to work with um, with you guys because it was also a different, uh, um, yeah, it was exactly a different perspective and a, and a very nice, I think, combination of, of knowledge. Um, but I want to say something about this, uh, the fact that, that nobody is teaching us to, to somehow, um, yeah, to build things or to make things <coughs> together with nature. And we did this project together with Ivo, who unfortunately cannot be with us today. Um, and we made it with, uh, with the um, a technique which is called rammed earth. And the whole concept was that the installation which we built will, um, will dissolve and with, with time will be destroyed. And somehow while like during this process, we both realized that me having design background and Ivo having architecture background, that this is something complete opposite as we are learned usually. So we are usually trying to build things which will last for years or for like hundred years. Um, and this was a very interesting and actually very uh, like personally touching experience to design something which in like on purpose will be destroyed by the nature itself. So in this sense, that, that was also, I think, for us, for me and Ivo, and I think we shared this with girls, like a very, um, 
big and important um, inspiration to be a bit humble and that's also what i think originated this uh, this idea for for the exercises to to not put yourself as a designer in a center of attention but to also be prepared that things will um, will be destroyed or that things will live their own life and that we should respect this uh, this life which the, the the others are living i think you are all at tackling this question of materiality and this dissolution of material world actually um now we will move forward thank you very much um, for your contribution thanks a lot um, Okay, so we came to our last presentation for today. Um, and this presentation actually was not part of the Feral Palace program, but it was very much happening in parallel uh, with um, our research on the Feral Palace. Uh, and it was a part of Design Biennial Bio 27, which is also uh, supporting um, this program. Uh, it is uh, part of the satellite, so the Feral Palace program is happening as the satellite program program of the Bio 27, which has been prolonged and we are also inviting you to visit Museum of Architecture and Design. If you haven't been there, it's an interesting topic be being explored called uh, Design for Regenerative Future. But coming back to the project, um, Krater was a part of the project which was at first called Rising Earth, but then quite quickly um, renamed into Forbidden Vernaculars. And it was dealing actually with um, the accessibility of local materials and local resources such as mycelia, such as um, wild clay, such as the wood, uh, such as invasive plants. And we were kind of tackling the the topic of forbidden from different perspectives and not to speak much further or maybe just to mention the, the end result of our research besides the interviews and all the connections that we have set during the project was uh, and is also a pavilion, a tea pavilion built on crater, built from rammed earth, the same material that Ola was just introducing to us. Um, and I can also invite you for uh, a tea a critical tea practice at Krater or just to enjoy our new newly built infrastructure that will be degraded um, through time by nature. But pretty much not to speak further, um, we'll present more about the project. Pretty much Turanshek, thank you. Mm. Can I get the presentation or the photos? Yes, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, Primo Turnšek. I'm one of the uh, core members of the interspecies uh, collective Krater. Uh, I will present you our other project called Forbidden Vernaculars that was part of the Biennale of Industrial uh, Design, uh, which was tackling in uh, super vernacular and uh, designing uh, for regenerative future. So um, our core question uh, was how, to, how can Krater become a land-based uh, forum to discuss the accessibility of sustainable materials in Slovenia? And uh, as far as you know, uh, by now Krater is a place which is really uh, rich in uh, organisms and uh, there is a lot of organisms living there, but it's also rich in materials. And um, when we started to work on this uh, project, uh, we found, as Gaia mentioned, really soon that there are a lot of uh, legal boundaries or legal issues by use, uh, uh, for using natural materials that we can find in nature. And uh, that led us that we designed a tea pavilion, uh, a tea set and a tea ceremony that is addressing these issues. And basically everything that we did, uh, so the tea set and the tea pavilion, uh, every part of it has some legal issues. Uh, for example, uh, there is quite a 
strong movement in Slovenia that is uh, working with natural materials and natural building. And for example, uh, we were talking with uh, Tone Pugel from Gnezdo, which is a company uh, which sells um, uh, natural materials. And for example, we found out that they are selling, uh, for example, straw or clay uh, that is used for plasters uh, from uh, Austria, that is important from Austria or Germany or other European countries. Uh, maybe if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, this is only a picture of uh, clay from crater. Um, cl uh, on crater we found several different types of clay. Uh, so we have clay that we can use it for different uh, products or for building. But uh, for example, if I would like to build a house to myself by using this kind of materials, and I would uh, want to get a building permit, an operational permit, I would have problems because these kind of materials from Slovenia are not certified. And uh, for example, in Austria they are, and that's why we have to buy materials uh, that are plentiful and um, also in Slovenia. And uh, <coughs> if we move on uh, to the next picture, so yeah, we built a tea pavilion and we used uh, several techniques of natural building. One is rammed, uh, already mentioned rammed earth and you can see a bench here that is made with rammed earth and for the table we used a technique called cop based uh, all of the, uh, all, both of the techniques use uh, clay or soil for building and uh, yeah, uh, those materials are somehow um, yeah, use of these materials has quite a lot of legal boundaries in Slovenia. And then another thing that we did, uh, maybe if you show another picture, yeah, this is the tea pavilion where we host our tea ceremonies and we yeah, talk about the use of these materials and the problems that come with them. Uh, and if you move on, please. Uh, so yeah, here we have our uh, tea set uh, in action. Uh, and for example, we used also Rock Oblak, who is also working with us on Crater, uh, produced these uh, cups that you probably also saw uh, here uh, before the um, theater. And they are used, uh, made from clay that is find, found on Crater. And also people who work with wild clay for ceramics basically are doing this thing illegally because this is in contact, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, how can I say, the laws uh, for uh, mining legislation is somehow in the preventing the use of this kind of material. Uh, nobody will stop you in practice, but in theory they are illegal to use. And then there is another thing uh, that we already, uh, that we used uh, this packaging that is made from biomass of invasive species that are found on crater and uh, it is overgrown, this uh, biomass is overgrown with the mycelium of certain fungi um, and uh, with the help of this fungi we can get uh, fungal biocomposites, materials that are quite similar for example to styrofoam but uh, these kind of materials are burdened with patents uh, in, yeah, there is an American company called Ecovative that has patented uh, these kind of materials and their patent is really, really, really broad. Basically it says any kind of fungi or any kind of mycelium on any kind of substrate in any kind of mold uh, for any kind of use is basically patented. So this is only a prototype, uh, but yeah. Uh, and as some, someone who also grows mu uh, mushrooms for uh, food, you know, this is quite, how can I say, ridiculous because, I don't know, two-thirds of the process of, uh, for example, preparing mycelium and inoculating the substrate for growing uh, edible mushrooms or for producing biocomposite material is practically the same. Um, <coughs> And then if we move on, uh, we have another thing and this is uh, our beloved uh, knotweed. 
Um, this is a really common invasive uh, plant. We also have it here on Crater. And for example, one thing that we do with it is uh, that we use it for burek. I hope you have tried it. I think there is still some pieces left uh, before the, uh, in the reception room. Uh, but yeah, uh, Japanese knotweed is on the list of novel foods in European Union uh, uh, from, I think, 97 and uh, till 2022, nobody has removed this uh, plant from this list and that's why you cannot sell the, uh, the, this plant as food or um, because yeah, it's not considered to be a safe food. Uh, but on another hand, we also use the root of this plant that uh, is actually really medicinal also in our forbidden tea blend. Um, so yeah, this is also one aspect. And if we move on, um, Next picture, please. Yeah, this is the uh, shoots, young shoots of uh, Japanese knotweed uh, being prepared to, uh, for burek. And you can move on. Uh, so, and yeah, this is also the picture of the forbidden tea set. Uh, so yeah. Uh, through all of these things that we did and designed through this uh, project, we want to uh, speak about the accessibility of natural materials and all the legal burdens that come with them. And that, uh, how can I say, that yeah, quite a lot of practices for the regenerative future uh, are somehow in some and other way, they have yeah, legal issues. So yeah, uh, maybe I would also like to thank on this uh, part to Atelier Luma and BC Architects who were supporting and mentoring us in this process and all of the people who were part of this project. Uh, so maybe I will finish now. Uh, and if you have some questions, uh, maybe also one comment, uh, you can also buy this tea set on uh, Crater. So uh, yeah. <laughs> That's it uh, from my part now, if you have some questions regarding. Uh, I would love to ask you, mm -hmm. if I may. Um, so I really like the idea that you're doing something like uh, very uh, from ground up, uh, kind of rebellious, but also offering tea, which is a very polite uh, way of uh, joining people together. So my first question is why tea? Um, and why tea sets? And why tea parties? And uh, my other question uh, is, so if I understand this correctly, um, once the palace of justice uh, begins, it's journey to being built, mm -hmm. uh, all these natural materials will be of no use probably. It will be built over, they will be dug out or mm -hmm. if I understand correctly. So they are, the legal boundaries you are talking about are not because you would damage anyone because of doing, they will not use these materials but just because they are like uninformed and unaware of what these materials could mean for someone who knows what to use them, if I understand correctly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, uh, to answer your first question, why the tea ceremony uh, and why the tea? Um, yeah, I think the tea ceremony is a really social event. You know, it's about people and about serving tea and about talking and discussing different kinds of topics. And that's why we thought and designed this tea ceremony to actually, um, how can I say, in some comfortable environment where you can sit in a circle and you can drink tea and you can talk to, so we, that's why we wanted to uh, use Crater and all of its resources and the tea pavilion to basically make also a space that is uh, addressing all these issues, you know, and also in the tea set, the materials that we used for building the tea pavilion and for tea blends, for example, all of the plants that we used for tea blends come from Crater. On one hand, we wanted to present the richness 
of the materials and uh, ecosystem that is on Krater. On another hand, uh, we wanted to talk about these quite important topics and we wanted to do it in a comfortable um, forum or space. That's why we decided upon a tea ceremony. And your second question about the materials. Um, yeah, we like to work with local materials. Uh, for example, maybe to give you one example, Crater got its name uh, because of two big holes that are found on the location. And actually, when they were building the residential buildings, uh, Bezhigrajski Dvori, they used this gravel from Crater for building these residential, residential buildings. I don't know what are the plans with these kind of materials for uh, Palace of Justice. I would presume that they are not going to use the local materials, but yeah, when the Palace of Justice will be built, these materials will either be dug out uh, or left somewhere in the ground if they are like minerals. And regarding the plant biomass, which is also a material or a resource for us, it will probably, or yeah, it will be destroyed. So yeah, but on the other hand, gravel and clay are some of the materials that are really common in Slovenia. And this is also one of the things that we like to talk about, you know, the clay from Austria is, no, uh, is the same as the clay from Slovenia and this uh, ridiculous thing that happens that we cannot use clay from Slovenia, but the clay from Austria, for example, is okay. Sorry, Primoz, for interrupting you. Nope. We just lost our computer for a hundredth time today, so it was... <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, just checking if there are more questions. Yeah, thank you, actually, for concluding uh, the event uh, with, um, with Krater um, situated practice. I think it was really important to raise this also in the Feral Palace context. Um, now we... We want to invite you in front of, at the entrance um, of the venue, uh, there is, how, what is the name of uh, the code? QR code. QR code. Um, it's a QR code. Uh, this is our last group who prepared the meditation, so you can downlo download the meditation and um, perform it uh, at home. Maybe I just add on, yes, uh, the project's name is called Feral Species and Ecosomatics Manifesto, and it was again an international group working together between Ljubljana and the Netherlands. Um, we actually wanted to perform uh, this wonderful meditation yesterday, but the time was too short uh, to do it, so we would really kindly invite you to copy the QR code and then find the feral place of your choice within Ljubljana and yeah, just engage in, in, in the manifesto, in the, uh, in the meditation. I think the idea of the group was basically to try to kind of sensibilize you with those lands and also the connection between the plants and the bodies in which, which are forming, forming the context we, w within we live um, today. Um, yes, so. I think we sorry. Was it finished? But I think yeah, with these words, um, we're left with the final words now, and we have a huge list <laughs> of people who made who made this project possible. <laughs> we haven't learned uh, for the whole event to talk here, you know. Yes, um, so I think the, the best thing would be actually to read out the list because the list is too long to have it in our heads, to have all the names in, in our heads right now. Um, and shall we start with, I read the half and you read the other half. <laughs> but I will start with the way we've put it down. It's not a particular or order of any kind, but it's thank you, His Excellency Amb Ambassador Jonathan, uh, John Verboom. Thank you, Mladinsko Gledelišče and Tibor Mihalic for offering us and hosting us um, today and yesterday and um, yeah, supporting us so we could actually 
make this conference happen, um, even if the rain was happening as it was today. Um, thank you, Marieta Strajer, uh, as the only... Um, and Marieta Livestock together. And Marieta Livestock together as the only sponsor um, who supported the conference, and they come from the... Drana Čestina na prave domžale kamnik. Okay. Um, thank you also, Isidor Osten Ožbord, uh, who was, yeah, kind of um, sponsorship support, but also a general supporter of Krater. Thank you, Arik Chen, the director of Hetno Institute, who was kindly and, um, yeah, um, helping us to step in contact also with the Mr. Ambassador. And thank you, Urška Jurman, Palun Celoshin, with Unkra Gradbišče, all the conversations we had before we started the projects were important for us. Thank you, Katja Martincic, for hosting yesterday's um, conversation with civil initiatives who are working um, from the ground with the Fairlands. Thank you, Bianca Elsenbauer from the Brave New Alps, also for uh, consulting us on the project. Thank you, Maya Vardian for, from Museum of Architecture and design, again, a major support. Thank you, Gorkem Ozdemir, for helping with the graphic design and for being my patient um, flatmate. Uh, thank you, Alexandra Strelcheva, for the media support from Henke from Prague. Thank you, Heckler Kollektiv from New York. And from Serbia. And Serbia. Um, thank you, Jelena Perljevic, again from um, I think Heckler. Thank you, Vida Rutzli and the rest from Robida. Thank you, Nina Batun from Aza. Thank you, Zaj Brizer from Landesin for publishing our events and open calls. Thank you, Iva Cukic from Ministerstvo Prostora, who was um, offering us to share the situation in Belgrade yesterday with us. Um, thank you, Marko Podjavršek from Center of Creativity uh, of Museum of Architecture and Design in Ljubljana, who was uh, funding the first part of the project, the mentorship program, helping uh, to fund. Thank you, Lina Platform, for putting us in contact with the stakeholders and the galleries who were interested to disseminate the project. And maybe here, I don't come until the end and I leave you a few names. <laughs> Pedro Jerovel, who inspired us last year, Lena Penšek, who coordinated everything uh, and keep it calm till the end, uh, Andrei Koruza, we cannot do anything without you, uh, Primož, you know who you are, <laughs> thank you so much, um, Roko Black, Gaja Pega Nachtigal, Sebastian Kovac, Jure Gorsic, Jure, thank you for all of your calmness, um, Dasha. Dasha, you are our hero, you know that. So don't, do, do, this, is, this is the lady who just make this stream seamless. Uh, uh, regardless of all, all the obstacles, you are our type. You know, you are feral, so you are inside now, okay? Um, Anna Kunst Kuntaric, Brodsend uh, for su supporting us with the PR and press. Anna Mazzoni from Kozar, Kanja Radović uh, from Bio27. Kraters Multispecies Communities, of course. Our beautiful Amadea photographer who made an incredible case for Krater by its own photographies. I don't see you now. Uh, and of course, Monica Tominšek, who is probably crying somewhere. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> um, thank you also for keeping all these things together and listening to us when it was really hard and it was all the time really hard. And then Eva Stopper, you know, it, 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 it really means a lot to me when I like gave some somebody to do something and it's done perfectly. So yes, she's a, she was our copywriter and a communicator during the project. Uh, it's an amazing, we sound like a corporation actually, yes, you know, but, but it's, it's absolutely, it's person. wrong. <laughs> this, this is the appearance that you get now, it's wrong. This is like dedicated voluntary work of an incredibly talented people. We need donations. I know that there are a few of you here, uh, but maybe somebody here us over the stream. Uh, to continue our work, um, 
Yeah. That I think. Uh, yes, uh, what makes the very important person say sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, in, but also thank you, Renata Schifter from Mainly it's Afternoon okay. Studio, who made the wonderful graphics for us and really well communicated all the feral ideas, um, our feral ideas and the project. Um, again, working from Amsterdam, actually. And of course, Deborah Solomon, Klaus Koitenbauer and Rock Kranz, uh, who kindly supported us. Um, and the feral perlessers who made the, the imaginaries, the alternative imaginaries of multi-species theater possible. And here, I think it's also important to say that the vision of, of the project would be, besides creating the knowledge, it would be really, really amazing to see the first multi-species palace of justice in Ljubljana built as a case study that it's possible. <laughs> we are really sorry if we forgot somebody, but um, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it's mothers and fathers, absolutely. But um, I would also like on this occasion thank you, Danta Tretinovic, <laughs> my colleague and friend, for yeah, taking the, the brave journey together with me, with us, and making it so... <laughs> it was difficult, but it was also incredibly exciting. And the way you're kind of thinking and putting things in word and bringing in the humor and... And the motivation is really exceptional, so uh, it's like a big thank. Uh, thank you from my side. Thank you, Gaia, also for being an inspiration for all of us and absolute driving force. Uh, I don't know where, where you are. Like, her mind goes in so many directions that you don't expect, and all of them are like, um, can be realized. Uh, realized? Realized? Yes, they can be, you know? Because you're always thinking, and she always, really, she always thinks not about how to make a name for herself, but how to connect with people, and how to interconnect, and how to join everybody, how to mediate. She's like a sole person, I think, that, that thinks in this way, that I know, and it's incredible quality, and yes, join Gaia on, <laughs> on her endeavors. Uh, so um, thank you all for staying here uh, till the end, and let's go drink some wine, please. Yes, my mom would, would kill me for this quote, but yeah, let's go. This is the end of, this is not the end of the Feral Palace, okay?